What if Luffy discovered his hockey at a young age? Like, when Shanks was around. Watch as a stronger, smarter Luffy emerges to take the Grand Line by storm with the power of the king's disposition. Fusha Village was a quiet little town, just another island in East Blue, the weakest of the five seas. In Fusha, life was simple, quiet, and laid back. People went about their jobs during the day, and still had time to say hey to their neighbors and enjoy a pint or two at the bar. All in all, safe but boring. Unless, of course, the red-haired pirates were in town. Sake. Meat. Music. This is heaven. Lucky Roo was certainly happy. As he guzzled alcohol by the barrel and ate meat by the carcass. Beside him, Ben Beckman merely shook his head good-naturedly and sipped at his sake while he cleaned his gun. Yasop was nearby. Once again telling everyone a story about his son that everyone had already heard but were too kind to tell him so. Or rather, Yasop was too stubborn to listen to the protests. And by the bar, Shanks himself sat laughing boisterously at some remark made by the young, tan boy in a t-shirt and shorts that sat next to him. Wahahahaha. You, you can't be a pirate. Luffy, you're too scrawny. Just the fact that you can swim won't help you on my crew. Just get your head out of the clouds and work on growing bigger. Shanks was somewhere in his mid-thirties, with a hair a shocking shade of red. He had a bit of stubble on his chin, and wore a puffy white shirt, black pants, and a cloak. His sword hung belted to his hip. His face was a tapestry of laughter lines and three scars ran over his left eye. He didn't act like one of the Yonku, the four most powerful pirates in the world. He didn't act like a former member of the Roger Pirates, crewed by the Pirate King Gold D. Roger himself. He certainly didn't act like a man the Marines would send all three admirals against if they thought they would take him down. He acted like a man who loved to party, and was perfectly fine with the idea with making friends with children. Therefore, he was perfectly within his rights to tease his newest friend, who, as you might imagine, did not react very well. You're a sigh. I'm not puny. Plus, I've got a punch as strong as a pistol. So saying, the young boy by the name of Monkey D. Luffy cocked his fist as if it were an actual gun. The boy didn't look like his father was the most wanted man in the world. He didn't look like his grandfather had personally captured Gold D. Roger. He looked like a boy who wanted to impress his idol and was too stubborn to let what he wanted go. It looked outrageously funny on his seven-year-old face, but Shanks couldn't deny the determination written across Luffy's face. The boy sincerely wanted to be a pirate, despite the fact that he was still just a pipsqueak. However, Shanks couldn't just bring his young friend on his adventures like that. The Grand Line wasn't called the Pirate Graveyard for nothing, and the New World was in a whole other league. So, he offered a challenge that would both resolve the issue and do it in such a way that Luffy couldn't complain. Haha. You've got a pistol punch. E.H. Well, let's test that claim. Shall we? Shanks tapped the counter of the bar. Put a dent in this bar with a punch and I'll give you my word that I'll take you on a voyage someday. If you can't, you'll just have to stay here on land. Shanks smiled with lofty confidence, certain that all his young friend's boasts were hot air. The boy had to learn that you couldn't just say things and expect them to happen. Luffy flushed, and then yelled, It's a deal. Everyone paused in their frivolities to watch. They weren't expecting anything, but the look on Luffy's face promised to be priceless. Plus, Yasop's stories were just that annoying. Luffy closed his eyes and furrowed his brow in concentration. He clenched his fist tight, and seemed to be focusing all his energy into his arm. It was an oddly serious look on such a young face. After several seconds of suspenseful silence, Luffy opened his eyes, gave a war cry, and punched through the bar, leaving a pile of rubble of what was once firmly set wood. The sound was explosive in the silence of the bar, and everyone widened their eyes in surprise as they watched a kid, a tiny boy, demolish a good section of the counter with a single punch. Shank's eyes were the widest, as he'd noticed something no one else had. That force, just before he punched, was that hockey? Luffy surveyed the damage, gave a triumphant nod, and yelled at Shanks, Ha! I win. Now you've got to take me on a voyage. Laughter filled with childish exultation filled the bar, while every adult in the place just stared in shock. A boy. A mound of broken wood. A few splinters in the boy's hand. The image simply did not go together. They had sailed the new world. They'd seen sights that would make nightmares have nightmares and make old professors shake their heads in bafflement and the sight of Luffy's explosive punch still short-circuited the crew's brains as if they'd seen a gorilla dance ballet. Eventually, Luffy took notice of the silence, looked at everyone with their jaws at level with their knees, and asked, what? Shanks was the first to recover. He wasn't one of the most feared men on the planet for nothing. What? What? You ask. Luffy. You just shattered the bar with a punch. What the heck did you do? No child could do that. At the sound of their captain's voice, the rest of the crew jerked before going into whispered mutters about the spectacle they had just seen. Luffy self-consciously rubbed the back of his head, while giving a nervous grin. Do you really want to know? Luffy asked, 
curious as to why his idol thought what he'd just done was so special. He said his punch was as strong as a pistol. Hadn't he? Shanks gave a nod of his head, burning with curiosity. And Luffy took a breath before starting with his story. Flashback. Luffy was alone in the jungle. As far as scary situations went, it was a biggie. Just a young boy. He'd been left stranded alone with no food, no water, a tiny knife, and the instruction from his quasi-sadistic grandpa to survive. Brat. Luffy was just a little kid. Like any other kid. He was afraid of some basic things. Like the dark. Or animals. Or the prospect of no meals to fill his stomach. And his grandpa had left him out. Quite literally. For the wolves. Crazy gramps. Luffy muttered. Trying to distract himself with the sound of his own voice. He leaves me in the craziest places. Makes me do the craziest things. And for what? So I can be a good marine? I don't want to be a marine. I want to be a pirate. Dang it. Not just a pirate. But the pirate king. I want to find one piece. And he just laughs in my face and tells me to shut up. And go survive already. Uh. Luffy wasn't a crybaby. But he sure as hell felt scared. He hated it when his grandpa dumped him in the middle of nowhere. Because it meant he had to find his own food. His own water. And contend with the predators of the region. He was just a kid. Damn it. Still. A small voice in Luffy's head said. His neglected sense of good reason. What grandpa does to you does make you stronger. You're not even ten. But you already know how to fight animals. Build a shelter. And find clean water. Some adults can't do that. Oh. Shut up. Luffy said to himself. Unwilling to admit that what Gramps put him through actually helped him in some way. Such thoughts were quickly forgotten. However. When a loud growl washed over Luffy. He froze. Felt his heart go double time. And turned to face a gigantic. Hungry looking wolf with sickly colored fur and teeth. There wasn't any flashes of his short life. No broken record recording in his thoughts. Luffy didn't even have to think. His body did it for him. He ran. He ran as fast as his little legs could carry him. And then ran faster. He ducked. Swerved turned, and officially did everything humanly possible to try and outrun or outsmart the wolf that had given chase. It wasn't enough. Luffy felt a sharp impact between his shoulder blades, and suddenly he was face down in the mud as something truly massive with bad breath held him down, a crushing weight on his small back. At that moment, something broke inside Luffy. The dam built from adrenaline and physical effort that had prevented panic cracked, and suddenly Luffy was filled with mind-numbing fear. True terror seared his veins as a deep-seated, primal fear. The fear of being eaten rose up in Luffy like a riptide and dragged him away from the calm shores of sanity into the turbulent waters of hysteria. To hell with the will of D. He was a kid. And he didn't want to die. Luffy felt teeth circle his throat. And could practically feel the shifts in muscle in the giant body above him that indicated the quick jerk of the head that would break his neck like a twig. All of Luffy's fear and pain and weariness coalesced into a single point as he screamed out in a voice he only barely recognized as his own, Stop. As he did. A wave of unseen force exploded out of Luffy, tearing the leaves from branches twenty feet away. The wolf tensed, before collapsing into a heap. Its eyes rolled back into its head. Luffy blinked, and then sat up. He was alive, and the wolf had collapsed. What had happened? End flashback. Anyways, after that I started to try and do whatever I did again, but it was kind of hard since I had no idea what happened. Luffy explained to Shanks as the entire crew listened in, giving Luffy their undivided attention. I got into a few scrapes with deer and even ran into a little bear cub. He was fun, until his mom showed up. That was when I did it again. Just when she caught up with me. I yelled at her and felt. Something. She passed out. Luffy grinned, and proudly held his fist up again. The splinters removed by Makino while the young boy continued explaining his discovery. Anyways, after Gramps decided to come get me, I started practicing. Whenever I really, really, really wanted something, I felt like there was some kind of force inside me. Just waiting to get out. It doesn't always work but I've managed to knock out birds and I just learned yesterday how to put it in my punches. That's why my punch is as strong as a pistol. Luffy grinned and gave his fist a jab forward. Happy that everyone liked his new toy. Shanks was amazed. Did this kid seriously discover his hockey at such a young age? Shanks decided to see if what Luffy said was true. Luffy, Shanks said, getting the boy's attention instantly. I want you to try and knock out one of my crew members, just so I can see what you're talking about. Any volunteers? Without even looking. Shanks knew that everyone in the bar moved a few inches away from one unlucky bloke, who noticed and bravely stood up to face the challenge. Luffy looked uncertain when he saw how big the man was, but put on his game face and closed his eyes. He focused really hard on one spot in the middle of his forehead. He imagined all his admiration for the crew, all his love for Shanks, and all his ambition to become a pirate coming together in that one spot. He felt an odd kind of pressure, 
but continued to focus until it felt like his gramps was shoving a finger against his forehead. He took a deep breath, opened his eyes, and yelled at the man who'd volunteered, letting all his gathered emotions and will come flying out in a burst, directed by his voice in a vague direction. A shimmer went through the air between Luffy and the member of Shank's crew. Shanks caught a whiff of the energy, and he choked on the sake in his mouth. This hockey, it feels different from mine. There was no way to describe the feel of Luffy's willpower, other than the fact that it felt, regal, commanding. It was also a hell of a lot more powerful than a burst of the same size would have been from Shanks. Hell, maybe twice the size. The unlucky crewmate, and about four or five people behind him, fainted on the spot. Luffy was panting as if he'd just run the mile, but he had a grin on his face. He turned to face Shanks and said, See? I'm strong? I be a big help on your voyage? Shanks stared from Luffy, to the half-dozen unconscious members of his crew. Those blokes could hang around me in battle without breaking a sweat. Luffy? What kind of power do you have? Could you possibly, have that special hockey I heard about? The Haoshoku? If Shanks had been hoping for answers, fate had a twisted way of going about it. The swinging door to the bar blew out with a sudden impact. A scruffy, tall man with dark skin, stained clothes and black hair held partially in a tail walked through the door making no effort to hide the blade at his side. Filing in behind him were a bunch of men with a get-up that could only be a uniform, including the sneers plastered on their faces. The man walked up to the bar and said to the now quiet room, So you bunch are the pirates I heard about. God. You guys look pathetic. Do you guys actually fight the marines? Or do they just let you go out of pity? Shanks and his crew, if it hadn't become apparent, had gone up against guys that would make this guy go crying home to mommy while he pissed his pants. They didn't even waste the effort needed to give a response. Luffy, however, felt his anger mounting. Why wasn't Shanks doing something? He was the tough guy. He should be defending his honor. The dark-skinned man turned to Makino and said, We're mountain bandits. Don't worry, we're not here to trash your bar. Just give us ten barrels of sake and we'll be on our way. However, this proved to be impossible, since the bar's entire stock had been consumed by Shanks and his crew already. As Makino gave her explanation, Shanks held up a bottle and said, Right here, chap. We haven't opened this one it's a pretty good year. The man replied with a small display of swordsmanship that would seem impressive to beginners, but was just sad compared to true masters. The bottle shattered. I'm a man with an 8. 0 0 0. Oh, oh, oh belly bounty on my head. I need far more than one measly bottle of sake. Shanks was unimpressed. Now look what you've done. You've got the floor all wet. Shanks bent down to mop up what was really very good alcohol. When another blow from the mountain man came, it was a feather tap to Shanks. But he played along, lying quietly as if defeated. The man huffed and puffed his own ego, before leaving the bar in what was supposed to be a dramatic fashion. Not ten seconds after he left, the entire crew burst out laughing. Luffy was still a child, and a child in the East Blue at that. His simple view of the world simply could not grasp how far Shanks was out of that mountain man's league. As such, he believed that his idol was being far too casual. QED. What the heck was that? Have you no pride? You should have pounded those guys to a pulp? The laughter tapered off at this display of emotion. What was humorous to the red-haired crew was blasphemous to Luffy. Shanks sat up, looking over at Luffy. It's not like I don't get what you're saying, but they just spilled some sake. They're not worth it. With the pout only a child could produce. Luffy turned his back on Shanks, and conveniently noticed the small chest in which Shanks held the prize of his recent voyage. The Gomu Gomu no Mi. One of the most powerful Paramisha devil's fruits there were. To Luffy. However, it was just food. And he was hungry. Shanks gave Luffy a moment to cool off and regretted it the instant he turned to see how Luffy was faring and saw the fruit disappearing down his gullet. His reaction was swift. A reflex. Luffy. Spit that out. Shanks grabbed Luffy by the ankles and started to shake the boy like a rag doll. However, he was too late. On a downward jerk, Luffy's neck extended until his face hit the floor. As the boy dealt with this new shock, Shanks cried out in frustration. Luffy. Do you know what that fruit was? It was the Gomu Gomu no am I. You're a rubber man and you'll never be able to swim again. Shanks closed his eyes. His friend's life had just gotten very complicated. It was two days later, and the red-haired pirates were preparing to leave for good. The day before, Luffy had challenged the bandits in a fight for Shanks' honor. He'd been brutally beaten. Until Shanks showed up with his crew, the leader had fled to sea and dumped Luffy in the ocean, only to be devoured by the local sea king in an instant. Shanks had arrived in time to save Luffy from the same fate, but it had cost him his left arm. He was glad for so low a price. Luffy and Shanks were having a last farewell. Or rather, Shanks was provoking Luffy until he exploded. Shut up. I don't want to go with your crew, even though I won the bet. Luffy cried, yelling his true feelings for the world to hear. I'll start my own crew that will be even stronger than yours. 
travel the world, and find one piece. I'm going to be the Pirate King. The words seemed to echo faintly, as if they carried the will of fate. Shanks grinned, and said, is that so? With that, he plucked his favorite straw hat off his head and gave it to Luffy. He leaned forward and spoke in a voice only the two of them could hear. Listen, Luffy, you have a special power. And not just your devil's fruit either. You have the king's disposition. Be careful with it. You have no idea how dangerous it can be. Shanks pulled back, and said in a distinctly softer and brighter tone, that's my favorite straw hat. Keep it safe for me. Please. You can return it to me, as a great pirate. Shanks turned to board his ship, as unashamed tears fell from Luffy's eyes. As Shanks waved the island goodbye and set out to the seas he loved, he thought to himself, grow strong. Luffy, with a devil's fruit and the king's disposition, you could become the pirate king. Ten years later, a high-class passenger vessel was making its way along its course. Marines guarded the deck. The captain mingled in the truly fantastic ballroom built into the ship, and the upper crust of the East Blue laughed, danced, and ate tiny tidbits. It was a calm day, with barely a cloud in the sky, and the tides docile for a change. It was a perfect day for napping and having fun. Two Marines were hanging by the guardrail, chatting away when they noticed a barrel floating in the ocean. That caught their attention. Oi! There's a wine barrel in the water. One of them said, It's probably wreckage from whatever poor soul went through that whirlpool. Ah, oh, well, won't do him any good now. Let's haul it up. The other one said. So saying, the two casts out a line and with a bit of effort hauled the barrel up to the deck. Ooh, it's pretty heavy. There must be a lot. The two were grinning at their good fortune to be able to wet their throats. Their smiles withered and died the instant the call came from the crow's nest and the sound of cannon fire came from across the water. Pirates. I see pirates. It's the Alveda pirates. Every marine on the deck instantly broke out into action. Their training taking over as Alveda's bombardment continued. The barrel was knocked askew in the confusion and rolled away towards the lower decks. It was barely noticed by the marines, whose efforts were for naught. They'd been ambushed, and the pirate ship pulled up alongside them in a matter of seconds. On the deck of the pirate ship, a truly hideous woman stood at the forefront. She was the size of small whales, had freckles in all the wrong places. With flat, Black hair covered by a cowboy hat and beady eyes. She held an iron mace almost as big as her as a staff, with her crew arrayed around her. This was, Iron Club, Alveda. The woman worth five. Zero zero zero. Oh 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 belly. Men, who's the fairest on all the seas? Alveda asked. Her crew let out a full, if insincere, yell of, Alveda Sama. The woman grinned, revealing slightly yellow teeth, before yelling, charge. In a flurry of motion, the crew leapt over onto the other vessel to raid, pillage plunder, and otherwise pilfer their weasley black guts out. Mini disclaimer. Don't own POTC. Alveda stayed behind and surveyed the damage. Before noticing a quivering little boy still on the ship. He had glasses and light pink hair. Kobe. She yelled, instantly getting a frightened reaction from the boy. Get over there now, or face the club. With a menacing snarl, Alveda prepared to swing Kobe over to the other boat like he was a golf ball with her club. The boy broke out in frantic gibbers going far too fast to understand as human speech and threw himself over to the other ship. He quickly made his way to the relative peace of the lower decks. Phew. That was close. Now. I got to do something or Alveda will kill me. Kobe. Rather meekly. Started to look around for something he could actually lift and could count as swag. Hmm. This looks like a pantry. Kobe surveyed the room. Before noticing a large wine barrel lying on its side. That looks interesting. Maybe Alveda will be okay with that. The boy set himself to the task of moving the barrel but it proved futile as his weak limbs failed to move it an inch. It won't move. Maybe I should just go away and find something else. Kobe was just about to leave when three of the crew walked in. E.H. Kobe. What are you doing here? And with that barrel, Kobe went into his panic mode, but managed to stammer out, TTT there WW was this BB barrel? SS so I thought that MM maybe I should BB bring it up. The three men noticed the barrel, and what it contained, and got greedy little grins on their faces. Despite Kobe's weak protests, the three set the barrel upright and prepared to open it and guzzle away. Just as they were about to descend on the wine, the top blew outward as a young man with black hair, tan skin, a red vest, blue shorts, and a straw hat burst out of the barrel, his fist stretching out to hit the flunky nearest him. His eyes closed in pleasure. What a great nap. The mystery man yelled. Seemingly unaware had he just knocked a pirate unconscious. Alveda's crew members couldn't have been more surprised if Alveda had shown up 200 pounds lighter whilst performing the can-can. The man opened his eyes, and then stared at the unconscious pirate at his feet confusedly. What's this guy taking a nap for? He'll catch a cold? Laws of the universe bent. Anatomical features shifted. And suddenly the two conscious pirates had pure white eyes, larger heads, and shark's teeth. It's your fault. Dumbass. They yelled, 
their instincts to public displays of idiocy kicking in. The mystery man paid them no heed, climbing out of the barrel and turning to Kobe. I'm hungry. Do you know where there's food? He asked, acting as if he had not burst out of a barrel and clobbered a pirate without conscious effort. The veins in the pirate's foreheads showed, and they drew their swords and charged. Kobe squealed in fear and cowered, while the man slowly turned his head to face the onslaught. The swords were raised, battle cries were yelled, and the top halves of both swords snapped off and flew towards the ceiling as the stranger gave a swipe of his hand. The pirate's eyes widened in awe as the man before them snapped steel with a flick of the wrist. The man stared at them with slight annoyance. What are you doing? Playing with these things. They're sharp. Someone could get hurt. The men stood gaping for a second, before turning tail and running while dragging their unconscious Nakama. The stranger scratched his head. What was with them? Ah, oh, well, it doesn't matter. The stranger turned to face Kobe again. So, can you show me where the food is now? Kobe was wide-eyed as he looked up at the man. Who are you? He asked, wondering who on all the seas could be so strong as to break metal without effort. The man gave a wide grin and said, I'm Monkey D. Luffy. Nice to meet you. Luffy paused for a second, before opening the nearest door after smelling the air like a hound. Mushi. He yelled in wild joy, before descending like a piranha among the crates of food in the tiny box of a room. Kobe went into the room and closed the door behind him. I hope they don't find me in here. Kobe muttered to himself, before turning to look at the most interesting thing he'd seen in his short life. A man that had appeared from nowhere, displayed incredible strength, hopping up and down like a kid on Christmas morning while he practically inhaled every scrap of food his hands came in contact with. Kobe felt certain that the human stomach couldn't hold that much food, but he refrained from saying so. Um, Luffy-san? Kobe tentatively asked, drawing Luffy's attention away from a crate of apples. I don't mean to be rude, but where did you come from? Luffy grinned, displaying the numerous chunks of food caught in his teeth. I was sailing near my village with my pet when that big whirlpool came by. It really took me by surprise. But, I managed to get in that barrel, and I decided to take a nap. When I woke up, I was here. Kobe's eyes widened as Luffy nonchalantly discussed surviving a whirlpool as if it were no big deal. Kobe chuckled nervously, before gathering his courage. Luffy san, you have to leave here. This ship is being raided by the fearsome Alvida Sama. Since you hit her guy, you'll get the iron mace. You really need to get out of here. Luffy's eyebrows went up, pausing in his chewing. A pirate ship? Does that mean you're a pirate? Kobe blanched, before frantically shaking his head. No, no, not at all. Well, kinda. I guess. It's complicated. Two years ago, I went onto a boat with the intention to fish, only to discover it was a boat taking pirates back to their ship. Here, Kobe shivered in remembered fear. They forced me to work for them, threatening me with the Iron Club. Still, I don't want to see Luffy San hurt. I just met you. But I wouldn't wish the club on anyone. You've got to escape. Luffy shrugged in a total lack of concern. Even so, I'm still hungry. Besides, I can just beat up this Alvita person if she gets in the way. Kobe's eyes reached dinner plate size, before near reflexive mutterings of, impossible, came out of his mouth. Luffy knocked Kobe on the head, knocking him out of it. What's the big deal? I'm strong. And besides, I can't die here. I haven't become the Pirate King yet. Kobe gaped in shock. Pirate King? Then, Luffy-san is a pirate? Luffy nodded, still chewing on the food. Impossible. The Pirate King is a man with wealth, fame, and power. Everything in this world united in one man. The last king, Gold Roger, was the only man to conquer the Grand Line. Impossible. 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 Luffy-san will surely die if he tries to become the Pirate King. Luffy stopped eating here his eyes becoming shaded by his straw hat as he stood up. It's not about whether or not I can do it, Luffy said quietly, drawing Kobe's attention. Luffy plucked the straw hat off his head, looking at it and reliving the memories that went with it. I promised the man that gave me this hat that I would gather a crew and become a great pirate. It's my dream to be the Pirate King, and I'm committed to my dream. I don't care if I die pursuing it. Kobe was shocked into silence by the raw determination behind the statement. Kobe could see that Luffy truly would die chasing his dream. Luffy grinned suddenly, breaking the somber mood, putting the hat back on his head. Oh, well, now I've got to find a ship. Maybe the pirates will give me one, if they're good people. Luffy started for the door, brushing past Kobe. Said boy was in the midst of an emotional crossroads. My life, or my dream. Can it be that simple? Kobe recalled the two years of work and fear, breeding in him the desire to just stand aside and let others have their way. That impulse was suddenly being chalked by Kobe's childhood dream to be a Marine. Kobe took the deepest breath of his life, before standing up. Luffy-san, Kobe said, making Luffy pause. We've only just meant, but you've inspired me. Kobe looked up, and a new light was shining in his eyes. You've given me courage. 
I'll run away from Alveda and become a Marine. It's my dream to catch bad guys. Kobe was on a roll now. Making his way towards the door with Luffy. I'll leave Alveda. No. I'll catch Alveda. I'll. Whatever Kobe was going to say next withered and died as the roof of the room exploded. Leaving wood. Metal. And a seriously pissed off pirate mistress with a big ass club to fall to the ground. Kobe's heart practically gave out. While Luffy turned to watch this interesting development. Who are you going to catch? E.H. Kobe. Alveda's beady eyes turned up to glare at the pink-haired boy, who was suddenly a gibbering wreck. Alveda raised her gaze to look at Luffy. So, you're the guy who knocked out my man. You're not that bounty hunter Roranoa. Who are you? Luffy didn't as much as blink at the dramatic entrance. A pirate, he said, internally wondering who the hell this person was. Alveda grunted, before returning her gaze to Kobe. Kobe, who's the fairest on all the seas? Kobe jerked before stumbling through, TTT that O of CCC course is AA Alveda SSS, before he was interrupted. Luffy pointed at Alveda and asked Kobe, who's the hag? Everyone in hearing distance froze, their eyes going wide and their jaws unhinging as they processed the suicidal comment. Alveda's forehead became a tapestry of tick marks, before bellowing in rage, die. With a minor effort, the obese woman brought down the solid ton of steel down on the spot Luffy had occupied, key word being, had. Luffy, as nimble as his namesake, jumped out of the way, grabbed Kobe, and hopped up onto the deck, all the while smiling like an idiot. Kobe screamed in unadulterated fear, before he was dropped onto a spot of deck a bit behind where Luffy landed. Stay there or you'll get in the way, Luffy said, his smile softening the words a little, before turning to face the Alveda pirate crew, who were still in a semi-state of shock. Who's first? Luffy asked, cracking his knuckles in anticipation. The crew seemed to gird itself, before a few of them surged forward with a battle cry. Luffy grinned, before implanting his fist in the first one's skull, jumped to avoid the swipe from the second before giving a punishing headbutt, before finally giving a kick to the guy that crept up behind him. All three men went down without as much as a sound. Luffy grinned and crossed his arms. Is that all you got? He asked, as if the whole affair were good fun. The entirety of the crew stared in awe and fear at the effortless defeat of their Nakama, while one lone swordsman climbed the deck behind Luffy. With a cry, the man leapt and made to slash Luffy in half. Luffy turned to look at the assailant, before frowning. What happened next left the crew speechless with confusion, in the moments before the blade hit home. Luffy glared at his attacker. The next thing anyone knew, the man was unconscious on the ground in front of Luffy, his sword still in hand. Luffy glared with disapproval at his would-be assassin. Didn't anyone ever tell you that attacking from behind isn't fair? The crew stared for a few more seconds, before adrenaline and mob psychology kicked in and they charged Luffy as a massive horde. Luffy proceeded to run across the deck with a comic expression of fear on his face. It's unfair to attack with more people too. The chase proceeded across the deck, somehow avoiding Kobe, before Luffy's hand snagged on the mast. Instead of being jerked back, the arms stretched, allowing Luffy to keep on running away while the rampaging crew went into collective apoplexy at the sight. Luffy turned to smirk at the crew. Just kidding. Gomu Gomu no rocket. With that, the stretched limb recoiled, dragging Luffy bodily across the gap at the speed of a bullet. The crew was hit by the organic equivalent of a cannonball. Just as Alveda managed to reach the deck, her entire crew laid sprawled out across the deck. Kobe stared in shock at Luffy. Luffy grinned and said, I'm strong, remember? Alveda narrowed her eyes. So, you have the power of the devil's fruit. I thought it was just a legend. Luffy grinned, and pulled on his cheek. The skin and muscle stretching like taffy. I'm a rubber man. Luffy proclaimed proudly, before letting the cheek snap back, allowing him to give a sly smirk. Not only that, but I've got a super secret thing up my sleeve. There's no way you can beat me. Alveda grimaced, before charging forward with her massive mace held above her head. Don't take me so lightly. She yelled in fury, bringing her mace down on Luffy's head. Luffy stayed in his exact same position, before a smile spread across his face. Luffy glared up at Alveda, who was sufficiently freaked out that the man's skull hadn't cracked. I'm rubber. That won't work on me. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an unseen force seemed to ram into Alveda, knocking her back across the deck. Kobe stared in disbelief, as he saw the most terrifying, and heaviest, person he'd ever known getting thrown ass over tea kettle. Luffy merely grinned, before pulling back his fist, which then went back a few meters as it stretched, just as Alveda stood up, looking as if she just hopped off a roller coaster. Luffy brought his fist forward in a truly terrific punch as he yelled, Gomu Gomu no pistol. The fist impacted, and Alveda was blown away into the distance, until she was nothing more than a star on the horizon. Luffy turned to glare at the stragglers on Alveda's ship, who were by now ready to shit their pants. Oi, get a boat ready for Kobe. He needs to join the marines. The men on the ship started bustling like a nest of bees, 
preparing a small dingy for Kobe's and Luffy's use. Kobe turned to stare at Luffy, his mind unable to comprehend what had just happened. Luffy just shrugged. What? No enemy can stand up to a king. With that oddly philosophical remark, Luffy made to grab Kobe and hop into the waiting boat. However, before that, the sound of cannons suddenly roared like thunder. The marines had arrived. Luffy grinned at the new arrival, before turning to Kobe. Aren't you going to go over there? You want to be a marine, right? Kobe's mind went back online at the idiotic remark. I can't join them now. I'm coming from a pirate ship. They'd lock me up before I could ask. Luffy shrugged before grabbing Luffy and hopping into the boat. As they plummeted towards the waves, Luffy yelled out with a voice that rang with an undertone Kobe had never heard and made his hair stand on end, as if a living force vibrated with the words. Thrasher. Time to go. The words echoed across the seas, visibly vibrating the water's surface. As the boat landed on the water, Luffy caught a glimpse through the resulting spray of an orange-haired woman in a boat loaded with treasure. Before Luffy could puzzle the odd sight, his ride appeared, out of the water, rising like some biblical sea snake. A respectably sized sea king with green scales and blue fins appeared, giving heart attacks to Kobe, the Alveda pirates, and half the marines. The sea king turned to face Luffy, who just grinned. There you are. Let's get out of here. With that, the sea king did the last thing anyone expected. It nodded, before grabbing previously unseen ropes around its neck like reins with its teeth and throwing them to Luffy, who expertly caught them and tied them to the boat. With that, like some twisted version of Poseidon's chariot, the sea king took off, dragging Luffy and the terrified Kobe away faster than you could say. What the heck? When the warships were out of sight, the sea king slowed down to the equivalent of a brisk walk instead of a sprint. Luffy was laughing his head off, while Kobe was practically in a coma. Luffy turned to face the giant serpent. Thrasher. Where were you? I had to fight a whole pirate crew and their captain because you decided to try and beat that whirlpool. The sea king, apparently named Thrasher, turned its head just enough so Luffy could see it roll its eye. That set off a fresh batch of laughter. When Kobe was once again lucid, he turned to face Luffy and asked incredulously, You have a pet sea king? Luffy nodded with that giant grin on his face again. Yep. I've trained him since I was twelve. It was tough to get him to listen. But he reacts really well to my hockey. So now we're Nakama. He's my most favorite pet. Thrasher chose that moment to splash a large quantity of water in Luffy's face with his tail. In a gesture that was supposed to be affectionate. Kobe took a deep breath. Before just writing it off as just another rule of nature Luffy had decided to break. Kobe then asked in confusion, What's hockey? Luffy grinned. And that was all the warning Kobe got. Suddenly. It was like an earthquake was happening inside his brain. Rendering everything he saw into jumbled quadruples and throwing his thoughts every which way across his cranium. When Kobe woke up. There was dried foam on his lips and the sun was in a different position in the sky. Luffy was in the same position as before. He started explaining while Kobe sorting everything out. I don't know exactly what hockey is. I just know that really strong-willed people, when their ambition is strong enough, develop a special kind of power. That's called hockey. I have a very special kind of hockey, called the King's Disposition, or Haoshoku Hockey. It's much more powerful, and can do a lot more things than normal hockey. I've been working on it for 10 years, experimenting and mastering it. I can do everything from knock people out, to make my fists strong enough to tear through steel, to make animals understand me. I can even make some things move at a distance. Let me tell you, it's really changed what kind of person I am. Luffy grinned before continuing. I'll be honest. I'm fun-loving and gullible. I eat like a family of hungry pigs and come back for seconds. I'm clueless about lots of stuff. And not all that smart. I'd charge through the fires of hell and back without a second thought if it meant helping one of my nakama. But one thing I'm not as reckless. Here. Luffy's face became as serious as Kobe had ever seen it. If I just had the Gomu Gomu no MI, all I could do was break stuff. With hockey, it's a whole different story. With hockey, I can turn proud men into quivering puddles at my feet. Make buildings crumble without touching them. I can't afford to just go rushing in, guns blazing, or else I won't just leave beat up bad guys. I'll leave bodies, rubble, and men with broken spirits. This power is more a curse than a blessing. Kobe gave a shiver as the implications of what Luffy said sank in. What it must be like, to live with the knowledge that if you lost your self-control, even for a second, you could shatter and destroy everything around you without trying. Without moving, Kobe sensed that whatever Luffy had done to him had been akin to a poke on the forehead, and he was still trying to catch his breath. If Luffy went all out, started going on a rampage, there wouldn't be a battle, there'd be a war zone. Luffy gave a sudden laugh, and the tension abruptly evaporated, leaving Kobe feeling happy and safe once again. Anyways, I'll just have to be careful on my adventures. What good's a king if he doesn't leave anything to rule over? I'll just focus on the big fish? Luffy sighed, before staring off into the sea, as if imagining the day he would command them. Hey, Luffy asked Kobe, 
Who was that Roranoa guy Alvita was talking about? Kobe blinked. Before going pale as a sheet. Roranoa Zoro. The pirate hunter. They say that he's like a demon in a human's flesh. He goes around thirsting for blood. Living only for the bounty. He is the terror of the East Blues pirates. I hear that the marines locked him up somewhere. Kobe chuckled. Before wondering aloud, why do you ask? Luffy grinned in such a way that Kobe suddenly felt afraid of the answer. I thought I might make him part of my crew. If he's a good person. Kobe gaped. Before sputtering, impossible. Impossible. He's been locked up because he's a bad guy. You're a pirate. He's a pirate hunter. He'd kill you. Why would he become a pirate anyway? Impossible. 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 Kobe was abruptly bonked, lightly, on the head by Luffy. Why'd you hit me? Kobe asked. Nursing the knock on his noggin. Just because. Luffy said, laughing without a care in the world, as the two sailed through the East Blue with Thrasher leading the way. It was approximately a week since Luffy had popped out of the barrel, and he'd already gotten two Nakama. His swordsman and first mate sat in a semi-coma in the boat Luffy was on. His hair was a shocking shade of light green, his body tan and muscular, wearing a white shirt, green waistband, and black pants. Next to him, in a place of glory, were three swords, two of them standard with black scabbards, while one was white and a much higher quality than the other two. The man was Roranoa Zoro, pirate hunter turned pirate, whom Luffy had saved from the clutches of the corrupt axe hand Morgan. I hope Kobe does okay. Maybe he'll forgive me one day for blasting him full of hockey to convince the marines he wasn't with me. Luffy turned his gaze from Zoro to the other boat, which was occupied by his navigator. The woman had shockingly orange hair, wore a mini skirt with a very tight blouse, and black boots. Her collapsible staff hung from her thigh like a garter. This was Nami the pirate thief that had entered into a temporary alliance with them for the sake of treasure. After witnessing their awesome strength when they'd clobbered the buggy pirates and their captain. Man, I wouldn't want to be buggy right now. He's literally just a head, two hands, and two feet. Aw. Oh, well, serves him right for destroying the town and bad-mouthing Shanks. Luffy grinned as the memory of their confrontation with buggy popped into his head. The looks on the crew's face when he'd used his hockey to divert the buggy ball, the way he'd knocked Richie the lion tail over tea kettle for destroying the dog's owner's shop. And finally how far Buggy had flown from his Gomu Gomu no Bazooka after he'd reassembled a few pieces short. Between Zoro's Santoryu and Luffy's destructive punches, debilitating psychic assaults. It had been a cakewalk. Luffy sensed that his new navigator had a few skeletons in her closet. But didn't question her on it. If his Nakama had secrets. She had secrets. It was as simple as that. Currently. The trio was floating along the ocean in the boat Nami had stolen from Buggy and the ship Luffy had gotten from Alvita's crew. Thrasher had stopped speeding them along in favor of doing a little hunting and sunbathing. Considering the weather and lack of an emergency, Luffy was content to let the playful Sea King have his fun. It still freaks me out that you have a Sea King for a pet, Captain. Zoro said, making a random remark merely to alleviate the boredom that wrapped around them like gauze. Luffy shrugged. His pet was his pet. Despite the fact he'd slightly dismembered Shanks. Thrasher was good company and damn useful. So, he stayed. Nami, who had seemed particularly creeped out by Thrasher's presence since she'd seen him, decided not to comment. Instead, she put on a, no-nonsense, face and proclaimed, Listen up. We've decided to go to the Grand Line. All the most powerful pirates on the planet will be there. We can't go there with two rafts. We need a real ship. Zoro raised an eyebrow. You treat money like it's worth more than the air you breathe. And you're the one to suggest we buy a ship? You're sounding like a hypocrite. Woman. Nami flushed red with anger. And was about to deliver heaven's fury upon the man's head. Pirate hunter or no. When Luffy abruptly yelled out in childish glee. An island. I see an island. Maybe there's a meat store there. Set course for that island. The interruption served to cease Nami's growing homicidal thoughts. And succeeded in drawing Thrasher's attention. With a final sigh. Roar of contentment. The massive sea snake expertly hooked up to the ropes connecting the two small ships and started hauling tail. In a matter of seconds, they'd reached the shallows. Luffy grinned at his pet, and even stretched out his arm to give the beast a pat on the head. Good boy. Now you can go back to relaxing. Just promise to stay in calling distance. Thrasher gave a small bob of the head, before diving into the deeps to explore the surrounding seascape. As he left, the boats scraped against wet sand, and the budding straw hat crew stepped onto terra firma. Luffy grinned, and examined the surroundings as Nami consulted her maps to find info on the island and Zoro stretched. Suddenly, Zoro was gripping the handle of his katana. Put on alert. Luffy and Nami scanned the cliffside to find whatever had set the swordsmen on edge. They got their answer when pirate flags tied to sticks rose up all across the bushes at the top of the cliff face, and projectiles suddenly erupted against the sand at Luffy's feet, making him dance. Out of nowhere, a man appeared at an outcropping halfway down the cliff. 
His bushy black hair was slightly tamed by a green bandana. He wore brown overalls, yellowish boots, and had a bag slung over one shoulder. His most prominent feature was his thin, three-inch nose. Halt. He yelled out in a vaguely overdramatic fashion. If you're planning on taking over this island, forget about it. I'm the captain of the pirate crew that rules the village. Men and children adore me as Captain Usopp. Leave right now, or my 80 million men will crush you all. This was all said in a tone that practically screamed, liar. But that was lost on Luffy. His eyes started sparkling. And he gave his trademark yell of, Suge. His mind was already creating images of an epic battle between massive hordes of pirates and himself with his strength eventually emerging victorious. When Nami brought that bubble crashing down. Please. He's obviously lying. If you're going to lie, make it believable. Usopp gave a jerk. As if honestly surprised that she'd seen through it. Before resuming his extravagant tone. Shouting, 80 million might be an exaggeration. But my men are more than a match for you. Nami gave a little grin. Asking, you mean all three of them? At her words. Three kids with oddly shaped heads popped out of the bushes and started running away. Screaming all the while. Usopp was now thoroughly deflated. But he seemed to muster some kind of desperate courage. He pulled out a slingshot and a pachinko. Before lining up with Luffy. Who had his hat shading his eyes. All right. I lied about all that. But. You still can't come here. As you saw. My skills with the slingshot are greater than that of a pistol. I can't allow you to pass. My honor won't allow it. That's why people call me Usopp. The proud. As if to contradict his words. Usopp's entire body was trembling with fear. His aim remained steady. However. Luffy grinned. He liked this guy. It was time to test his character. Risk your life. Luffy said. Drawing confusion from his crew and Usopp. With that shot. You will risk your life. Luffy repeated. Looking up to stare at Usopp. This isn't a kid's game. With those words. Luffy brought his hockey to the surface. Not actively using it. Just shaping it into a kind of vibe that wouldn't be agreeable with the faint of heart. Zoro was unaffected. Being pretty tolerant of Luffy's hockey. Though Nami seemed a tad sweaty. Usopp. At the other extreme. Went into near convulsions of fear. Luffy's eyes never wavered from his stare. Zoro added fuel to the fire with. The man before you is a true pirate. Don't toy with us. Slowly. Usopp sank to his knees. Slingshot forgotten. I should have known. He said. The words of a true pirate are much more intimidating than my own. He hung his head. He was still conscious. Which told Luffy a whole lot right there. Such as the fact that despite the man's obvious fear of conflict. He had an iron will that he might not even be aware of. Luffy grinned. He and Zoro exchanged glances. Before bursting out laughing. Eliciting a small smile from Nami and a look of confusion from Usopp. When Luffy was in control again. He yelled up at Usopp. Oi isn't your dad Usopp? I used to know him. Let's talk over food. The words were such a surprise that Usopp fell from her perch to collide with the ground. However. He picked himself up without difficulty. Looked the crew up and down as if trying to decide something. Before he started grinning and laughing like some switch had flipped on his personality. In a much more jovial mood. He led the three of them up the trail to a small village. Where he proceeded to treat them at a restaurant. Along the way. Luffy noted the glares of mixed annoyance and weary tolerance thrown Usopp's way. It was obvious even to him that Usopp's lying was a big thorn in everyone's side. But they were so used to it that they'd grown comfortable in the habit. Still. One day they might snap. Luffy noted this out of the corner of his eye. More concerned with the heavenly smell of cooked meat under his nose as he enjoyed the meal Usopp had bought for them. So, you knew my dad? Usopp asked. Waiting until the odd pirate crew had started with their meal. Luffy nodded vigorously. Simultaneously consuming meat and apples at a rate that would make a lesser man sick. Yeah. He was on Shank's crew when they were based at my village. Luffy said. Taking a break in his feasting. Your dad was a pretty cool guy. He was the best marksman ever. He once shot the wings off a fly while I watched. He was also always talking about his son. Saying how he wished he could be with him. Luffy grinned wildly. I heard so much about you growing up. Usopp. My ears practically fell off. Usopp grinned insanely. As if Luffy had just given him the best news of his life. My father talked about me. You say? Brag? Even? Luffy nodded. Returning to his food for a while. Usopp seemed to be on an endorphin high for a little. Considering the relaxed atmosphere. Zoro chose that moment to ask some questions that had been burning in his mind since he met Luffy. A swordsman must have patience. But Zoro was really curious. Captain. Zoro started. Gaining Luffy's attention. I was wondering about something. You said that your special power is merely an upgraded form of a force that exists in all strong-hearted individuals. Is it possible that I have hockey? If so, what can I do with it? Luffy blinked. The question being one he hadn't expected. Before he mulled over it in his head. His knowledge of hockey was sketchy at best. Mostly speculation based off his own powers and what little information he heard from travelers who stopped by Fusha village. I'm not sure. 
But it's likely that you have hockey of your own. Since you've been training for years solely to achieve your ambition. It wouldn't be as strong as mine. But basically it would be a kind of spiritual steroid. The force of your will would make those with weaker hearts feel drained or even collapse. And your blows would be, amplified. I guess. It's hard to explain. But when I use my hockey in a punch. It's not so much that my fist is harder or stronger. It's just that there's something else there. Like iron wrapped in steel. The spirit of my fist is attacking the spirit of my target. Not many things are naturally faced with psychic assaults. So they, crack, on that side of the scale. Making it much easier for my fist to break it. As above. So below. Here. Luffy grinned like a madman. If you could do that with your swords that would be so awesome. It's settled. I'm teaching you how to use hockey. Luffy turned to face Nami. Maybe I could teach you too. You're a girl. And all you know how to do in combat is hit things with your staff. You'll need all the help you can get. Nami darkened at his calling her a girl. But logic forced her to concede the point. Her skills lied in deception. Stealth. And the occasional bout of seduction. In a physical fight. She'd be crushed. Luffy laughed in joy at the monumental idea. It's only fair that my crew knows how to use hockey when I can. Plus. Hockey cancels out some parts of Devil's Fruit powers. So we'd have a huge edge in the Grand Line. Why didn't I think of this? Zoro responded. Because you're an idiot. Captain. He said it with a straight face. Luffy nodded. Knowing that it was true. He might have forced a modicum of self-restraint into himself. And might have been a tad more observant because of that. But at heart he was a bumbling fool. Usopp. Who'd been totally lost up to this point. Suddenly looked like he was having a stroke. Everyone at the table looked at him in concern. Before he managed to stutter out. TT the G Grand LL line. At that. Luffy. Nami. And Zoro all sighed. Forgetting that the destination of the crew was the object of much fear. Luffy patted Usopp on the back. Slightly clearing the man's lungs after they'd contracted in proxy fear. Cheer up. We're strong. Besides. I'm the one who's going to find One Piece and become the Pirate King. I need to go to the Grand Line to do that. The logic was simple and groundless. But it seemed to hit home. Usopp's gaze turned inward. Before he started to talk. As if to himself. My dream is to be a brave warrior of the sea. Like my father before me. He's in the Grand Line. If I could make it there. His expression was oddly somber. Before he closed his eyes and smiled as if suddenly thinking of a joke. It's too bad I'm too big a coward to leave this village. I like you guys. But with all respect. You're sailing to your deaths. Still. Is there any way I can help you? I want to be able to say I at least tried to help. Luffy grinned. Before shaking his head. It was up to Usopp to realize that his heart had already decided. Focusing on the present. Luffy addressed the immediate problem for the crew. Now that you mention it. Is there a place we can find a ship? We can't keep going around in two small boats. Or at least that's what Nami says. I don't see why. But she's the smart one. So. He failed to notice how Nami flushed slightly at the compliment. Usopp looked as if his first instinct was to lie and say there was no such place. But then his mouth closed as he started to consider it. He'd promised. Hadn't he? Besides. This man had the kind of aura that made Usopp want to earn his trust. Not abuse it. Debating internally. He finally decided to take the right hand path. Well. I'm friends with the Ajosama that lives in the mansion up the hill. She's been depressed since her parents died. And I've been amusing her with my lies. Maybe if I put in a good word. She'd consider having a ship commissioned for you. Is that okay with you guys? Luffy grinned. Looking to see identical smiles on his Nakamas's faces. Let's give it a shot. But first. We finish eating. With that. Luffy seemed to inhale all the food on the table in the blink of an eye. Making Usopp's eyes widen and Nami and Zoro start muttering about. Finishing off our food for Asagan or some such stuff. Luffy paid them no mind. The chief tenant that he lived his life by was, when you're hungry, eat, regardless if the food was his or not. A king needed strength to rule his subjects. After all, still casting looks towards Luffy, Usopp led them out of the restaurant. He was just about to lead them up towards the manor, when onion, pepper, and carrot jumped out from the behind some nearby barrels, carrying wooden daggers and yelling, for the Usopp pirates. They began their charge straight at the trio of pirates, not even noticing their astounded captain. Nothing permanent. Luffy nonchalantly commanded. Before waiting until the last second to give Carrot. Who'd aimed for him. A bash on the head that drove him into the dirt. In the same moment. Zoro had chopped Pepper with the back of his blade and Nami had given Onion a kick in the Kinmata. The three children dropped like rocks. Usopp looked appalled at the damage to his crew. Oi. Why'd you do that? They're just kids. Luffy shrugged. And merely said. They got in the way. With that. He arranged the three more comfortable on the side of the road. To avoid foot traffic and allow them to be unconscious peacefully. Usopp glowered for a second. Before sighing in defeat and continuing with the journey up the hill. As they neared the estate. Usopp maneuvered them away from the foreboding bodyguards. Leading them towards an unassuming hedge that was actually as sturdy a wall as the steel grate at the main entrance. 
With a knowing smirk, Usopp grabbed a square section of the hedge, revealing it to be a secret door. Holding a finger to his lips, Usopp snuck in through the hole, leaving the crew to follow in behind him. Luffy took one look and went, Wow! This girl's living it up. This place is huge. Quick as lightning. Luffy's mouth was covered by Usopp's hand. Shish. The marksman hissed. Before letting Luffy go, the pirate captain pouted, but kept his silence. Usopp, with stealth worthy of Nami's operations, made his way to a tree near the south wall, where he proceeded to climb up and knock on the nearby window. A fair woman with fair hair and pale skin answered the door, a joyful expression on her face. Usopp Kun. You're here. What story are you going to tell me today? Usopp grinned, blushing faintly, and said, Well, there was the time I was five when I fought off a giant goldfish, but I have something to ask you first, Kaya. At her confused expression, Usopp indicated Luffy and the gang at the base of the tree. These guys are pirates that came to bask in the glory of Captain Usopp's presence, but they're in need of a ship. Being the proud and merciful captain that I am, I decided to help them. I was wondering if you might not mind lending them a ship. Kaya paused. Before regarding the crew, she noted Zoro's calm stance, Nami's confident air, and the sparkle in Luffy's eyes. A grin spread across her features. Kaya was a good judge of character. She opened her mouth to voice her approval, but was interrupted by the harsh cry of, Halt! Everyone turned to look at an approaching man. He wore a fine tuxedo, oddly striped shoes, and wore slightly loose glasses over his sharp eyes, his dark hair immaculately combed. He possessed an intimidating air, and made Usopp visibly start to panic. The man stopped a few yards away from the motley crew, looking up at them and saying, You have no business here. Please leave before I am forced to call the bodyguards. He fixed his glasses with an odd motion of his wrist, not using his fingers at all. Luffy felt something, off about the man. Call it King's intuition. But Luffy suspected that this man was more than he appeared. Kaya spoke up with, Please, Karahadal, don't mind them. They're friends of Usopp Kun and they wanted to ask me. Before she was cut off, please. Kaya Ajosama, don't defend them. They're obviously ruffians, and they don't belong. The crew's eyes narrowed at the insult, and Luffy started to ominously crack his knuckles. Karahadal ignored them. Is that Usopp Kun up there? The caretaker asked, making Usopp jump. I've heard quite a lot about you around the village. They say that you lie and make everyone's life difficult. I guess that's what one should expect, since you're the son of the low-class pirate. A contemptuous sneer materialized on Kurahadal's face. Usopp's fear melted into anger in the space of a second. What did you say? Usopp asked with as much malice as he could muster. As he used a hook in his bag to descend to the ground, Karahadal glared at Usopp as if he were something dirty he'd gotten on his shoes. Your father abandoned your mother and yourself so that he could spend his life pirating. He's a low-class thief. And nothing more. Usopp began to see red. Karahadal continued on with, and it shows. You spend your days lying to the village and worming yourself into Arajosama's life. What is it a low life like you wants from Arajosama? Is it money? How much do you want? The sound of flesh smacking flesh filled the air. Usopp was so angry he'd socked Karahadal right across the face. An expression of undeniable rage on his face. The caretaker clutched his cheek from his position on the ground and cried, You see that? I upset him. And he immediately turned violent. Such a dangerous person shouldn't be near the Ajosama. Shut up. Usopp yelled back at him. With such force that even Luffy was stunned. You're calling my dad a low life. He's anything but... My father sails the seas as a true warrior of the sea. I'm proud to be related to him, for I'm the son of a pirate. A baby flicker of hockey, too small to be felt, burst forth from Usopp as he said this, making Luffy pause in his advance to join Usopp in hitting the caretaker. Wow. He used hockey just by proclaiming his pride in something. This guy really isn't just a coward. Unexpectedly, Zoro wasn't forced to hold Luffy back. Instead, Luffy gave a grin. Usopp had just become the object of Luffy's whims and that was a place no sane person wanted to be. Luffy yelled, Usopp. The man turned from his glare at Karahadal to regard Luffy with curiosity. Don't just say it, prove it. Luffy chuckled encouragingly. We need a marksman. Join our crew and be a true warrior of the sea like your dad. Usopp's eyes widened in surprise. While Zoro and Nami just grinned a little at their captain's antics, he'd snagged a pirate hunter and a pirate thief so far. So a pirate heir was par for the course. Before the long-nosed man could even process the offer. Karahadal stood up. He dusted himself off and said, How you low lives decide to gather together does not concern this household. All of you, leave now. Usopp glared at him one last time, before turning to leave the way he'd came, Luffy and the crew following behind him. On any other day, Luffy would have socked the man all the way to Fusha village. But today he had a man to convince that being on the Straw Hat crew was the coolest thing in the world. No. Usopp said, crossing his arms with finality. Ah. Oh, come on. Why not? Being a pirate's fun. 
We get to go adventuring. Do whatever we want. And see the world. What more could you want? I'll even make it a point to go looking for your dad. Please come with us. It was shortly after the group had left the mansion. And Luffy had kept up a non-stop barrage of wheedling. Which had so far been unsuccessful. Usopp was obstinate when it came to leaving his home. As he'd repeatedly said. What would the Usopp pirate crew or Kaya or the villagers do without my lies to excite them? Of course. The people in question would have told Usopp in a heartbeat to follow his dream. But Usopp didn't take that into consideration. Luffy, on the other hand, didn't care. I don't care about that. You are going to be part of my crew. Usopp threw up his hands in exasperation. Before an interested expression came on his face. Ooh, what's that? Everyone turned to look at. Nothing. When the turned back around. A small dust cloud in the distance was the only thing to mark that Usopp had ever been with them. Zoro sighed. I'll give that guy one thing. He can run like hell. Nami nodded in agreement. Impressed that someone could run that fast. Luffy sighed. Damn. And just when I was wearing him down. Now. We need to find him so I can keep working on him. As the three were walking down the path. They came upon the slowly awakening Usopp pirate crew. Luffy grinned at the lucky coincidence. Before making his way over. Luffy crouched near them and asked. Oi. Where does your captain go when he runs off? The groggy trio looked up at who was talking to them. Before realizing it was the guy who'd kidnapped their captain and knocked them out. Monster. They yelled in sync. Before attempting to crab walk away as fast as humanly possible. Luffy. However. Had an unfair advantage. And stretched out his fingers to snag the three before bringing them back. Luffy frowned as he said. Oi. You don't have to overreact. You just have to tell me where Usopp goes when he needs to think. And I'll let you go. He stretched. The three yelled. Now in a blind terror. Luffy sighed. Tired of his ability freaking people out. And exasperatedly asked. One last time. Where does Usopp go to think? The cliffside. He goes to the cliffside. He just stares at the ocean to soothe his aching heart. The three of them said. As if it had been rehearsed. Luffy smiled wordlessly. And let them go. They ran for the hills with almost as much speed as their captain before them. You have such a way with children. Nami remarked sarcastically. Luffy shrugged. Not really caring. You too. Stay here and rest for a bit. If I'm not back by sunset with our marksmen. Come looking for me. Not even waiting for an answer. Luffy took off down the road in the direction he thought the coast was. Leaving an exasperated Nami and hibernating Zoro behind him. In a matter of minutes. Luffy had reached the coast. Usopp was indeed there. Staring off at the waves. I know you're there. The man remarked. As Luffy walked up. Luffy sat down next to Usopp. Not saying anything yet. He could sense that Usopp was wrestling over something. The breeze was comforting as the two sat there at the border of sky, earth, and sea, while one of them dealt with an internal crisis on an unprecedented scale. When I was a boy, Usopp eventually said, getting Luffy's attention, I used to go running through the village like I still do today, screaming that pirates were coming. I did it because I hoped if I said it enough times, it would come true. I wished that I would see my dad's ship on the horizon and know that I wasn't alone in this world, but he never came. Usopp sighed heavily, staring at his hands. It never even occurred to me to go looking for him myself. I was too cowardly. So, I just stayed here and kept lying to everyone. Including myself. It's all I know how to do. But you guys. Usopp shook his head with an unrecognizable emotion. Wonder? Disapproval? Something else? You guys are so vibrant. Not an hour ago. I didn't know you existed. And yet you've done more exciting things in the time I've known you than I've had my whole life. Usopp chuckled to himself. I want to go with you. I truly do. But. How can I? I've got onion and pepper and carrot. There's also Kaya. I can't just pack up and leave. Luffy touched his straw hat. And brought it down to shade his eyes. He spoke up suddenly. When I left Fusha village. It was just on a fun little dip into the waters around my island. I expected to sail around. Have some fun. But eventually go back and see the mayor and my grandpa and Makino-san. Instead. I wound up floating in a barrel that was picked up by a pirate vessel. Luffy laughed to himself as Usopp stared at him incredulously. You know what a pirate is? It's not some tough guy that goes around stealing from people, or pissing off the marines, or even sailing through the Grand Line. A true pirate is a man who throws away his old life, all his friends and family and his home, for the sake of his dream. Luffy turned to face Usopp with a serious glint in his eyes. To become the Pirate King. I never got to say goodbye to the people close to me. To become the greatest swordsman. A pirate hunter became a pirate. To get a hundred million belly and draw a map of the world. A thief that hated pirates traveled with two of them. Is your dream strong enough for you to leave Kaya and your friends behind? Usopp shuddered as the weight of the question fell on his shoulders. Fortunately for him, he didn't have to answer right then and there. Because of the arrival of two very suspicious people at the bottom of the cliff. Usopp turned to look at them. One of them wore a cowboy hat, heart-shaped sunglasses, and had some odd goatee. 
His wardrobe looked like it had come out of the closet of some demented disco dancer. And he was toying with an odd steel ring in his hand. The other man was none other than Parahadal. The caretaker. Luffy was curious as to why the high and mighty guy was meeting at such a strange place with such a strange guy. And joined Usopp in quietly listening to their conversation from their lofty perch. Karahadal turned to regard the odd man. Django, I thought I ordered you to remain inconspicuous. I find you lying in the middle of the road asleep with three kids. Don't tell me that you still have that problem. Karahadal fixed his glasses again. Acting in a completely different manner than he had at Kaya's home. He was darker, more commanding, and much scarier. The man spread his arms out in a calming gesture. Calm yourself, Captain. I was just showing off to some kids. Anyway, what is this about? Your plan to insinuate yourself in the Ajosama's life and steal her fortune has played out beautifully for the past three years. My men are in place and raring to go. What possible reason do we have for this meeting? Captain Kuro. Unbeknownst to the man. He had just provided a gold mine of information to the two young men above them. See Captain Kuro? As in. Kuro of the Thousand Plans? He was one of the most notorious pirates in East Blue in his time. His planning abilities were unmatched. But. The Marines executed him years ago. To think. Karahadal was secretly him all this time. Usopp shivered next to Luffy, who was regarding Karahadal, Kuro with confusion. This guy used to be a pirate. Why is he hanging around here on land? If there was one thing Luffy knew, it was that no true pirate could resist the call of the sea. Either this Kuro guy was weak-willed, Luffy concluded, or he was really just that greedy for Kaya's money. The newly revealed Captain Kuro sighed in annoyance. Django. How many times must I tell you? We cannot simply kill the girl. You must hypnotize her into writing a will leaving everything to her caretaker Karahadal. Namely me. I just wanted to make sure that that chaotic rabble that is your crew was capable with a little subtlety. Kuro fixed his glasses yet again. And regarded Django with a glare. Django's grin was a smidge more false than it had been before. It's all prepared. Captain Kuro. The men know that they just have to ravage the village and leave the accident to me. We just need your signal tomorrow at dawn. Usopp was having a panic attack. Kuso. This is bad. I've got to warn the village but I can't move or they'll see me. What to do? The choice was taken out of his hands when Luffy, quite visibly, stood up and yelled, quite audibly, Oi! Don't you dare think about hurting the Ajosama. Usopp did an odd little feint at Luffy's recklessness. The two men turned to regard Luffy, and consequently Usopp. Django looked surprised, while Kuro merely looked annoyed. Luffy was angry. Why were they being so cowardly? A pirate faced his fights head on. They didn't scurry around in the dark like these two. He was so angry that he didn't even hear it when Kuro confronted the two of them and Usopp threw up his translucent lies. He did take notice when Django started to wave his chakram on a string. When I say one, two, Django, you'll fall asleep. One, two, Django. Luffy felt odd. He felt really sleepy all of a sudden. It would be a really good idea to take a nap. The next thing Luffy knew, he was in a position that would, with his stretchiness, provide whole new levels of carnal pleasure. Had he been so inclined. However, he was slightly uncomfortable. Luffy stretched out, sighing contentment as he always did after a good nap. But wait, wasn't he just on top of the cliff? Luffy opened his eyes and looked around in confusion. He was at the bottom of the cliff, in a slight crater. Nami was looking at him with a frustrated expression. Zoro was readjusting the sword he'd used to poke Luffy awake, and the collective Usopp pirates were staring at him in shock. To Luffy's surprise, the sky shone orange and rose. It was sunset already? Luffy cocked his head, trying to sort the information but not doing so well. Zoro sighed and said, Captain, why on earth were you down here? You looked like you fell asleep up the cliff and fell down here. Luffy connected the dots and stood up suddenly. Zoro, Nami, something happened. Usopp and I were talking. When the caretaker and this weird guy showed up, he called the caretaker Captain Kuro or something. They said that they were going to attack the village and steal the Ajosama's money at dawn tomorrow. Then I called them out and the weird Osan said something. And the next thing I knew I was down here. Everyone's eyes widened, shocked by the turn of events. Luffy suddenly yelled, Wait, where's Usopp? Luffy looked around and, finding the long nose absent, started running down the path to find him. The others were forced to keep pace as their captain started running off into nowhere, while the three children's own worries for their captain surfaced, as the man had been acting very different when they'd seen him running towards the village. Apparently, one of Luffy's relatives had had a kid with Lady Luck or something, because they found Usopp on the path coming towards them. Usopp looked up, and nearly collapsed. Usopp ran up to them and asked, How are you alive? You fell off the cliff. Luffy shrugged. Now that he'd found Usopp, he was trying to remember why he was worried in the first place. Was there even a reason? Luffy's life was full of these impulsive blackouts. The kid pirate trio spoke up with, Captain. 
We found out about Kuro. Captain. We've got to warn the village right away. Usopp's eyes got hazy. And the true pirates noticed how he slipped his armband a bit higher up. Hiding some injury that seemed to have come from a gun. Usopp suddenly laughed with a false cheer. And proceeded to give his most convincing lie yet. You can forget about that. I was so mad at the caretaker that I spread that lie around. This guy believed every word. But it was all a lie. So we don't have to mention it anymore. The kids grinned at the end of the problem. But they got frowns as they started to walk off. That was a low thing. Captain. Captain has never lied to hurt someone before. I've lost respect for Captain. With that syncopated disapproval. The three left towards the village. Not noticing the desolate expression on Usopp's face. Luffy raised an eyebrow. Why did you lie? You heard the caretaker. We've got to warn everyone. Usopp sighed in utter defeat. Don't bother. I already tried that after you fell asleep. At first. I wondered why those two didn't try to kill me too. But then I found out why. When I tried to tell everyone. They all thought it was just another lie. Not even Kaya believed me. Mary even shot me. Usopp slid down his armband. Showing the small bullet hole that was steadily streaming blood. The man seemed to be on the brink of tears. The crew exchanged a glance. Before leading Usopp down to a secluded spot by the cliffs. As night fell. Nami treated the wound. To the obvious and exaggerated discomfort of Usopp. Zoro spoke up with. That was a good thing you did. Keeping those kids safe. But. What do you actually plan to do? Usopp sighed. Before a look of grim determination settled on his features. I said that pirates were attacking tomorrow. Yet. I am a liar. As such. It is my duty to ensure that that remains a lie. One way or another tomorrow will be another peaceful day. I'll stop those pirates. Usopp attempted to stand. But his knees were shaking so much that he fell down again. He stared down the silently watching crew. What's with those looks? Scared? Of course I am. But that doesn't matter. I have to do this. Luffy grinned on the inside. Usopp had just sealed his position on the straw hat crew. Talented. Semi-decent acting. And determination. What else could Luffy ask for in an Akama? The insanely strong young man cracked his knuckles, sending a silent message to his crew. Nami held up a finger. Let's get something straight. All of their treasure is mine. Usopp looked up confused, while Zoro gripped his swords in anticipation. Luffy turned to face Usopp. We're going to help. But, you have to promise to join our crew. Usopp's face shined with gratitude for a split second, before anger stepped in. I don't need your pity. I'll do it myself. Luffy let loose a small flicker of hockey. It was the equivalent to a slap to the face and Usopp choked on his next retort. Luffy stared at Usopp with his eerily piercing eyes, stating, If it were pity, would we risk our lives? Besides, I already decided to make you my nakama. Now, we have to seal the deal. Usopp stared in wonder at him for a moment, before ducking his head to hide his tears. All he could say was a meek yet heartfelt, arigato. By dawn, Usopp had set up traps all along the passage towards the village, including a nasty oil slick. Luffy regarded the safety measures, and felt a niggling thought at the back of his mind. As Usopp started to boast how awesome his traps were to the not really listening Nami and Zoro, Luffy remembered. He was so unused to being the smart one that it actually took a few seconds for the words to reach his mouth. Oi! Wait a minute! What about the cliff we landed at? All conversation died in a heartbeat as the gathered people first dealt with the shock of Luffy being the first to notice something. And then the nasty realization of the truth. Usopp yelled in dismay. I forgot. There's an identical cliff to the north of here. I just thought that they'd use this one because they held the meeting here. Kuso. What have I done? Luffy had stopped listening after the second sentence. Tearing down the path at a wild sprint. Behind him. Usopp blinked before following with equal speed. Just as Zoro prepared to follow. Nami screamed in terror and knocked Zoro onto the oil in her haste as she flew off. Screaming. My treasures. Don't worry. Babies. Mommy's coming. Zoro's curses of rage didn't even reach her as she and the other two took off at speeds that summed up approximately with Mach 2. North. 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 Which way's north? Luffy paused. Think Luffy. The last time you charged into something on instinct alone. You wound up with Ace in a coma cause you forgot to rein in the hockey. Calm down and think it through. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's just get the right direction. The sun rises in the east. So if I turn left when I'm facing the sun. Luffy. With great care. Faced the rising sun and turned smartly to the left. A clear direction in mind. Luffy once again took off at hellish speeds. Luffy hadn't realized how long it had taken him to think. Probably why I don't do it often. Luffy remarked sarcastically to himself. Anyway. The sun was fully above the horizon by the time he reached the specified cliff. Luffy. In the haze of his sprint. Noted what details he could find. Usopp was lying bloody on the ground. With Nami hovering worriedly over him. Amid a sea of caltrops. Rapidly approaching. A horde of cat-themed pirates were charging. At the base of the cliff. 
A large ship rested with the prow facing the land. Out of nowhere, a slightly oil-stained Zoro was beside Luffy. About time you got here, the swordsman remarked, while Luffy merely cracked his fists. As the group of pirates approached, Luffy proudly pulled back his fists as Zoro loosened his swords. Three, two, one. Here we go. With those words, Luffy let fly. The insane strength and speed his grandpa had hammered into him alongside his own personal training showing its worth as each and every one of the pirates flew back down the cliff on the force of his punches, aided in their takeoff by the blindingly quick and powerful slashes on behalf of Zoro. Luffy took a moment to get back his breath after his mad dash and subsequent attack. He then proceeded to yell at Usopp. Usopp. You didn't tell me which way was north. Do you know how long it took me to think it through? Sweat drops appeared on the heads of everyone in hearing distance at the comment. Before Usopp fired back, what are you talking about? You're the one that took off with all that confidence. Luffy shook his head in exasperation. Rule number one of being my Nakama. Realize that I'm a hopeless idiot. That run was just a reflex. Pure instinct. Luffy spared himself more self-inflicted embarrassment by turning his attention to the pirates. You're the guys who were going to hurt the Ajosama. Well, here's what you get. Thrasher. Move the boat. His last words carried an echoing, booming aura so thick that the walls of the cliff started to vibrate to pieces as the sound waves passed. Barely a few seconds later, the giant head of Luffy's pet appeared out of the water, scaring the overawed pirate crew shitless. Paying no heed to the panicked yells of surprise and fear, Thrasher gripped the boat gently with his teeth as ordered and proceeded to drag the boat away into the distance. Django panicked at the sight of the disappearing ship, and immediately took out his ring. Oi! He yelled out, causing the Sea King to reflexively look at him. When I say one, two, Django, you'll fall asleep. One, two, Django. Thrasher was belly up with a snot bubble in seconds. As the black cat crew breathed a sigh of relief, Luffy's anger grew. Nobody, nobody, messed with his pet. With a mighty battle cry, Luffy charged forward, drawing the crew's attention to their approaching demise. Gomu Gomu no Gatling. Luffy had no mercy as he loaded his fists to the brim with hockey and charged the crew, his fists moving so fast that they seemed to multiply. Each time his fist connected with an enemy, there was a brief moment when they were still. The force of his punch seemingly muted, before they'd rocket back into the sea with their eyes crossed and their lips bloody from internal injuries. Luffy had enough presence of mind not to make the amount of hockey lethal, as he wasn't exactly eager to kill, but the Black Cat crew wouldn't be doing any strenuous activity like walking anytime soon. When Luffy finally paused to recuperate, more than 80% of the pirates were floating some distance away in the water. Among the lucky ones Django and two odd men that had hopped out of the water and seemed pretty pissed, Zoro yelled out from the top of the cliff, Luffy, were you planning to leave some for me, you selfish idiot? Nami and Usopp were silent beside him, their jaws practically disconnected in their shock. Nami had gotten a brief taste of Luffy's true power when he faced Buggy, but this was something else. Hell's bells. He might just be stronger than Arlong. Usopp, on the other hand, had never seen anything like this. Maybe he'd hit his head yesterday morning and this was all a crazy dream. Sure, that would be more believable than the godlike strength this one man seemingly possessed. A pet sea king. Some weird force that knocked around his thoughts and now fists that took down all those pirates in one move? Yep. Definitely the head injury. Django was now officially scared for his life. While the newly arrived Siam and Buchi were in a rage to find that someone had harmed the ship. Thrasher's teeth had left marks. And the two ship guards took any damage against the vessel as an act of war. As the two prepared to turn this kid into casserole, an angry voice abruptly broke the air. What the hell is going on here? Everyone turned in unison to stare at the new arrival. Former captain of the Black Hat crew. Kuro of the Thousand Clans. The man carried a gym bag over one shoulder. And his face was livid. Kuro was enraged. The idiots that he once called his crew had been late. And when he arrived to see what the holdup was, he found the ship afloat off the coastline. Failing to notice the slightly submerged slumbering Sea King beside it over half his crew unconscious in the water, and the brats still alive. Kuro saw this as his crew deciding to have some fun in the sun instead of doing their job, and was consequently ready to kill. He wasn't even going to bother asking for an explanation. He was going to kill the crew ahead of schedule, and drag Django bodily to hypnotize the Ajosama afterwards. With practiced movements that hadn't deteriorated in the intervening three years, Kuro opened the gym bag and expertly withdrew and donned his infamous cat's claws, thickly padded gloves with a thin katana at each finger. As Kuro prepared himself, Luffy's crazy stamina made itself known. As the youth was suddenly ready for another round, he quickly issued orders to his crew. It wasn't fair for him to hog all the fun. Zoro. You got the two weird guys behind me. Usopp and Nami. Handle the weirder guy. The caretaker's mine. Usopp might not have officially joined the crew, but the tone that Luffy used broke no argument. Still not entirely sure that this wasn't a vastly complicated hallucination. 
Usopp pulled out his slingshot. The beauty of fighting like a coward was you didn't have to move. Nami grimly assembled her staff, thinking of the treasures she'd acquire from the pirates after this mess to motivate her. Zoro, meanwhile, looked like a kid at Yuletide. He assumed his classic stance, with a blade in each hand and between his teeth. Kuro narrowed his eyes, but paid no heed. The kids could play around, but he was going to get his crew for this. Kuro, moving too fast to be seen, suddenly rushed forward, intent on making his crew pay for their ineptitude. Luffy's eyebrows raised in surprise. Before he threw a punch, the impossible happened. Kuro was hit when using the stealth foot. As if it were a signal, Zoro and Nami rushed forward to deal with their assigned enemies as Usopp lined up his sights. The still furious ship guards rushed forward to deal with the sword guy charging them, not even bothering with the slip of a girl that passed by them. Django, now so frightened that his hair had started to turn white at the roots, grimly took out his chakram. He'd deal with the girl before running away. With Zoro, I'm going to step away from the third person limited that's developing around Luffy when the crew fights when Luffy's not there. Just so you know, Zoro charged forward. His swords practically a part of his body as he held them. His oath to Kaya, his normal motivation, was suddenly fighting for top spot with his awe over Luffy's display of power. The young man had decimated almost an entire crew. With one move, Zoro was forced to admit that he couldn't do that. I claim to want to be the greatest. Yet I pale next to a brawler. Swordsmanship is a destructive, subtle art. And it's losing out to raw force next to Luffy. I must get stronger. I'm nowhere near where I need to be to fight him. I've grown arrogant. Thinking this level is sufficient. If I can't beat these guys in one move, then I'll train until I can do with one sword what I can do with three. Note. I'm slightly merging Zoro's personality with Lee's from Naruto. For the sake of our mutual sanity. It won't reach that level. But I just thought that I should give a heads up. Siam and Buchi took the offensive. Neko Yanagi Daikoshin. They cried. Before rapidly slashing with their clawed gloves. Zoro expertly stopped the assault cold with his swords. The two pulled away before Zoro could pull off a move. The two seemed to be discussing a new battle plan. But Zoro ignored them. Silently. He got into the stance of one of his strongest Santoryu techniques. Feel the power of the stance. Channel the power of the blades to their fullest. The world slowed as Zoro focused on the move harder than he ever had. Almost feeling it as a comfortable presence beside his soul. Suddenly. Zoro realized that he was feeling something within his soul. It felt alive. Wild. The essence of the primal joy Zoro felt when he really let loose. Is this. Hockey? Zoro didn't question how he had discovered the force or how he knew what it was. He just added it to the stance. Zoro gently seized the feeling. As if it were an animal. And focused on nothing else except the stance. The move to come. The blades in his grip. He felt the feeling cover his entire body. Making him feel jittery. But he remained still as a statue. The partners had finished their plan. And rushed forward to deliver a combo attack that would end this man's life like it was nothing. Tiger hunting prey. Zoro intoned. The words further refining his focus on the attack he would deliver. As the two came into range. Their hands pulled back to deliver crippling slashes. Zoro moved. His blades coming down in a graceful. Beautiful. Yet deadly movement. In the space of a second. Zoro was behind his opponents. His swords all pointing forward. The veteran pirates seemed frozen for an instant. Before their chests erupted blood gushing out in a morbid yet artistic spray. Zoro felt exhausted. As if he'd put his entire being into that one attack. I kinda did. Zoro remarked to himself as he started to sheath his swords. However, to his horror, the fat one slowly got back up, seeming delirious from the blood loss, but still very much alive. Kuso. Zoro yelled in frustration. He still wasn't strong enough. That was it. He'd dissect his style to the roots and learn it all over again. He'd go back to square one, and be all the stronger when he returned to where he was now but that was for later. Zoro, almost sullenly, rushed forward and delivered a heavy blow to the man's head with the back of his blade. He crumbled like a disconnected puppet, leaving Zoro to recover from his short but exhausting battle. With Nami and Usopp, Nami sighed in exasperation. Her fight wasn't going well. Her prediction from yesterday had been correct. She was near useless in a fight. So far, she'd scored a few light blows on the hypnotist, and had nearly gotten her hand chopped off for her troubles. As it was, her staff was deeply nicked, and the surrogate captain of the Black Cat crew was leading the offense. His confidence growing as he realized how weak his opponent was. This is why I hate pirates. If Arlong had never showed up, I wouldn't be in this situation. It was at that moment that a pachinko flew through the air and noticeably hurt the hypnotist upon contact. Then again, pirates don't care about teaming up against someone. Nami amended as she continued to try and hold off the hypnotist while the unofficial member of Luffy's crew again tried to line up the perfect shot. He only had a few, specialty, shots and he wanted to make sure he didn't miss. Nami continued with her token attacks, but the outcome was clear. With a particularly strong swipe, 
Nami's scarred staff was knocked from her hands as she fell on her finely toned ass. Django grinned and whispered, You shouldn't play with pirates. Girly. With that, the man pulled back to deliver the killing blow. However, he was quite suddenly and permanently interrupted as the cry of, Hisatsu. Kayaku Boshi. A large pellet impacted with Django's face. Before the gunpowder within ignited. Django went down with smoldering hair. Usopp grinned. That's right. Her head was in the way. Nice teamwork. There. Nami got up. Dusted herself off. And gave a small mock salute to Usopp. Before turning to face the ship. Treasure. She whispered. A line of drool emerging from a corner of her mouth. Before she hopped across the prone bodies of Luffy's victims to the ship. The members of the crew that had survived Luffy's onslaught tried to remain unresponsive as Nami used them as stepping stones. Captain Kuro was mad. So they were going to hide like their lives depended on it. As was probably the truth. Nami expertly pillaged the ship down to the bilges. Disappointed with the lack of shiny things. You'd think they'd have more loot than this. She muttered to herself as she returned to the deck. She turned to the sleeping behemoth that was Luffy's pet. Nami had a deep-seated fear of all large creatures that came from the sea. A result of the constant presence of Arlong's own pet. Still, this was her ride back to shore. As her well-trained eye saw that the ship was soon about to be caught in a current and float out to sea. Nami took a deep breath. Before assuming her, Luffy, tone. Get up. Thrasher. You take me back to land this minute or there'll be hell to pay. Got it? Thrasher was up and at attention in seconds. Though Nami was not aware of it. She shared many characteristics with Mother Sea Kings. Hoarding. Bossiness. The ability to bat those much stronger than her like flies. Etc. And Thrasher was having trouble telling the difference. Oddly compliant. The overgrown sea snake took Nami back to land. As the battles on the shore came to a close. With Luffy. Luffy was a bit annoyed at the moment. Despite his best efforts. Kuro wasn't a bloody stain on the ground. The guy could move. And while Luffy could keep up if he really worked at it. It was still kind of hard to catch the guy. Plus. Those cuts were really annoying. Luffy couldn't use hockey. The guy moved too fast. And he might hit his friends. He knew he could win. It was just a question of how hard this guy was going to go down. Kuro. On the other hand. Was shocked that he was being so evenly matched. His entire reign as top dog on the East Blue had been derived from three things. His plans. His claws. And his speed. However. Against this boy. They were all neutralized. This was an unforeseen fight. And Kuro had no info on his opponent's abilities. Strike one. The man also seemed immune to pain. As the numerous deep cuts he'd scored seemed to have no effect. Whereas a lesser man would have been twitching on the ground in pain. Strike two. Finally. The boy was able of keeping up with his while he used his stealth foot. Which was an unheard of feat. Strike three. To top it all off. The guy had eaten a devil's fruit. The odds were less than favorable. Kuro decided to try to psych his enemy out. Why do you fight so hard? You've done all this to help that nobody you saw. Why? Luffy's gaze hardened. His voice was questioning when he answered. He's going to be a part of my crew. What other reason do I need? Kuro scoffed. His views overriding his common sense. Which was screaming that he shouldn't annoy this man. That is stupid. A crew is merely a bunch of thugs meant to do your bidding. They are expendable. Mere pawns. Why should you risk yourself for one of them? An unhindered wave of fear crashed through Kuro when he met Luffy's eyes after that statement. For inside those normally cheerful orbs. A look of pure malice had taken residence. The ground literally shook as Luffy involuntarily unleashed a blast of hockey. Yelling, what do you take your crew for? Kuro blacked out for a second as the spiritual onslaught hissed him. In that second, Luffy crossed the distance between them. His fist already pulled back. This is for Usopp. Gomu Gomu no pistol. Kuro barely had time to cough up blood in surprise before he was sent flying at a rocket. As he impacted the water, a fountain fully ten yards high came up. The crew, their act forgotten at the shock of their captain's defeat, was suddenly addressed by a deceptively calm Luffy. Get out of here, was all he said. The crew needed no more encouragement. Kuro's and Django's highly battered yet miraculously alive bodies was saved by a brave crew member before the entire mass of pirates swam for their lives towards the rapidly disappearing form of their ship. Not even paying attention to the Sea King going the other way. As Luffy took a while to regain his breath. He found the entirety of his crew around him. Including Usopp. Whose pain had lessened somewhat. Luffy grinned. Well. That was an interesting experience. But. Now I'm hungry. It was true. Luffy's stomach was giving off a few impressive growls. Usopp shook his head in dull wonder. This guy just took on Captain Kuro and about five-sixths of his crew and the first thing he thinks about is his stomach. Zoro patted him on the back in sympathy almost causing the long nose to collapse in newfound pain. Welcome to the crew. Zoro said, totally unapologetic about the whiteout of pain he just delivered. Once the quartet had run into Kaya on the way back. Herself coming to help them after discovering the truth from a bloody Mary, no pun intended. And the crew had it easy. 
Kaya had the finest doctor in town treat the wounds. With a special bonus to keep them quiet. Usopp insisted on making sure his lie remained a lie. After that, the highly gracious and thankful Kaya had allowed them to all stay in her mansion while a recovering Mary supervised the construction of their new ship, which was meant to be a surprise. It was a few, rare quiet days of relaxation among the crew. Usopp, having finally bowed to the inevitable when it came to Luffy, had started to integrate himself in the crew. The three found his lies and boisterous attitude to be a great source of entertainment, though his constant requests to become captain got a trifle annoying. Kaya, though sad, was willing to let them go, and Usopp had sworn to return one day. Finally, on the day of their departure, the crew was given their treat. A caravel. Nami cried in joy as the ship was revealed to them. It was a good ship. The sails were new. The hull was sturdy. And the figurehead gave off just the same clueless innocent vibe their captain did. Mary proudly declared, This ship may be of an old design, but it will carry you far. I call it the going Mary. Kaya and Usopp had one last goodbye. Before the man climbed onto the ship. Going to join his new crew. His new life. His new destiny. As they pulled away from the island and Luffy sat perched on the figurehead. The captain had only one thing to say. Grand line. Here we come. There was a reason the gods had made Luffy dumb. Hell. They could have made the entire D-line dumb just to make sure Luffy was dumb. Because Luffy was never meant to be smart enough to merit him teaching someone. The fates had decreed it. So were the thoughts of the three mere mortals stuck on the crew of a glutinous, naive demigod, who was secretly the craziest man on the planet. When he had said that he was going to teach the crew how to discover and harness their hockey, they had naturally assumed that it would involve clear, concise instructions, with meditation and gentle encouragement. The whole nine yards. Hockey, after all, was energy of the spirit. How foolish they were to hope for such deluded fantasies. Let us take a moment of silence to mourn the loss of three people's optimism and will to live. Okay. That was pushing it. But Usopp, Nami, and Zoro were just about ready to commit seppuku in order to escape the insanity that Luffy called, lessons, almost as soon as Syrup Village was out of sight. The young man had started to randomly emit large waves of hockey at his crewmates. When asked, he replied that, you guys need to get used to my hockey when I start having to fight for real. Besides, this should make finding your hockey faster. Apart from the total lack of evidence to support the last statement, the three were shocked at the first one. Fighting for real? What was that little episode with the black cat crew? The brutally honest boy, man had responded, So far, you guys have seen me use small amounts with total control, or flying off the handle. You haven't seen me use massive amounts with actual finesse yet. While small parts of their minds were simply amazed Luffy had used the word, finesse, correctly in a sentence. The greater part of the crew's minds were stunned into silence. The guy made a point. They hadn't seen control and power at the same time. The ensuing nightmares of an even stronger Luffy had plagued them for a week. Though the crew might have been able to function whilst simultaneously piloting their first ship, Usopp had graciously painted their flag and sail for them. And dealing with constant mental battering rams, Luffy had other plans. Even as he lazed around on his special seat, played with Thrasher, and sent the occasional psychic tsunami at his Nakama, he was ordering them with vague and inexact advice on how to access their hockey. When he saw how saying, just think about what your dream really hard and let it out, wasn't making any progress. Luffy had taken to sneaking up on the crew while they worked and making fake attempts on their lives. Seriously. He'd yell out, hey, and then sent a Gomu Gomu pistol about an inch to the left of their head. He varied up the attacks and methods constantly, so that the crew wouldn't become used to a routine. While being interrogated, beaten within an inch of death by the irate crew members. He'd simply replied, completely unaware of his swollen lips. The first thing people think of when they're about to die is what they really want before they lose it forever. Eventually, you guys are going to accidentally tap your hockey. And then we'll work from there. Though his crew was considering mutiny more and more seriously the longer he kept it up, they persevered. Partially so that they could actually get their hockey and make it all end. But mostly so that they could override Luffy's hockey with their own and finally make their punishments actually stick. It's a lot harder to just blow off an attempt on your life because you did something wrong when you don't have the certainty that you can just make them faint if it gets serious. As the days rolled by and the crew adjusted to life on the going merry, the three, normal, crew members, though they'd never admit that it was Luffy's psychotic method that helped, entered the mysterious ranks of those that could use hockey. Zoro was the first to really get it down, having tapped his hockey in his fight and already having a general idea of what it felt. For him, he thought of his promise to Kuina and the song of his blades radiating within his soul like a tuning fork, which gave off waves of hockey instead of sound. For Nami, she pictured sitting in Belmere's cottage with her world map on the wall next to Arlong's stuffed head, and simply channeled the warm, fuzzy feeling. Usopp merely imagined a parade in honor of, the brave warrior. Captain Usopp, building up inside him until it exploded out into the open air. The crew was surprised that once they actually found their hockey, 
using it was much easier than they anticipated. Zoro, with Usopp right behind him, had learned how to channel his hockey into his swords, making his strikes stronger, heavier, and smoother. The fact that he spent every second that he wasn't sleeping or eating training like a maniac helped. He was really determined to not only catch up with Luffy, but fly above and beyond. Usopp wasn't nearly as motivated, though he did practice his marksmanship in his free moments. Being spiritually assaulted by Luffy had, if not entirely curing, at least curbed his instinct to run and hide from any enemy of significant power. If he was going to be revered across the world, he had to actually fight occasionally after all. His lying was still going full blast, though, Nami, surprisingly, had discovered a power that not even Luffy had known about. By, saturating, the air with hockey. Barely noticeable to the unaware, she was able to predict her enemy's moves almost before they made them. Though Zoro or Luffy could take her down in less than a second if they tried, she at least managed to become quite adept at dodging and finding openings. Plus, a hockey-powered slap with a shot of feminine fury could have felt better men than Luffy or Zoro. In short, Luffy had nearly doubled the strength of his crew with their introduction to hockey. It had only cost his crew most of their sanity, and his personal safety. Trifles. Really. There was also the fact that if an outsider found themselves on their boat, they would wind up unconscious within an hour. Luffy's burst of hockey, which he hadn't let up on yet, were now answered by collaborative attacks from Zoro, Nami, and Usopp. Anyone caught in the crossfire that wasn't at least as strong as a marine captain was doomed. It was about two weeks after they had gotten Usopp on the crew that this theory was put to the test. Zoro was taking a power nap after doing 2,000 handstand push-ups after 1,000 swings with both hands and his mouth. Usopp was dabbling with his mad scientist experiments. Nami was reading the latest newspaper. And Luffy was trying to test out the cannon. Pretty soon, Usopp intervened. His duty as a marksman forbidding him from letting Luffy's atrocious aiming continue. On a whim, Usopp let a small trickle of his own hockey. Not as strong as Zoro's and nowhere near as potent as Luffy's special variety. But still the equivalent of a psychic steroid. Taking careful aim, Usopp fired at a far-off outcropping of rocks. To his immense surprise, the entire spire that he'd been aiming at crumbled into pebbles, taking down two of its brothers with it. Everyone conscious blinked in surprise, before Luffy yelled, Suge. At the top of his lungs and Nami resolved to be a bit nicer to Usopp from now on. Shortly afterward, the crew took a break from their activities to have lunch, Zoro waking of his own accord, as they enjoyed the simple meal, well, as much as they could enjoy it while fending off Luffy's constant attempts to steal from their plates, and discussing the need to get an actual cook on the crew. A loud yell came from outside. Come out. You bastards. I'm going to make you pay for trying to kill bro. The crew blinked. Before Luffy came out to see what the problem was. A dark-skinned man with a tattoo on his cheek. In his twenties. Stood on deck. Clad in purple clothes and opaque shades. While he wielded a sword with moderate skill in his right hand. He seemed pissed for some odd reason. Though Luffy couldn't imagine why. Though his mental abilities weren't the most impressive. So maybe he should get a second opinion. The instant the man caught sight of Luffy. He jumped right at him, waving his sword wildly and screaming, Filthy pirate. I'll kill you for what you've done. Luffy easily dodged, but was just as easily angered when he saw how the mystery man had sliced up the railing. I don't know who the hell you are, but don't harm the ship. Luffy yelled, grabbing the man's head and throwing him across the ship, hypocritically damaging the ship as he did. Inside the cabin, Zoro perked an ear. He knew that voice. Just as the man was picking himself back up for a second pass, Zoro spoke out from the railing. Johnny. What are you doing here? Is Yosaku with you? The man looked up in surprise, recognizing the voice of his former bounty hunter, and nearly choking when he saw that he was actually there. Big bro. The heartless pirate hunter. On a pirate ship? Impossible. And yet, Johnny's eyes kept stubbornly sending the message to his brain until the man was forced to accept that he was actually there. Big bro. What are you doing here? Then, before Zoro could even answer, the man broke into tears and cried, Big bro. It's terrible. Yosaku is terribly ill. We were resting at that outcropping. When out of nowhere we were attacked. I rowed over here for revenge. And Yosaku is probably dying as we speak. Big bro. What do we do? Zoro's eyes widened. Yusop, who had emerged with Nami, looked a tad guilty. And Luffy was tilting his head to the side. So, this guy had thought that they'd killed his Nakama. That's why he was attacking them. Luffy instantly let the guy off the hook. Zoro, with minimal help from the near hysterical Johnny, hauled up the sick man from the raft attached to the side of the ship. One look would tell even the most moronic of idiots. Luffy sneezes. That the man was ill. His skin was gray and clammy. And his eyes showed only whites. While Usopp, Luffy, and Johnny were panicking. Nami bent down to take a closer look. Zoro watching curiously. She stood up and yelled at Usopp and Luffy to get the limes they had in storage. Two weeks ago, 
they would have complained and she'd have been forced to use her patented demonic glare of death. Now, she just punctuated her words with a mild burst of hockey. Johnny stiffened like a board, while Luffy and Usopp just realized she was serious and went to do her bidding. Almost like a dog whistle, Thrasher showed up as well, back from his light hunting trip. Johnny nearly went into apoplexy when he saw the massive seeking. But Nami merely turned and yelled, Make yourself useful. You lazy fish. Keep this guy in the shade with your head. By now fully convinced that Nami was a seeking mother in disguise. As was sometimes done, Thrasher did as he was told, keeping pace with the ship in order to keep Yosaku in the shade of his giant head. Nami spoke to Johnny, trying to break him out of his shock. Don't worry about him. He's our captain's pet. You should be more worried about your friend. He's got scurvy. It's a disease that has claimed more pirates and sailors than anything else combined over the years. A day or two more without treatment. And he would have died. Johnny broke into fresh wailing at the news. While her two minions arrived with the precious citrus, Nami instructed them to feed the limes to Yosaku. Normally, Johnny would have protested. But this chick was just plain scary. What with ordering around seekings and using mysterious energies. As Luffy and Usopp started to stupidly squeeze as many limes into the man's mouth as physically possible, Nami returned to Johnny. You can stop crying. You know, scurvy is merely caused by a lack of vitamin C, commonly found in citrus fruits. Before, ships didn't have a way to properly store fruit, but we've progressed from that time. Provided he takes it easy, your friend should be healthy again in a few days. Johnny made the transition from crying in sorrow to yelling at Nami in joy almost instantly. As Nami was wiping spittle off her face, Luffy remarked how Nami was really smart for knowing this. That caused a tick mark to appear. You idiot. This is the kind of trouble that appears when you commit yourself to a life on the sea. How could you have just blindly set out without thinking about all the dangers ahead? Almost as soon as the words were out of Nami's mouth, she remembered who she was talking to. You didn't? Did you? Great. It's bad enough knowing your captain's an idiot. Now other people do too. Nami sank into her little dark cloud as she pictured people laughing at her as she crossed the street. Recognizing her from Johnny's stories of the orange head pirate who works for an idiot, small insects died when they entered her atmosphere of gloom. The man in question seemed to recover shortly afterward, only to choke on the limes. Almost before they were out of his mouth, he was up in arms with Johnny, doing an odd little dance and practically screaming their joy that he hadn't died. The mood, as well as Nami's, was broken when the man fell over, once again looking ill. No one heals that fast, Baka. She screamed, her fangs appearing. When the irate woman managed to coordinate Yosaku into the men's quarters, the crew had a meeting in the cabin with Johnny. Said bounty hunter was extremely grateful and was eager to help them in any way to make up for it. Well, Usopp began the practical one under all his layers of cowardice. Would you happen to know where we could find a cook that can fight with sea legs? We need someone that can make a feast out of scraps, before Luffy starves us by eating all the stores in the middle of the night. All crew members sans the one mentioned glared and let out small waves of hockey, silently making Johnny weak at the knees. Their captain paid no attention to either the jibe or the hockey. Recovering slightly, and realizing that there was something odd about the pirate crew his big bro had for some reason joined. Johnny recalled a tidbit of information he had heard. Well, I might know just the place. Bear in mind, it's really close to the Grand Line. So there's a lot of strong ruffians showing up. That man you've been looking for was even seen in the area. Big bro. Zoro's response to this was to clutch one of his three blades while a wolfish smile of anticipation emerged from his features. The others seemed interested. Always one for the melodramatic. Johnny took a pose and pointed out towards the ocean. Go. Make a heading for north-northeast. To the fighting restaurant. Barati. The trip to Barati was uneventful. If you didn't count how many times Johnny and Yosaku passed out. The crew's near subconscious use of hockey to deal with each other. Make a point. Or just get attention to make an announcement had led to many interesting situations. While Luffy had already learned to not use his hockey at every opportunity. Since his was much more powerful and damaging. The crew had yet to learn this lesson. Secretly. Luffy was glad had taken to learning hockey so quickly. Maybe he should teach people stuff more often. Oddly, an incredibly sudden and powerful thunderstorm appeared after he made the thought. Still, the crew had started to tone it down by the time they came within sight of the restaurant. They couldn't just have the locals falling unconscious because of them. Could they? Best to save the psychic war for the privacy of their own ship. The ship, as was eagerly pointed out by Luffy, looked like a giant fish. It had taken the combined intervention of the crew to stop Thrasher from pouncing. The seeking was then told, very sternly, to guard the ship but to stay under the water. Thrasher grumbled something back at Luffy. Who'd replied, Ah, come on boy. It's only as long as we're around people. I promise to play with you more. But can you please just hide? Some more grumbling. But the sulking serpent eventually submerged a comfortable distance beneath the ship. Just as Thrasher disappeared, a marine ship showed up out of nowhere. The apparent leader of the ship called out to them. 
His hair was the same shade as Kobe's, though his skin was much darker. And he wore a fancy suit. His knuckles seemed to have been welded to brass knuckles made of iron. And a pretty woman in a red dress hung off his arm. He spoke with the lofty confidence of someone who arrogantly thinks he's invincible without the brawn to back it up. Who are you people? That's not a pirate insignia I'm familiar with. He spoke courteously enough. But the inhabitants of the ship, most notably Usopp, Johnny, and Yosaku, noticed how many cannons were pointed ominously at them. The man then didn't even wait for an answer. Instead turning his back to them. Never mind. Iron fist, full body doesn't bother with every bunch of rabble that comes along. As he walked away, the man showed his men a closed fist with the thumb pointing downward. Zoro rushed forward, about to cut the guys aiming a cannon at the ship. When Luffy yelled, I'll handle it. With that, Luffy let out a targeted burst of hockey at the marines readying the cannon. He didn't want to actually hurt them, since they might not be the total jerks their leader was. The men collapsed one of them inadvertently adjusting the cannon so that it was pointing at the roof of the restaurant. A loud boom sounded. Before a portion of the top deck of the fishboat was blown off, Luffy rubbed the back of his head at his mistake. While the remaining marines quietly made themselves scarce. Mess with the unheard of pirate that knocked out their guys without touching them. No. Thank you very much. Nami. As was her role. Exploded at Luffy's latest idiocy. Baka. Why didn't you just reflect the cannonball like you did with Buggy? Now the guys at the restaurant are going to blame us since they'll never blame the marines. If you think I'm paying to fix that, you've got another thing coming. Luffy shrugged. He wasn't one to worry, and believed that everything was going to work out in the end, as the crew was docking at the small quay. Someone emerged from the restaurant. His chef's hat was almost as tall as himself. His right leg was a wooden peg, and his mustache was comprised of two nearly horizontal blonde braids. His eyes seemed to practically scream, mess with me and you die, which was impressive in a chubby, middle-aged cook. He turned to face the approaching crew. His eyes narrowed in irritation. Which one of you brats is responsible for the hole in my roof? With this question, he revealed that he was both the owner of the restaurant and appropriately pissed. Just as Nami and Usopp tried to think up an answer that wouldn't get them killed, Luffy answered with his usual thoughtless honesty. That's my fault. I'm very sorry about that. He bowed as he apologized, giving the chef the perfect opportunity to knock the kid on the back of his head with a powerful kick. The crew was surprised that the man had enough strength to knock someone like Luffy around while lovable idiot in question seemed to finally notice the peg leg. Ah, oh, did you lose your leg because of me? The man stomped on Luffy's back, effectively cutting off the boy's airways. Idiot. I lost this leg years ago. However, that explosion gave me a nasty shock, and I'm getting on in years. To cover all the medical expenses and repairs, you're going to work it off here for a year. The man grinned, certain that he just secured a waiter that couldn't quit. Boy was he wrong. Almost in unison. The crew stepped forward, drawing the man's gaze. They responded by letting out small bursts of hockey. The man raised an eyebrow, but reacted in no other way, proving that he was indeed strong. Then, Luffy joined in. I'm sorry about your roof, really, but I can't afford to work here for a year. Luffy's hockey joined the simmering waves his nakama were sending. The man, surprising them all, responded by kicking Luffy full in the face, sending him into the arms of his crew. I'm surprised that a bunch of kids like you can use hockey, but don't think that excuses you from working here. You're going to work here whether you like it or not. With that, the man turned and re-entered the restaurant. Luffy stared after him, before saying, if that Osan could stand up to that, even if we weren't trying to hurt him, then he's not someone to mess with. Usopp exclaimed, but Luffy, you can't actually stay here for a year. Luffy looked back at his marksman, and grinned in such a way to send shivers up everyone's spines except Zoro's, who was merely pitying the poor, unfortunate souls that had just been saddled with his captain. Don't worry. I'm going to be so horrible at whatever job they give me that they'll be begging me to leave by the end of the week. In the meantime, you guys try to convince one of the cooks to join us. With that Luffy entered the restaurant, followed swiftly by his crew, as well as Johnny and Yosaku. The place was really high class, with marble and candles and soft music in the background. Almost immediately after entering, the man from before grabbed Luffy by the collar and dragging the oddly compliant boy away. Just as the crew started looking for a table, figuring they'd eat while they were there. Another blonde showed up out of nowhere. This one was around their own age. Maybe a year older. His bangs covered his left eye. And his face was otherwise unremarkable. He wore a black suit over a blue shirt. With shiny shoes and creased pants. In one hand. He held a rose. Which he proffered to Nami as he got down on one knee. Thank you. O oh goddess of the sea. For arranging this meeting today. For I have met the most beautiful gem you have ever yielded upon a mere man. My love. You are as radiant as the sun. Allow me to adore you as you enjoy the meal I shall lovingly cook for you. At this point, Hearts had replaced his visible eye, and his legs were doing some odd wiggling thing. 
The men of the group were a tad overwhelmed at this display of adoration. Though Nami seemed to take it in her stride. Who said that being beautiful didn't get you anywhere? The man led them to a large table. Where he proceeded to give Nami a rare vintage and wait on her hand and foot. Completely ignoring the men. A few minutes. A truly magnificent feast was set out in front of them. Luffy. Wearing a white apron had been the one to deliver it. So there was a bite missing from nearly every dish. As would have been expected. The blonde apparently noticed. And did something that shocked everyone who knew Luffy. He kicked him hard enough to leave a mark. As the crew knew from long, gleeful, experience. It took enough manpower to crush stone to get even a light bruise to appear on Luffy's rubber skin. This guy was not just a good cook. But apparently a strong one. Nami cupped the man's cheek. Turning him into an obedient ball of love once again. My. My. You must be strong to leave a mark on my captain there. She said seductively. Indicating the slightly steaming form of Luffy. Who was picking himself up off the ground. The food's delicious as well. Might I have the pleasure of knowing your name? The man responded. His mouth in a weird pout. My beloved angel. You care to know the name of a lowly cur such as myself? Your beauty is only matched by your kindness. At this remark. The men of the crew couldn't contain a scoff. Earning them each a brief death glare from the cook. My name. My most lustrous pearl. Is Sanji. The assistant head chef. How I long to shake off the shackles of my position to sail the world with such a flower as yourself. Sadly. There is a great obstacle in our path. An obstacle that might never be breached. From behind him. The owner spoke up. Where he'd been the whole time. So. I'm an obstacle am I? Lil, eggplant? Sanji's face morphed into a grimace. Before standing up and facing the man. What is it? Old man? He asked. Only to be bonked on the head by the older man's hat. That's owner Zef to you. You punk. So? You want to go off after some random woman. Far be it from me to stop you. You're always getting into fights. You flirt with any moderately attractive woman. And your cooking sucks. That last one. More than anything. Seemed to rile up Sanji. Whose hands clenched into fists. Before the blonde could respond, Nami sent a glare at the old man. Oi, leave him alone. I was just about to snag him as our crew's chef. As she said this, she let loose a tad of hockey, to show her frustration, causing the poor couple behind the man to faint. The man regarded her, and grimaced. I have no problem with you taking this annoying lil, eggplant off my hands, but could you please refrain from harming my customers, before Nami could snap back at the patronizing tone, or Sanji could beat the man up for talking to a woman so rudely. The doors were flung open. Everyone turned to see the new arrival. He was thin. Almost unhealthily so and there were bags under his eyes. He wore a jacket with a serpent design on the back over a dark green shirt and pants. All of them dirty and tattered. He looked like he'd been through hell and emerged out the other end. In one hand. He held a pistol. Silence reigned over the restaurant. The man walked over to an empty table. And sat down in a chair. His feet on the table. He spoke. His voice a dry rasp. I don't care what it is. Just get me something to eat. An uneasy murmuring broke out among the patrons of the establishment, anxious about the aura of danger around the man. The straw hats realized that he must have been a prisoner on the marine ship. If so, Thrasher should be allowed to play with them. The man was obviously starving. A large man, nearly bald, with the fakest smile known to man appeared from thin air by the man. His gigantic arms crossed in a gesture of graciousness. Welcome, mere bastard, the man said, with nothing but cheesy compliance in his voice. If the guy was a waiter, he would probably sell to Lucifer himself if he had the money. So saying, do you have any money to pay for your meal? The burly cook asked. That freaky ass smile still on his face. The starving man aimed at the cook's head. Do you take steel? He asked. Obviously used to intimidation tactics. The cook's smile turned into a sneer within nanoseconds. With no forewarning, the man swept the chair out from under the pirate. As the starving man fell to the ground, the cook whirled the chair above his head and brought it down quite heavily on the man's back. Luffy knew that there was a time and a place for recklessness. And this wasn't it. Nami had seen worse. Zoro didn't particularly care. And Usopp was terrified of the man's obvious strength. Hence the lack of intervention on their part. Still, they could glare. And if looks could kill, the cook would be cozying up to Davy Jones right now. With aplomb, the cook picked up the pirate and threw him out the doors. To the applause of the customers. Zeph muttered under his breath, Patty, you continue to disappoint me. Before returning to the kitchens, Sanji disappeared and the crew was left to eat their meal, though with much less of an appetite. Luffy exited the restaurant, looking to check up on the man. To his mild surprise, Sanji was already there, laying a plate of food in front of the pirate. The man seemed shocked at the display of kindness, while Sanji merely leaned against the railing and lit a cigarette. Oi, eat it. You must be hungry. The man was starting to tear up as the aroma of the food hit his nostrils, but he turned away. This is worse than being kicked out. I won't accept pity. My pride as a man and as a pirate won't let me. 
Take it away. Sanji merely repeated his command, taking a puff on the sweet tobacco. The pirates will crumble. And he started to eat like a starving dog. As he ate, his tears broke free, flowing freely down his face. Delicious. Delicious. It's too delicious. I've never had anything this good. He admits through his full mouth, trying to hide his tears. Sanji merely grins. Luffy sits on the railing beside Sanji. You're a pretty nice guy. To feed him even though he couldn't pay. You're pretty strong too. If you could mark me like that. I'm stuck working here for now. But the mustache Osan is going to let me go eventually. Why don't you join my crew? Sanji looks up incredulously at Luffy. Who merely waits for a reply. He had made his request. He was going to wait for an answer. And then nag until the answer was yes if it was a no. Not a chance. Waiter boy. That beauty of yours is amazing. But death itself couldn't drag me from this restaurant. That old fart needs me. Whether he'll admit it or not. Besides. I have no interest in being a pirate. Sanji blew the smoke cloud in Luffy's face. Causing the young pirate to start coughing. The starving man. Now full. Turns to face Luffy. You're a pirate. Aren't you? Luffy. Still coughing. Nods his head. The man asks. With polite curiosity. Where are you headed? Luffy reclaims his breath and answers. The Grand Line. As if it were the most natural thing in the world. Sanji raised an eyebrow. But the man seemed to almost choke in shock. Take that back. You don't want to go there. You can't imagine the horrors in that wretched ocean. Luffy blinks. Wondering what the man means by that. But he turns away from Luffy. Forget it. Do what you want. I just hope you don't fear death. So saying. The man stands up and quickly, procures, a raft. As he prepares to leave. He turns to face Sanji. My name is Jin. Of the Don Krieg Pirates. I thank you for the meal. But I must leave. Sanji merely nods. And when Zef appears on the upper deck. Doesn't react at all. He just picks up the dirty dishes and tosses them into the ocean. Jin is shocked by this display. While Luffy merely becomes that much more determined to get this cook on his crew. Sanji waves Jin off. Before turning to return to his work. Leaving behind the approving chef and obstinate freak of nature. Three days had passed since the crew had arrived. And Luffy was making fair progress with both his goals. He had. To date. Broken 37 plates. Messed up 17 orders. Set fire to the kitchen twice. And had. Accidentally. Broken holes in the floor thrice. Zef was about ready to tear his mustaches out. Since none of his formidable kicks seemed to greatly affect the rubber boy. Meanwhile. In collaboration with Nami. Sanji was placed under a constant barrage to recruiting attempts. His duty to Zef and by proxy the restaurant was strong. But one could only take so much of Luffy's infamous whining. Zoro. Usopp. And Nami. In the meantime. Spent their time learning how to keep their hockey under control. Having learned how to use it. And gone on a binge for a little while. They were having trouble exerting the same level of self-control that Luffy did. Of course. It was that very thought that had galvanized them into action. Luffy. Having more self-control than them. It was a sign of the apocalypse. During the three-day period. Nami came across Johnny and Yosaku's stack of wanted posters. Reminding her uncomfortably of her subterfuge. Thrasher was fed on scraps by Luffy. And helps to scare away the customers by appearing as an ominous shadow right beside their boats. Zef was surprised that the kid had a pet seeking of all things. But just chalked it up to being one more thing on the list of peculiarities about this particular group of kids. Armed with hockey. Obviously skilled. Alongside a docile sea monster. He almost felt impressed. On the third day. An unnatural fog enveloped the area. Making it hard to see your hand in front of your face. Luffy was taking out the garbage as Usopp called out to him from the going merry. Luffy. How much longer do we have to wait here? Nami gets off free because of that arrow cook. But we've got to pay for everything. When do we get out of here? Luffy merely grinned and gave Usopp a thumbs up. That gesture alone was enough to soothe Usopp. Luffy really was an amazing guy. Once you accepted that he was a hopeless idiot. As Luffy turned to re-enter the Bharati. He paused. His head turned to face the mist. His expression unreadable. Zoro seemed to tense up at the same time. Usopp and Nami looked around in confusion. Wondering what had set the powerhouses of the crew on edge. Out of the mist. The shadow of an enormous galleon emerged. Cloaked in shadow and the mist. Only one thing stood out. The pirate flag hung high on its mast. From within. One of the few early morning customers cried out. Run for your lives. That's the flag of Don Krieg. King of East Blue. The hourglasses on the flag show that our time has come. Run. I say. R u u u u u u u u u n n n n n n. Luffy was nearly thrown off the deck into the ocean as every customer fled in a mad dash to their boats. Desperate to get as far away as was possible from the terror of East Blue. Within. Patty's best friend Carne could be heard yelling at the dumbstruck man. Look what you've done. You insulted one of Krieg's pirates and now he's taking revenge. Patty. Through trembling lips. Managed to sputter out. BB but it makes no sense. Why would a man with an armada of 50 ships come all the way here for just one man? 
Luffy entered the restaurant. To see every single chef in the place out and cowering. Sanji appeared. Taking a drag from his latest sig. That ship's awfully damaged. Wouldn't you say? He asked. Making everyone in hearing distance pause. The mist cleared a bit and Sanji's statement proved true. The ship seemed as if a gigantic beast had torn at the ship with its massive claws. Everyone who knew of Krieg's reputation gaped. What could do this to the most feared man in East Blue? The master of subterfuge and betrayal. Don Krieg. Luffy waited by the sidelines. Waiting for what was going to happen to happen. Sanji and Zef were in similar modes of calm. While the rest of the staff started muttering in fear among themselves. With Patty the object of more than a few glares. Slowly. Heavy footsteps could be heard outside the doors. They were opened. To reveal an interesting sight. A giant of a man. Wearing beach clothes alongside clashing gloves and a thick cape. Was leaning on Jin. Looking as if he wasn't fully there. The giant. Evidently Don Krieg. Collapsed to the floor. Jin following him. Looking like a puppy when he finds his master sick and injured. The man spoke into the floor. Please. Please give me food. I don't care if it's scraps. I have lots of money. I beg of you. I can't remember the last time I ate something. The cooks were shocked at the sight of such a fearsome pirate begging for food. While Sanji silently made his way to the kitchen. Patty walked forward. All his arrogant bluster returned. Feed you. Don't make me laugh. Someone call the marines. They'll never get another chance like this. Jin looks up. His eyes broadcasting so much disgust and loathing that the potted plants in the room wilt a little. You bastard. We've got money this time. Doesn't that make us customers? Patty. Ever the hypocrite. Went into a prepared speech about how pirates don't count. And that scum didn't deserve the scraps from the garbage can. He would have continued. But Sanji kindly imploded his face for him. Patty crumbled like a house of cards. While Sanji strode forward and placed a huge bowl of fried rice and a bottle of wine in front of Krieg. Who began to eat with just as much eagerness as Jin had a few days before. Karne yelled out, Sanji. What the hell are you doing? Don't you know who that is? If you feed him. He's going to take over the ship or something. This guy has no remorse. How could you just give food to a heartless pirate? Sanji didn't get a chance to answer. As he was suddenly socked right in the face by the now energized Krieg. Who was roaring in triumph. Jin looked shocked. As if he hadn't expected Krieg to bite the hand that fed him. Krieg took his gloves off. Revealing his diamond knuckles. That food's as good as my subordinate said it was. The man pointed to his ship. There are about a hundred men still alive on my ship. Give me the food. And I'll give you a chance escape before I steal this here boat of yours. Jin looked horrified. Don. That's not what you promised. He yelled. Only to be cowed into submission by one glare from Krieg. Krieg turned to face the cooks. His face showing the mad fox beneath. I like this ship of yours. It's the perfect disguise. With this. I'll be able to pull off much more ambushes. Now start cooking those meals if you want to live. The cooks protested loudly. Proclaiming their pride as fighters. Sanji. However. Merely got up and made his way to the stairs to the kitchen. Karne asked, Oi, Sanji, where are you going? Sanji replied tonelessly, to the kitchens. Of course. We've got a hundred meals to cook. After all, everyone froze. Unable to believe Sanji's apparent, betrayal. Though oddly enough, Luffy understood why he did it almost easily. That's the benefit of being an idiot. Things that should be complex seem awfully simple. As the cooks pulled out giant utensils out of nowhere, brandishing them threateningly, Sanji merely spread his arms. He said, we are cooks of the sea. It doesn't matter if they're a devil or a saint. If a man appears before us with a rumbling tummy, it is our duty to make sure he is fed. Isn't that enough for a chef? The wise remark would have worked on any man with a shred of compassion. But Patty had always had a deficit in that area. He knocked Sanji down with one blow to the head. Sanji. I know that you feed the people I throw out. And maybe that's the right thing sometimes. But you can't just feed a bunch of pirates. This is Bharati. We've dealt with plenty of pirates in our time. He turns to face Krieg pulling large cannon from a secret compartment. So, you like the meal? Did you? Well, why don't you stick around for dessert? Meatball of doom. Patty pulled the trigger. Unleashing sound and destruction. A giant dust cloud obscured the door. Luffy wasn't fooled. In his experience, the arrogant fools always stuck around like cockroaches. Patty wasn't as wise, and started to make a victory speech. Then, Krieg spoke, causing the celebrating cooks to nearly piss themselves. Is that what you call dessert? It tastes terrible. The cloud dispersed revealing an unharmed Krieg, who was ripping off his beach shirt to reveal the thick, gold armor underneath. With this Woot's steel armor, the greatest weapons, and the most men, I'm invincible. I am the only pirate worthy of the title, Don. Now pay for your insolence. Krieg pulled out twin pistols, while cannons emerged from his armor, barely giving his targets the time to widen their eyes. Krieg opened fire. Several cooks went down with wounds, though most of them weren't fatal. Luffy. Sanji and a few others remained completely unhurt.
either due to blind luck or circumstances of fate. Creed was practically foaming at the mouth, yelling about how he was the unquestionable greatest, not noticing what was approaching until it was right in front of him. Zef dropped a giant sack in front of Krieg, saying, Here's food for a hundred. Go feed your men. Luffy raised an eyebrow, while the staff of the Barati nearly had strokes. Their own owner. Giving in to this maniac. Krieg, instead of being thankful, seemed like he had seen a ghost. You, he whispered, almost as if he were talking to himself. Your red leg Zef. Aren't you? The fearsome pirate captain that was also the ship's cook. The man that was called Red Leg because his shoes were stained with the blood of his enemies. Around this point, Krieg regained his composure. Seems that those days are over. Zef shrugged. I've chosen the life of a cook. I'm through with piracy. Krieg laughed and yelled at Zef that he hadn't chosen. Losing his leg had chosen for him. Luffy and Sanji glared at that. Sanji for the man disrespecting the man that had saved his life. Luffy just because the man had assumed Zef couldn't fight with only one leg. That was a bold-faced lie. The man could cook better than Sanji on a bad day. Krieg got a sick grin on his face. You survived a year in the Grand Line. You must have kept a journal of your journey. Give it to me. I need it. Armed with your knowledge. I shall conquer the Grand Line. Zef turned his back on Krieg. It is true I have the log. But I won't give it to someone to you. It's the pride of my crew. Why would you even need it? Mister. Couldn't last a week in the Grand Line. Fearful muttering. Not even Don Krieg could have handled the Grand Line. Krieg grimaced. That was a fluke. I had the men. The power. The fleet. The only thing I lacked was knowledge. I was arrogant and believed I could take on that monstrous sea without strategy. However, your log must explain what method you used to survive there. Give it to me. I need it to become the Pirate King. Luffy frowned. Say what now? He stepped forward. Speaking for the first time since this whole thing started. I don't know who you are. But the man who's going to be the Pirate King is me. Luffy punctuated his statement with a steady flow of hockey. That was the thing about Hawashoku. With normal hockey. It was one quick burst. The only variable the size and strength. With the king's disposition, Luffy was capable of releasing a continuous stream. Fitting. Since a king needed a certain aura to intimidate his unruly subjects. Krieg seemed vastly uncomfortable with the hockey. While Jin was choking on his spit. But he managed to cover it up with his usual bluster. You. The pirate king? I'll ignore that comment kid. Cause the man who'll be the pirate king is definitely me. Current score. Luffy won. Krieg won. Zoro spoke up from the stairs. Yo. Luffy. You need our help with this guy? Everyone turned their attention to him. Only to find a bloodthirsty warrior. Eager for the fight to come. But keeping himself calm in the meantime. Beside him stood the slightly trembling Usopp. Though the man had his slingshot out. So that was a good sign. We can t-take on any guy you want. Luffy. No one can stand up to the invincible Usopp. Luffy too. Krieg won. Krieg decided to back off and focus on the immediate problem. I don't have time to deal with you kids. The man picked up the sack. Turning to leave but not without some parting words. I'm going to feed my men. Anyone still around when I get back is as good as dead. I'll be expecting that log. With that, the crook left. Going to feed his lackeys. Leaving Jin behind to the tender mercies of Bharati. Such a lucky guy. Right? Jin was practically prostrate. I am so sorry for all of this. This isn't what he said he'd do. He was supposed to just take the food and leave you in peace. Zef didn't seem particularly phased by this. He turned to his cooks and said, If anyone of you doesn't have the courage to stay and fight, I will certainly not hold it against you. His men were stunned, but didn't even need to think. This was their home, the place that hadn't taken them in when they were drifting alone. They would show Krieg the power of the Barati's fighting cooks. Jin watched with something very near approaching horror. He screamed at them how they were throwing their lives away, that the dawn was unbeatable. Sanji silenced him. Jin, it is my duty as a cook to ensure all men are fed. However, he said, flipping a nearby table upright with one movement of his leg. Now that they're fed, I have no obligation to them. If anyone so much as breathes wrong at this restaurant, I'll kill them. Sanji glared to get his point across. Jin gulped. The man seemed to close in, muttering to himself, it's that damn ocean's fault. Luffy perked up, remembering a few crucial details he'd missed, oh, Jin, you've been to the Grand Line, right? What's it like? Ah, oh, Luffy, always capable of childlike excitement at any moment of danger. Jin looked at him with hollow eyes. Do yourself a favor. Abandon that dream of yours. You have your whole life ahead of you. You shouldn't throw it away in that place. Jin was curled up into a ball by now. An armada of fifty ships and five thousand men. All taken down by storms and a single man. Everyone was shocked at that. One man? Jin continued. I thought it was a nightmare. All my mates. Thousands of men strong. Obliterated within minutes. All by that beast. That man. The man with the eyes of a hawk. Zoro tensed at that. His hand unconsciously went to his sword. 
Zeph spoke up at this point, saying, If what you say is true, those eyes practically confirm it. That was Jurakil Mahawk, the literal world's greatest when it comes to swordsmanship. Maybe you guys interrupted his nap. Stuff like that happens in the Grand Line, killing people over little things. Before anyone could comment further, an almighty splitting sound filled the air, as if the world's largest plank of wood had been snapped in half. A few went to the windows, but most went outside, to come across the most unbelievable sight they'd ever witnessed. Don Krieg's ship had been sliced in half. There was no other word for it. It was cut down the middle as if whatever deity was out there had dropped a guillotine over the ship. However, the Straw Hat crew noticed something much more personal concerning them. The going Mary was gone. Big bro. Johnny yelled, dragging Yosaku on board while Zef barked quick commands to ensure they wouldn't sink. Big bro. It was horrible. We were just standing around when Big Sis hit us with that hockey thing you told us about. The next thing we know. She's sailing away in the ship. She's stolen your ship. The crew simultaneously yelled out, Nani. While Zoro started to mutter darkly how he'd never trusted the woman, and Usopp freaked out about Kaya's ship being stolen from them, Luffy seemed oddly calm. Oi, oi, big bro Luffy. Why do you seem so uncaring? Johnny spit, screamed. Because, Thrasher isn't here. The crew were surprised, but discovered that the shadow that had marked Thrasher had disappeared. He wouldn't be scared off by whatever happened to that ship. So, he must have gone with Nami. That means that Thrasher believes that whatever Nami is doing, She's doing it for a very good reason. Zoro muttered darkly how the fish could just be following her in fear. Luffy stubbornly shook his head. Thrasher trusts her. And I trust Thrasher. I want you to go after her. But don't assume anything. Give her a chance to explain. Zoro and Usopp were reminded why the captain was Luffy. Obediently, they started to prepare Johnny and Yosaku's raft. Zoro quickly stopped. However, when he caught sight of an approaching boat, it was small, shaped like a coffin, with lit candles at each vertex oddly green in color. It was the man sitting in the boat that caused Zoro to freeze. An intoxicating mixture of anticipation, battle lust, and awe raced through his veins as he laid eyes on the man he'd set off to see for in the first place. The man wore a trench coat, black outside, red inside, over his bare chest and simple pants. His face was shaded by a feathered hat, but his yellow eyes seemed to pierce right through the darkness, like floodlights in the night. On his back, the biggest sword anyone had seen hung in a harness, the steel black as midnight the cross guard as long as an arm and dripping with jewels. That's him. That's Mahawk. Zoro muttered to himself, alerting those that heard him of who the man was. One of Krieg's men, revitalized by Zeph's food, yelled out, You bastard. Why did you chase after us? Why did you hunt us down all the way back here? Mahawk regarded the random pirate, before replying in a dry tone, For fun, I was bored. The pirate sputtered at the reason, unable to believe that this demon in human's flesh had taken down the entirety of Krieg's fleet for such a stupid reason. Enraged, he aimed a pistol at the man's head and fired. Only a few caught what happened in that instant. Mahawk, with effortless grace, drew his sword and, in a lightning quick movement that looked easy when he did it, deflected the bullets with the tip of his sword. The pirate glanced down at his gun, wondering what had happened, as his aim had been true. Zoro appeared behind the pirate, eager for a fight. I've never seen such style with a blade. To be able to deflect bullets is admirable. Mahawk turned his gaze to Zoro who did not so much as flinch as the infamous eyes regarded him. But of course, without subtlety and grace, a sword is not but an iron bar. The man spoke offhand, as if he did this every day. Hell, he probably did. Zoro gripped his swords, drawing the attention of Krieg's men, who started whispering fearfully when they saw the infamous pirate hunter Zoro was in their midst. I set out to see to face you one day, and claim your title. Fight me now, as a swordsman. Mahawk regarded him icily. Pitiful weakling. You might have some skill in this sea. But remember that it is the weakest of the five. You fail to understand how large the world is. Why should I waste my time with you? Zoro drew his swords, getting into his Santoryu, his eyes blazing with determination. Not a drop of fear anywhere in his stance. Mahawk chuckles to himself. In an instant, Mahawk was on the same platform broken from Krieg's ship as Zoro. As you wish, I will end your life for you. Zoro glared, only to become furious when, instead of drawing his sword, Mahawk revealed a small knife hidden in a necklace he wore. Mahawk grinned. Unfortunately, this is the smallest blade I own. Zoro charged, yelling out, Don't take me lightly, Onijiri. Zoro let loose with his trademark attack. All his strength and every drop of hockey he could muster behind the blow. He would show this man how wrong he was. Mahawk merely darted forward with his knife, completely immobilizing Zoro. Everyone stared in shock. Zoro's unstoppable Onijiri halted by a toy knife. Johnny and Yosaku cried out it must be a trick. Luffy watched on. Aware of how important this fight was to Zoro. Zoro himself was dumbfounded. 
There's no way I'm this far away. He cried out, staring unbelievably at the point where all three of his swords were stuck fast by one puny knife. Mahawk, on the other hand, seemed loftily confident, if a little curious about something, probably the hockey. Then, it happened. Mahawk's arm bent. It was barely an inch, but it proved that Zoro's attack had gotten through. It only barely. That was all Zoro needed. If he could knock him back an inch, he could knock him back another. In a blinding flurry, Zoro pulled away before unleashing a frenzy of his best attacks, all his dreams, ambitions, training, and the gift of his captain, Haki, coming out in an unquenchable tide. Mahawk blocked each attack with simple, efficient movements, but his eyes showed disbelief. Such ferocious swordplay. And the boy uses Haki. What makes him fight so fearlessly? Zoro was gone. In his place was a raving beast, a monster that would never stop, even in the face of death, until it got what it wanted. He cared not for the fact that all his assaults were blocked, he just continued on with another. It was an awe-inspiring sight, the unstoppable force of Zoro's Santoryu, meeting the immovable object of Mahawk's skill. The chefs and pirates watched and felt wonder. They had never seen a fight like this. Johnny, Yusaku, and Usopp cheered on, while Luffy just looked on, pride in his eyes as he watched his first mate. Sanji was amazed that the Merimo kept going on relentlessly, even when it was obvious he wasn't going to win. Zef's expression was unreadable. Finally, Zoro overextended. He pulled back for another attack, leaving an opening. Mahawk exploited it, darting forward like Quicksilver, embedding the knife in Zoro's chest. Johnny and Yosaku had to be restrained by Luffy. Before a quick flare of hockey left them limp in his arms, Luffy glared at their barely conscious bodies. It was Zoro's fight. By God. And no one was going to interfere. Mahawk looked into Zoro's eyes, which held a resignation that the man had never seen before. Why do you not pull back? The master asked. Zoro responded. I don't honestly know. I just feel that if I step back, even once, then all the promises, deals, and many other things till now, all of it will be meaningless. Mahawk replied, yes, and that's called defeat. If you don't retreat, you'll die. Zoro glared right into the man's eyes. Something few had ever done. Death would be better. Zoro spat, the hockey leaving his exhausted body without conscious effort as he spoke. Mahawk withdrew the knife, putting it away. Boy, tell me your name. Zoro got into his final stance, preparing himself for one last attack. Roranoa Zoro. Mahawk grinned. I'll take care to remember that. As an honor from one swordsman to another. My black sword, the greatest in the world, shall take your life. So saying, Mahawk drew the massive blade, holding it was all the grace and power of a mighty dragon. In that same context, Zoro was a phoenix. Fighting ferociously for what it believed in, never accepting death, coming back time and time again, stronger than ever. Zoro started to spin the swords in his hand. Santoryu Ugi. Sanzen Sakai. Zoro yelled as Mahawk dashed forward, condensing everything that he believed in, what he fought for, the core of his being, into a single attack, the very power of his soul and will overflowing into his blades. The attacks clashed in an invisible instant. Mahawk was now behind Zoro. Zoro retained his stance from his attack, the world holding its breath as it and the people watching awaited the outcome. The swords in Zoro's hands shattered, and numerous cuts appeared across his body, unseen by anyone, hidden by his hat, a small scratch mars Mahawk's cheek. The man grins. He has found a true swordsman. Zoro calmly sheathed his Kuina's sword, the Wado Ichimanji, before turning and barring his chest to Mahawk. He looks up. No fear or hesitation in his eyes. A blow to the back as a swordsman's shame, was all he said, looking into the calm, approving eyes of Mahawk. Very true. The man responds, before bringing his blade down in a slice that cut Zoro's chest wide open. Came the universal cry from the Straw Hat crew. Johnny and Yosaku dived in the water. Desperate to save their big bro, Sanji, who had watched incredulously, yelled, Baka, it's simple, to abandon your dream. No one hears him over Luffy's anger. I'll kill you. Luffy yells, hockey pouring off of him in waves, making many of the chefs and pirates fall over, unconscious and foaming at the mouth. Even though they were at the very fringes, Luffy leaps forward, his fist flying forward at Mahawk, stunned into stillness by the shock of Luffy's spirit. Usopp is not idle. A courage he has never known wells up from within and suddenly he has his slingshot lined up with Mahawk, and his is stuffing the lead ball in his grip with every ounce of hockey he can muster. Zeph and Mahawk unknowingly think the same thing. To react so, when they see their crewmate injured this badly, Mahawk barely dodges Luffy's punch, the man sailing by him to impact with a wooden wall, which he plows through like it isn't there, his hand coming back to latch onto the platform before he drowns. Usopp fired, causing the floor beneath Mahawk to crumble into dust, unbalancing the man. Luffy flies forward like a shot from a pistol 
this time making contact with his fist, sending Mahawk flying. All his skill rendered useless against Luffy's rage. Mahawk crashes down on a piece of Krieg's boat that had already managed to float that far. He has traversed the entire length of the restaurant by the force of a single man's fist. Usopp lines up his aim again, as Luffy prepare another blow. Their only thought, this guy's going to pay. Usopp had grown close to Zoro, seeing him as a kind of lazy, scary cousin that he was forced to live with. They didn't get along well, but Usopp's first instinct was to avenge him, so it must have counted for something. Luffy needed no such reason. Zoro was his Nakama. This man had hurt Zoro. It was as simple as that. Mahawk spoke up, feeling impressed for the first time in what felt like forever. You are a good crew, to attack so fiercely for you crewmate. But, you need not avenge him, he is not dead. Usopp and Luffy pause, turning to look at Zoro, only to find that he is indeed alive, dragged to the raft by Johnny and Yosaku. As they watch, Zoro shakily unsheathes his one remaining sword. Never again, they hear, Zoro's voice faint but full of emotion. Unashamed tears fall from Zoro's eyes as he proclaims for the world to hear, until I face you again. I will never lose. I will not lose again until I face you once more. I'm going to become the world's greatest. Got a problem with that, Captain? Luffy shook his head. I wouldn't expect anything less. A smile adorns Luffy's face. Now that his rage has evaporated at seeing Zoro still alive, Mahawk speaks up, drawing the attention of everyone. Roranoa Zoro, train harder. Harder than you ever have. Surpass your limits surpass me. Zef whispers to himself, only Sanji hearing him, for Hawkeye Mahawk to say such words. This crew is destined for greatness. Mahawk regards Luffy as Usopp, his former cowardice emerging, ducks down and busies himself with preparing the raft to chase Nami. You, boy, what is your ambition? Luffy looks back, an even greater determination that Zoro's burning from within his soul. Pirate King. Mahawk chuckles. That is a hard road, harder even than the one your young friend has chosen. You have earned my respect. I pray we meet again. With that, Mahawk jumps to his boat. Of course, some idiot which shall remain unnamed. Hint. He has purple hair and is obviously as obsessed with weapons as Tenten from Naruto. Oi. Hawkeyes. Didn't you come here for my head? The head of the fearsome Don Krieg? Shoot. He named himself. There goes the suspense. Mahawk regarded the man with his piercing. Dead gaze. Which had now returned. I might have come here for that. But I've had more than my fill of excitement for today. I think I shall return to my home and nap. Krieg yells out in rage, not even caring as the few conscious members of his crew beg him to stop. As he opened fire on Mahawk, the swordsman could be heard hearing, a true fool. There was an explosion of sound and water, and suddenly Mahawk had disappeared, as if he'd never been. Luffy's arm came out of the blast, stunning the few still conscious who didn't know about his powers. As Luffy got back on the Barati, Usopp yelled out to him as he, the injured Zoro, and the two bounty hunters took off. Luffy, we're off to get Nami. Be sure to bring that cook with you when we meet up. Luffy grins and gives the thumbs up. Oi, Osan, if I take down Krieg for you, can I leave this place? Zef regarded the grinning rubber man, before looking down at the prostrate forms of his staff. Doesn't look like I have much choice. Do I? Do what you want. Luffy grinned, the strongest of Barati, Zef, Sanji, a few anonymous cooks, and oddly Patty and Carne, behind him as he turned his gaze on Krieg, with his guns and crew, with pleasure. Luffy gazed around. The sea. How he loved the sea. It was both the one thing that could hurt him and the one thing he could never part from. God. It was just so beautiful. Full of possibilities too. Adventures just like his are completely different. Yet they all happened on the sea. Such was the workings of Luffy's mind as he lazed about. Waiting for lunch. The fight with Krieg hadn't been long. Hell. It was a joke. Sanji took on the freaky shield guy. But Luffy had taken on everyone else. Without breaking a sweat. One pulse of hockey and what remained of the lackeys were down. Krieg had of course pulled every trick he had out, but it didn't really work out, bullets didn't pierce. He completely ignored the spikes with his massive pain tolerance, and that poison bomb he'd prepared near the end had been stopped before it started. That spear had been a pain, but Luffy had countered with an odd power of hockey. He could delay or redirect explosions. He wasn't really good at it, and wound up with a few burns, but he managed to take it down. Of course, there was the net. As Krieg was collapsing under Luffy's unforgiving fists, he'd flamethrower Ed the rubber boy and thrown an iron net out of nowhere, sending Luffy into the sea. As Luffy started drowning, he'd been saved by two people, one to be expected, and one quite the surprise. The first one was now cooking, the second sat across from Yosaku. Maybe we should get the timeline straight first. Sanji had been reminded of his childhood dream upon hearing Luffy's own impossible dream, and witnessing the stubbornness and conviction with which he chased it down, defying death itself. In the aftermath of the fight, thoughts of all blue had plagued him. Zef, wanting him to chase his dream, 
had pulled a trick in order to make him leave of his own accord. Sanji had seen through it eventually. But he'd realized what he'd truly wanted. While Sanji listened in as the staff explained their ruse in claiming Sanji's food was terrible in order to make him quit, Yosaku had appeared in a most unusual fashion. Still, how many people can claim they traveled in a shark's mouth? Seriously. When the resulting mayhem had died down, Yosaku explained how the group that had left had managed to determine where Nami was headed. Luffy was all for leaving immediately. Heedless of Yosaku's warnings that the person on the island made Krieg look harmless. With the thanks, and 80% of the meat, a Bharati, Luffy and company, had made to leave. Only to be stopped by Sanji. His words were still clear in Luffy's head. We all have foolish dreams. I guess I'll have a go at mine. I'll join your crew. And thus, the odd, intangible, mind-boggling power of Luffy strikes once again. He could make people that hated his guts become his best friend. Given enough time. Why? Oh why? Had fate given the charisma to the idiot? Why? Luffy had jumped for joy. Immediately thinking of all the delicious food he was going to eat. Sanji. In a goodbye that had started out stoic but had dissolved into everyone crying. Left the Bharati. To chase down his dream of all blue as a pirate. This is what people are expecting. Let's throw the curveball. Shall we? While Luffy had made the preparations to go. Jin had approached him. The Krieg crew, the ones that had recovered from the Mahawk incident, had fled with their tails between their legs, leaving him behind. Jin was in a state of great confusion. He'd always believed that Krieg was the greatest, and had dutifully followed him even while he committed atrocious acts. Because of his respect for the man's strength, the Don was the best, to be the best. Some things just had to be done. That illusion had been shattered. Krieg had crossed a line. It was one thing to use a marine ship to sneak up on a base. It was another to betray the very people that had saved your life. Jin had seen the amazing strength that Luffy had demonstrated. The single-minded focus and drive that allowed him to take on the invincible. Like a puppy. Jin had attached himself to Luffy the same way he'd attached himself to Krieg. Luffy had seen that Jin was a good guy. And he'd demonstrated his skill at the cannonball tonfa. As he called them. When Patty had snuck up on him to get him to pay for his free meal a few days prior. He was welcomed into the crew. No questions asked. What? Don't look at me like that. The guy's going to want an animate skeleton on his crew ten minutes after meeting him. Mild tear in the fourth dimension aside. Luffy was ecstatic. He'd gotten the world's greatest cook. And uh. Well. Whatever Jin was to boot. It had only been a day since they'd left the Bharati. But Luffy's charm had already started working. Jin was proving to be excellent company. Sanji. Especially. Seemed to be making friends with him. The two of them finding that. Aside from Sanji's womanizing. The two had much in common. Still. He seemed withdrawn at times as if the reality of Krieg's defeat were still catching up to him. Luffy needed to break him out of his shell. Well, no time like the present. Luffy guessed. Oi, Jin, I was wondering, what's your life like? Sanji already told us all about All Blue and Zef saving him back at the Bharati. So I know him. You, on the other hand, I don't know at all. You're still part of my crew, but we're not Nakama till we've cried. Mind telling me your story? It was true. Luffy had, through hockey treatments, whining, and a lot of dodging gotten Zoro and Usopp to admit their pasts, making them all closer as Nakama. Nami, though, had seemed ashamed and very sad when the subject came up, and even Luffy could be sensitive. Jin looked willing enough, though his eyes reflected some old sorrow. He began with, I was born on a small island, on the other end of East Blue, near the Red Line. Time were hard. Our village was right by the Red Line, where the tides were unpredictable. There were few merchants willing to take the risk to sail to our island with surprise. I grew up with food enough, though just barely. My village wasn't really self-sufficient, and it wasn't uncommon for the locals to join the bandits, in order to steal the next shipment and take all the food for their own. It was a very dog-eat-dog -dog atmosphere. When I was 13, my father became gravelly ill. We didn't have the money for a doctor, and he died soon after. My mother went into despair, and she all but forgot about me. I tried to join the bandits, feeling alone and unwanted, but they didn't accept me, saying I was weak and puny. The next day, Don Krieg showed up, stealing the food for him and his crew before the bandits could. When then attacked him in anger, they took him down single-handedly. I was amazed by his strength. I begged him to let me join his crew. Incredibly, he accepted. We sailed together. My loyalty never in question. He made me strong, gave me purpose when I was drifting. In my eyes, he could do no wrong. When we managed to escape the Grand Line, I acted as a decoy, luring the Marines away from our flagship. Without a second thought, when I managed to escape, I found myself at the Bharati. The rest is history. Jin chuckled to himself. It's funny. I tried to join the bandits because they were strong. Then joined Krieg when he proved stronger. Only to join you when you were stronger still. You should probably be afraid of my betrayal in case I find someone even stronger. 
he said, his tone full of carefully hidden self-loathing. Luffy would have none of that. Please, as if anyone could be stronger than me. Even if there was, you wouldn't want to leave. Jin cocked his head in confusion. Luffy grinned like his namesake. I'm going to make sure you have so much fun on my crew that you'll never want to leave. Jin smiled slightly, but his eyes seemed clear of doubts for the first time since he'd gotten on the boat. Yosaku pounded his fist on the deck. Getting the attention of Luffy, Jin, and Sanji within the kitchens. How can you act so carefree at a time like this? We're going off to Arlong Park. Do you have any idea how serious that is? Luffy shook his head no. But Jin seemed a tad more serious. Yosaku sighed, and decided to enlighten Luffy. Okay, listen really closely to me. Luffy, in the Grand Line, there are three major powers. One of them is the Shichibukai. They are seven pirates approved by the world government. Sanji asked, through the open window of the kitchen, how any pirate could be approved by the government. Yosaku explained calmly. The Shichibukai used to be pirates with enormous bounties. Now, the hunt down other pirates, in exchange for amnesty for their actions. Hawkeyes, the man Big Bro Zoro faced, is one of them. One of the Shichibukai is a merman. A race with ten times the strength of a man and the ability to breath underwater. And Arlong. The man Nami is going after. Was on his crew. Do you understand how powerful a foe we face now? Luffy looked up from his sketching pad. Which he had retrieved from. I have no idea. So, he looks like this? Luffy questioned. Revealing a poor drawing of a gaping fish on two legs. Jin, despite himself. Chuckled. While Sanji laughed outright when he peeked through the kitchen door. Yosaku hung his head. Sad that all his effort had been worthless. Luffy suddenly became serious. I don't care how strong he is. Nami wants something with him. If he gets in my way, I'll kick his ass. It's as simple as that. Jin raised an eyebrow. With Krieg. The man had carefully judged his opponents. Learning all their weaknesses before he fought. Luffy, on the other hand, seemed to prone to just charging right in. It was an oddly refreshing course of action. Yosaku brightened at Luffy's attitude. Only for his mouth to yield to a waterfall of saliva as Sanji emerged. Balancing plates of delicious looking food. Okay. We've got meat off the bone. Fried beans. And my specialty rice. Everyone dig in. The next five minutes were occupied by table manners that would have made wild animals look like high class society. Luffy tore into everything in sight. Becoming a human vacuum. Yosaku. Having learned from experience. Tried to eat his food as fast as possible before it disappeared down Luffy's gullet. Jin was simply too ignorant to prepare. Half his food disappeared without him even noticing. Sanji after a punishing blow to Luffy's soft head, was left clear of the slaughter. Sanji started to stare off dreamily for some reason. If Nami-san is involved with these mermen, maybe she is a mermaid. Hearts replaced his one visible eye, causing Jin to take a cautious step away. Luffy, in response, held up a picture identical to his last one. Except this one had long hair. Sanji exploded, yelling at Luffy as if it would solve all the world's problems. They were suddenly interrupted by a massive jet of water from the side of the boat. Turning to investigate, the four found themselves staring into the hungry eyes of what appeared to be a giant bull with fins and scales. Yosaku started panicking in a very Usopp-esque manner, while the other three watched with no obvious emotion. Anyone else want to take it? Luffy asked, still gnawing on the bone he just put in his mouth. Sanji slowly stood up, turning to face the sea cow. Oi, if it's just the food you want, take it. The cow gave no sign of understanding, but did open its mouth and lean forward. Out of nowhere. Sanji gave it a punishing kick to the head. In response the Yosaku's panic. He explained, the cow was going to eat me too. What kind of manners are those? The cow reappeared. This time looking angry. Sanji stared it down calmly. As it dashed forward. Sanji leapt high into the air. Collier shoot. With that. Sanji delivered a powerful kick to the creature's neck. Effectively bruising if not crumbling its windpipe. The sea cow fell on its back. Creating a nice little dramatic water jet. Sanji turned to bow. Jin applauded very respectfully. Luffy took another approach. Suge. I'm so glad I got you as my cook. Yosaku took a deep breath. I'm going to die of a heart attack if I stick around big bro Luffy any longer than necessary. The man thought to himself. Sanji returned to his seat. Now that the excitement was over. He had a question to ask. Oi. Luffy. The shitty old man mentioned something to me. And I've been meaning to ask you about it. Taking his eyes off Yosaku's temporarily unguarded plate. Luffy turned to face Sanji indicating he had his attention. The old man came across a few people with that hockey stuff when he was in the Grand Line. He was wondering how you and everyone on your crew managed to use it, since it's supposed to be really rare. Luffy smiled, revealing his semi-full mouth. That's easy. Hockey is just the excess energy given off by a strong spirit. Some people have a special hockey like me, but that's just because I have a special soul. Luffy then held up one finger. 
One of the reasons why my Nakama can use it is because they knew about it in the first place. A second finger went up. Another reason is that they spend a lot of time dealing with my hockey. So they got a better understanding of what it feels like. A third finger went up. The main reason they can all use it, though, is because they all have crazy dreams they'd lay their lives down for. Usopp may be a coward. And Nami might not look like much, at this point. Sanji's foot headed for his head. Accompanied by the chain smoker's enraged yell. Like hell Nami Swan isn't much. Do you even have eyes? Or does your rubber brain think boys are better? Luffy took the blow. His head snapping back into place due to the wonders of a rubber neck. He kept on speaking. Completely ignoring Sanji's outburst. But, deep down, they're just as determined as me or Zoro. Usopp has spent his entire life wanting to be brave. To be a warrior. And Nami is as fierce as a tiger. She'd sooner cut off her arm than just throw everything she believes in away. That is why. With a little help from me. They managed to learn how to use hockey. This isn't OC. Nami stabbed herself and was willing to spend another hopeless few years gathering money just so no one would get hurt. As to Usopp. Hello. If he wasn't as insane as the rest of them. Would he have fought Luffy with everything he had in Water 7? The Straw Hats aren't normal. People. Even the ones that look normal. So I would appreciate fewer comments about how you guys can't believe that the, weaker, characters have hockey as well. On with the story. At this point. The sea cow righted itself. Now crying and with a big bump on his head. Luffy turned away from Sanji to the cow. Hey. Mystery cow. Would you mind helping us get to the next island? The cow just stared. And started to just turn away and leave when Luffy spoke again. This time in the voice he used with Thrasher when he was still training him. Are you sure you wouldn't like to help us? Luffy asked. Freaking out the rest of the people on the boat. Who hadn't heard Luffy's, no nonsense, voice before. The cow froze. He turned back to face Luffy. Sufficiently cowed. No pun intended. Luffy grinned. And expertly lassoed a rope around the cow's horns and attached it to the boat. Onward. Luffy yelled. Signaling the cow to haul Finn. Leaving Jin. Sanji and Yosaku to go flying back amid a hail of three-quarters eaten food. Elsewhere, Zoro was officially pissed. This is bad. Zoro got partially pissed when Usopp got loud and started panicking. He became moderately pissed when Nami started haggling him about money he didn't even remember borrowing from her. And he had been borderline pissed when Luffy had pulled the training regime from the land of melon waffles of doom, um, waffles, covered in cheese syrup, yum, wtf. But now, Zoro was officially pissed. The group had finally gotten to Arlong Park, where Nami had apparently charged off towards in hope of getting the substantial bounty. Zoro, even with a crippling injury, had been all for the warrior's approach. Of course, Usopp wouldn't know warrior's pride if it popped out of his bag and slapped him silly. So, pathetic coward that he was, had jumped Zoro when his back was turned, aided by Johnny. Traitor. Now, Zoro was tied up with rope. Surrounded by mermen, Usopp had steered clear of Arlong Park, only to jump ship at the first sign of the fish people, leaving Zoro behind. Oh yeah, he was definitely going to kill him. But, those happy thoughts would have to be put on hold. Right now, Zoro had to deal with the situation. Here's the sitrep. He was tied up with quality rope, with a fresh injury that had been patchily treated by him, which even then was sending constant waves of pain and fever, breaking his concentration. He had only one workable sword. He was surrounded by mermen in their home base. Said mermen seemed to be made of tougher stuff than humans, as Zoro's flares of hockey had only taken out the obvious weaklings, and each flare was met by a kick to the chest by the nearest mermen. So, yeah, if he ever got out of this, Usopp would be his new training dummy. In front of the green-haired man, the leader of the mermen sat on a throne-like chair, made of simple stone. He wore an open beach shirt over his impressive chest, which had a tattoo of the sun over the left pectoral. He was also wearing green shorts with a blue belt of cloth a fur cap over black hair, and sandals. That's where the human qualities ended. He was easily seven feet, perhaps taller. His skin was a light blue, with webbing between his fingers. Though he was a shark merman, he apparently had some swordfish somewhere in the gene pool, since his nose was longer than Usopp's, and very pointy. Oh, and his teeth. Very, very pointy. The leader was regarding him with the look Zoro had come to associate with all the enemy's fate lined up for him. Arrogant. Full of superiority and believing that they were invincible. Seriously. The crew should make a checklist to test the theory. The fishman spoke. His tone deep and interwoven with his god complex. I'll ask you again. What were you doing on a boat near my shore? Are you some nobody bounty hunter looking to take on me? Sawtooth Arlong? Not that you'd have a chance. You're just a human. Oh. That was another quirk about the guy. Arlong apparently. He seemed to think mermen were inherently better than humans. Zoro didn't bother to point out that mermen couldn't eat devil's fruits. 
or the fact that humans outnumbered them about 10 to 1. I told you. My captains sent me here to find a woman. Do you need to have your hearing checked, fishman? That caused dark murmurs to fly. Arlong grinned maliciously. I'll pretend you didn't say that, human. You should remember who you're talking to. Mermen have the ability to breathe underwater. While you humans are chained to the land, fate has ordained that we are superior. While your race is meant to be below us. If you sass me, that would be defying fate, wouldn't it? Zoro raised an eyebrow. This guy needed a reality check. Zoro decided to try out a new idea. One he'd gotten from Luffy. Zoro spoke. And when he did, the air seemed to drop a few dozen degrees, while a killing intent that rivaled Arlong's own when he became angered permeated the air. Do I look like I care about fate? Okay. So it needed to be perfected. But it carried the point. Zoro's piercing stare into Arlong's impassive eyes was broken by another kick by another random fishman. Arlong scoffed. You think that just because you've got that little parlor trick called hockey that you're better than me. We mermen are above such immaterial things. You'd do better to learn your place. Humans exist on a lower level than me and my kind. Get it through your head. Zoro coughed up a little blood, but otherwise seemed uncaring for his situation. He'd been strong before Luffy had taught him hockey. He wasn't powerless without it. He'd just have to wait for the opportune moment. A door behind Arlong opened, and a person walked out. A human, more specifically a woman. A short, red-headed woman. Zoro's eyes widened in surprise. Though that soon passed, he'd never really trusted her. After all, Nami regarded him with contempt. As she continued walking toward Arlong. You know I hate it when you go off on the human thing Arlong. Arlong grinned, surveying Nami as if she were some fabulous prize in his possession. You know that you're the exception to that rule, Nami. No one else on my crew is able to draw maps as detailed or as accurately as you can. Nami scoffed, still walking forward, in slightly different attire than Zoro had seen her wearing before. Of course none of your crew can. Our very brain compositions are different. Nami crouched down in front of the now scowling Zoro, her face in a contemptuous smirk, which oddly didn't seem right. What is it? Can't understand the situation through that thick skull of yours? Nami showed her left shoulder, which had always been covered by her shirt sleeve when she'd been on the crew. Makes sense now. She asked, as Zoro stared at the tattoo on her shoulder. It was an artistic representation of a swordfish, identical to the one on the pirate flag that hung at the top of Arlong Park. Zoro merely stared into her eyes. I'm not surprised. I never trusted you in the first place. Nami scowled. But once again it didn't seem natural, to Zoro. It appeared as if Nami was wearing a kind of mask, hiding her true emotions behind a wall of contempt and disregard. Then why did you come? The woman asked. As she stood up once more, Luffy told me to. He's the captain. After all, you know, he never stopped trusting you. Even when you stole the ship. Where's Thrasher? By the way, Nami paused for a moment, and the mask seemed to waver. But it solidified once again. That retard sea snake. He's with Arlong's animal trainer. Right now. And as to Luffy. He's an even bigger retard than his pet. I said from the start that I was only with you for the money. Arlong laughed boisterously at that statement. Slamming his hand down on the arm of his chair. This woman. She's a real witch. Isn't she? She abandoned her people. Even ignored her mother's death. All for the sake of money. Sha ha 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 ha. Nami's breath caught. And her mask completely disappeared. Revealing to Zoro's shame. Self-loathing. And an incredible sorrow. Zoro raised an eyebrow. While Nami recomposed herself. The woman looked down on him once more. You see? I was never a part of your crew. Now, why don't you just go back to your retard captain? Tell him to get a new pet. And go off to the Grand Line or whatever. Zoro chuckled to himself. Drawing confusion. He looked straight into Nami's eyes. His grayish white eyes making her feel very small and insignificant. Are you sure about that first part? With that, Zoro threw himself backward. He fell into the water and sank like a stone. Disappearing from view. A few minutes passed. Arlong's crew started remarking on what just happened. Some laughing at the man's idiocy in killing himself. Nami heard none of it. Her eyes locked on the bubbles that slowly dwindled off. Conscious thought left. The only thing in her head was, Baka. As she dived into the water. Intent on saving the drowning swordsman. Minutes later. Nami hauled him up. Gasping for air and from physical exertion. Unaware from the distrusting look she was getting from one of Arlong's lieutenants. Karubi. Nami yelled at Zoro in frustration. Baka. What the hell were you thinking? She cried. And all of a sudden she was back on the going merry. Yelling at Zoro over some random incident. Usopp yelling at them to calm down. Luffy laughing without a care in the world in the background. Nami tried to clear those thoughts from her head. She really didn't want to remember those times. Zoro smirked. Before looking at her with a knowing gaze. You can't even watch a single person die in front of you? Some witch. Nami was seized by an unholy anger. Just when things were working out. When Ten Long's years were starting to pay off. Luffy and his stupid crew had to come and ruin everything. Urasai. 
She screamed, delivering a hockey-powered bitch slap, knocking Zoro a few inches off the ground. Arlong whistled in admiration. You've gotten strong, Nami. Maybe these idiots managed to teach you something. E.H. Nami. Her face set in stone. Merely turned away. Lock him up. He's not important. As she passed Arlong, she whispered, the deal's still on, only seven million to go. Arlong nodded with an acquiescing air. As he signaled for two of his lackeys to throw the moss head in the prison. All this excitement has gotten me worked up. I think I'll go run some errands. With that, Arlong stood up, making to leave for Nami's hometown, Kokoyashi village. As the major players of Arlong's crew followed as an escort, Nami snuck into a certain room. Zoro waited in the cell, contemplating escape. Not really likely, given the circumstances. The door opened, and Nami stood in the doorway. Zoro regarded her levelly, noting the knife in her hand. She came forward, and brought the knife down. She turned to leave, talking over her shoulder when she paused in the doorway. Get out of here, she said, before leaving the prison, following after Arlong's entourage. In the cell, the newly liberated Zoro rubbed his arms to get the blood flowing. He surveyed the neatly cut ropes. He smirked to himself. Seems that Nami isn't as heartless as she's supposed to be. With that, Zoro decided to kill time by taking out the fishmen in the base. He grinned demonically, as he slowly removed Wado Ichimanji from its sheath. Usopp's eyes fluttered open. Where was he? He remembered abandoning Zoro, swimming to shore, finding an upside-down town, being attacked by a little kid. Usopp remembered. He'd made to protect a little boy and a young woman with blue hair and tattoos across her upper body from a merman. And then everything went black. He looked around panicky, fearing that he was in the merman's custody. Instead, he found he was in a simple cottage, with the boy and woman from before sitting down to the kitchen table for tea. The woman regarded him, an odd combination of relief and exasperation on her face. Oh, you're up. Be grateful you're here. If I hadn't knocked you out, you'd be dead. Usopp angered a bit at that. Oi, why the heck did you do that? Usopp regressed slightly with his next statement. I'm the great captain Usopp. I'm more than enough for one measly merman. The woman regarded him coldly, while the boy seemed to glare at him, as if Usopp were mocking him. The woman spoke, with the air of one speaking to a child. You're an idiot. No one can stand up to Arlong and his mermen. You saw Gosa village coming in. Didn't you? Arlong pulled that off single-handedly. That merman would have slaughtered you. While Usopp suddenly started exhibiting symptoms of, holy shat I almost got killed Osis and, I must not stay on this island or I'll die itis. The blue-haired woman turned to the kid. You're from Gosa. Aren't you? What were you doing there? The boy looked down. Arlong killed my father when he attacked our village. I can't just let that slide. So, I went off to Arlong Park to take revenge. But this witch stopped me. I went to Gosa after that, to take on the underlings. Usopp raised an eyebrow. This kid had more courage than he did. That wasn't saying much. But still, the woman had a different opinion. You're an idiot and a coward. That was your plan. To throw your life away needlessly? Your life has been saved twice now. By both me and the witch. Usopp was appalled at her callousness. And asked why she was going so hard on the kid. Life's harsh. Those who can't accept that are better off dead. She regarded the silently crying boy. And her gaze softened. Your mother must be worried sick. Go and take care of her. The boy's eyes widened. In his childish rage. He'd forgotten all about his mom. He got up. Thanked her for the tea. And left. Usopp watched him go. Realizing the whole thing had been a ploy to keep the kid from killing himself. He turned to the woman. You know. You're actually pretty nice. Even if you have tattoos. The only girl near Usopp's age that he'd met had been Kaya and so he came from an old school of thought when it came to women. She scoffed. That's a stereotype. Anyway, my name's Najiko. Care to explain why you're on an island under the rule of a tyrant? Usopp bit back the reflexive. I'm an awesome, benevolent captain, tirade. He could lie for fun and with strangers. But Usopp had respect for Luffy, as long as the idiot wasn't trying to kill him. He quickly laid out who he was, what the crew was doing, and the pursuit for Nami. Najiko raised an eyebrow, but nodded sadly. I see. So you're the ones she was talking about. At Usopp's confused expression, she elaborated. That which the kid was talking about was Nami. She's been working for Arlong for nigh on a decade. She betrayed her hometown and her family. All for the sake of money. Usopp's eyes widened in shock. I'm sorry about this. But Nami was never a part of your crew. She went with you for the loot. This is the house she grew up in. But she left it for Arlong's side. My little sister isn't who you think she is. Usopp exploded. That which we never suspected. She played us all for fools. How could she do something like that? Usopp dwindled down when the last statement registered. Little sister. You mean, you're related to her. Najiko sighed, before standing up and moving to pick up an old photo. It showed a toddler Nami and Najiko, crowding around a red-haired woman, 
We're not related by blood. But we might as well be. We were raised together. Orphans. By the same woman. She was our mother. Then. Arlong killed her. Usopp gaped in shock. This seemed to just add to the atrocities Nami had committed. Before Usopp could go off again. He heard a commotion in the distance. Najiko heard it too. Come. Let's see what's going on. The two exited the cottage. Which was surrounded by a tangerine orchard. And jogged the short distance to nearby Kokoyashi village. Usopp following Najiko. They came upon the buildings soon and hid in an alleyway. Usopp nearly went into apoplexy at the scene before him. A massive beast of a creature with unnatural skin and a shark's fin was holding a heavily scarred man by the throat. Other such fish-like creatures watching. TT that's Arlong. He's huge. Najiko paid him no mind. Watching attentively. In a very long, drawn-out way, Arlong proceeded to impress the reality of his rule and make a hypocrite of himself. He told the man in his arms, the unofficial leader of Kokoyashi by the name of Genzo, that the possession of weapons caused only chaos and death, as if he didn't cause enough of that himself, and that those who defied his rule had to die. Had he not destroyed Gosa for just that reason? Usopp stiffened. He turned that whole village upside down for just one person? Najiko nodded grimly. Since the start of his reign, Arlong has forced us to buy our own lives once a month. The amount is exorbitant for simple traders like us. If even one person falls behind on the tribute, that person and everyone in their village get slaughtered. The sight of the man that was like her father having the life crushed out of him proved too much for the woman. She stepped out of her hiding place to confront Arlong. Arlong, why do you have to kill him? Have we not loyally paid the tribute all these years? Arlong turned his gaze onto her. But the pride of Belmere ran as deep in Najiko as it did in Nami. She stood her ground. The other villagers emerged, showing their own agreement with Najiko. Genzo seemed terrified. But not for himself. You fools. We've worked too long for you to throw it all away. When Arlong arrived, we swore to fight a battle of attrition. For ten long years we've succeeded. Don't waste it on my death. It was soon obvious that his words had come too late. Arlong had a malicious glint in his eyes, staring at the mob like a shark surveying a school of fish. Genzo closed his eyes in defeat. The WTF factor just generated is equivalent to the one produced when Arlong's head was covered in an explosion. A loud, melodramatic voice filled with cowardice to the fourth power spoke from a nearby roof. The people in Kokoyashi watched in mixed awe and fear as the trembling Usopp made his quasi-heroic speech. Stop right there. You overgrown fish. I, the great Captain Usopp, with his eight, oh, oh, oh followers, will stop at nothing to free this island from your tyranny. Leave of your own accord. And I promise to go easy on you. The smoke cleared. To reveal an unscathed Arlong. The merman tossed Genzo aside. Before turning his attention to Usopp. Said Long Nose nearly had a heart attack. The shark man was giving him a look of such hatred, malice, and bloodlust that he made Zoro look like a fluffy bunny. Eight. Oh, oh, oh you say? I'll take them all on. Starting with you. In a flash, Arlong was flying at Usopp. He barely managed to jump out of the way. And just in time, the entire house Usopp had been standing on crumbled from the force of the impact. Usopp stood still. And the whole world seemed to hold its breath. He turned from the horde of mermen. To the upright Arlong. To the ruins of the building. His face remained neutral and calm as he starred off into the distance. Then. He turned and ran like a bat out of hell. Arlong's crew quickly restrained the man. Knowing that when their captain got angry. Fragile objects such as buildings tended to break. A contingent of mermen chased after Usopp. Who was crying theatrically and screaming his head off as he outraced his own sonic boom. The populace of Kokoyashi village stared in shock at the selfless sacrifice of Usopp in distracting the mermen. This was the scene Nami found as she arrived at her hometown. Zoro was at peace. There is nothing more relaxing than a good, heartless massacre. From his lofty perch, the author nearly had a stroke. I didn't write that. I whispered fearfully. So, you really think I care about the fourth dimension? Zoro asked the heavens. My eyes widened in fear. Before a sadistic grin marred my face. Causing my sister on the laptop beside me to cautiously edge away. So, that's the way you want to play it. Marimo? To quote Fuyutaro son. Don't fuck with the master. Zoro raised an eyebrow. Bring it. He challenged. Not fearing the omni-powerful creator of his universe. I rolled up my sleeves. Cracked my knuckles. And set my fingers to the keys like a pianist at Carnegie Hall. Giant space monkey. Zoro jumped out of his spot on Arlong's throne. Narrowly avoiding the ginormous. Green chimpanzee in a tin foil suit that crashed. Zoro. Unfortunately. Slid on the blood of the merman he had so casually murdered. Donalgram said let there be a brick wall. And there was. Zoro reached for his sword to slice it only for Kuina's treasured blade to turn into orchids. Zoro hit the wall, stared at the bouquet in his hands, before glaring at the sky. You're dead, he yelled, 
But it was futile. Taj Mahal. The tribute of Shah Jahan to his favorite wife appeared from nowhere above Zoro's head. Before being claimed by gravity. Crushing Arlong Park. The poor monkey. And the arrogant Merimo. And there was much rejoicing. I turned to face my online audience. Sorry about that. Folks. Let's get on with the FIC as it was properly meant. Zoro surveyed the corpses and nearly dead that once was Arlong's crew. Men. You guys barely made me break a sweat. For being all, above humans in every way. You sure didn't pose much of a fight. Zoro measured his own reserves. This injury's a pain. But that was surprisingly easy. Zoro was secretly pleased. If he was being honest with himself. He had become a bit spoiled on hockey. That's it. An extra representative of everything in my routine for forming a crutch. A plan to improve his training aside. Zoro was getting bored very quickly after his little fun. Lo and behold. A break in the monotony presented itself. Let it not be said that Donald Graham does not grant what his subjects request over a grudge against a previous incarnation. As if anyone would actually say that. But still. A loud, boisterous voice rose over the wall blocking the harbor. Drawing Zoro's attention. At the same time. Three separate fishing poles appeared. Oh. This one is strong. They have surely caught the greatest fish in all of East Blue. With that said. One of the poles pulled up a pair of shorts. Oh. It was me. Indeed. I am the greatest in all of East Blue. Intrigued by the odd voice. Zoro walked over and peered over the wall. He found one of the more interesting mermen he'd ever seen. The guy's skin was a dark pink or salmon if you prefer. He had six arms. Each of them with suckers. Though they seemed visceral. He wore a tight shirt and shorts in the prison stripe style. Except with yellow to replace the white. His mouth seemed to jut out of his face. Like evolution had intended to put a tentacle there and had changed its mind halfway. The tattoo of the sun present on all the mermen. For reasons unknown to Zoro. Was on his forehead. Perhaps the oddest part of his appearance was the half dozen spikes of white hair that made his head resemble a sea urchin. If vaguely. The man took notice of Zoro. Oh. Who are you? Are you a guest of Arlong Sama? Zoro looked from the octopus man to the abattoir that once was the Arlong Park courtyard. Zoro said he was a guest. The octopus man smiled. As if this were the best news. Great. What's your name? You want mine? It's Hatchin. I'm an octopus merman. Aren't I awesome? So saying. Hatchin started wiggling all six of his arms in a disturbing manner. Zoro thought to himself, what a strange guy. Hatchin halted his dancing. If you're looking for Arlong Sama, he went to Kokoyashi village. Want me to take you there? Zoro saw no problem with this. Hopping into the large pot floating nearby, Hatchin took hold and started his ferry service. Just as Zoro and Hatchin disappeared from sight, Arlong entered the courtyard. The bloodbath might have been a calming sight to Zoro, but to Arlong it was straight out of a nightmare. Through bloodied lips, the merman that Arlong questioned revealed that the human they had captured was, in fact, the infamous pirate hunter Zoro. Arlong froze. Even he had come to, if not fear, then become cautious of the extraordinary swordsman. To discover that the man ordered to retrieve Nami was Zoro. Well, that cast everything in a new light. The captain of the crew went from the reported idiot to a mysterious, powerful figure. The Sea King currently being, conditioned, by Kajiki wasn't retarded and brainwashed but the genuine article of Sea King. Kurubi. Though horrified had a look of smugness about him. Arlong Sama. I know that she is very useful. But Nami is a traitor. There's no way Zoro could have escaped without help. Arlong's eyes darkened. Knowing full well that such an act would be well within Nami's ability and conscience. A gasp from behind drew his attention. He found a gaping shoe. With the battered form of the human that had shot at him. Arlong grinned evilly. The human would provide the answers. This proved false. Because Usopp proved extremely unhelpful. The man answered their questions with obvious lies. Under the threat of violence. I. E. The removal of his nose. The coward only started lying even more. Following a twisted logic that stated that killing him would mean Zoro would definitely not return. Arlong was getting annoyed. He wanted vengeance. And this human wasn't helping. Hachin. Who had reappeared halfway through. Revealed he had just dropped Zoro off at Kokoyashi. Looking for Arlong. Usopp's blood turned to ice. Any bat squeak of a hope he'd had was destroyed by Zoro. Karma. Who would have figured... Kurubi once again tried to press the Nami, traitor theory. Only to be interrupted by the woman herself. Like a wrathful goddess. She stalked towards the crew. Her hockey unconsciously leaking. If not fully intimidating the mermen then at least alerting them to her anger. You insult me. Kurubi. She said. Walking towards Usopp. Whose final hopes that Nami was just faking withered and died. There was no sign of deception as she regarded Usopp with contempt. I've been with you for ten years. Loyally. And yet you question me at every opportunity. If I were going to just betray you, I would have long ago. Internally, Nami was both irked and worried. Zoro, you idiot. Look at the mess you made. Usopp, however, remained unaware of Nami's inner thoughts. 
his escape and survival the only thing on his mind. While the merman were distracted, he snuck something from his bag to his hand. Hasatsu. Kemari Boshi. Usopp yelled, detonating the smoke pellet. Like a bullet from a gun, Usopp made a break for the water. For a moment, he allowed himself to hope. Then, Nami appeared in front of him. As the smoke cleared, the skeptics of Arlong's crew were proved wrong. Nami had a dagger in her hand, plunged into the coward. I'll do anything, for my dream, she whispered, a sick desperation in her eyes and voice. Usopp start at the blood on his hands. Nami removed the dagger. Usopp stumbled forward a few steps in shock, before collapsing into the water. As the crew congratulated Nami and Karubi was forced to apologize, a horrified Johnny watched from a tree. He jumped down and ran for Zoro, with news of the depth of Nami's treachery. Zoro was berating himself. While I was killing time, Usopp was risking his life. Damn it. How can I be this pathetic? Zoro continued with his mad sprint for Arlong Park. When he became aware of an odd sound, it was like thunder. If thunder resembled the sound of breaking wood, Zoro turned to his left. A sneaking suspicion confirmed. Z O R R R R O O. Luffy screamed, waving from a ship that was defying all laws of sanity, sailing across the ground. Yosaku, the curly eyebrow cook, and the sickly looking guy from Barati were clinging to the boat for dear life. Just before the ship hit Zoro, one thought ran through his mind. The instant he turns his back, I am going to shove my sword right up his ass. Then, the wonders of momentum and inertia took hold, dragging Zoro for the ride. Before the boat impacted with a thick clump of trees, the world was nothing but chaos and pain. Slowly, leaking hockey and killing intent like a punctured tire, Zoro stood up among the wreckage. Luffy seemed right as rain, the cook straightening his tie beside him. Jin and Yosaku were still stuck to the ground. Yosaku wasn't a monster, and Jin simply wasn't as accustomed to raw craziness as Sanji was due to his years on the Barati. Zoro, what are you doing here? I told you to get Nami. The straw hat bastard had the audacity to talk down to him. Zoro dashed forward to slice the rubber man, only to have his blade blocked by a foot. Zoro turned his glare to Sanji, who merely shrugged. Luffy paid no heed to the attempt on his life, looking around with a look of childlike confusion. Where's Usopp? The boy asked, breaking Zoro out of his trance. He's dead. Johnny yelled, drawing the attention of the upright powerhouses, including Jin and Yosaku who just stood up. His statement caused all of them to freeze. Big Sis killed him. She's a witch. I've heard such terrible things. And they're all true. She betrayed us all. Even her own people. For money. She works at Arlong's right hand. She even killed Usopp Kun. Johnny reached them. Cheeks running down his cheeks. Zoro carefully concealed his feelings. Yosaku joined Johnny in crying. Jin was unreadable. And Sanji refused to even accept the possibility that Nami was evil. Luffy. On the other hand. A wave of hockey on a scale beyond anything they'd ever felt tore through the air. The trees were assailed by an invisible wind as everyone unfortunate to be within fifty yards felt as if they were being held in the fist of a deity beyond the scope of their understanding. A feeling of insignificance. Of standing up against. Taunting. A being of infinite strength and power. Of being crushed under the relentless. Calculating gaze of death itself. Washed over everything. Liar. Yelled Luffy. Who was not Luffy. Luffy was a lovable idiot. Who ate a lot and got impressed by the stupidest things. The creature in their midst wasn't human. No human could harness such power. Johnny and Yosaku. And to lesser extents Jin, Sanji, and Zoro. Knew. Knew in their lizard brain that cared only for survival. That the only reason they weren't obliterated was because this monster willed their survival. Johnny was blasted away by an invisible force. Thrown through the air with the force of a cannonball. The thing that caused Yosaku to soil his pants. With most of the crew right behind them. Was the knowledge that not Luffy had used no more energy than he would to flick a fly away. The mountain of spiritual weight disappeared. Yosaku, freed from the crushing presence of Luffy's hockey, fainted. Jin vomited. Sanji frantically grabbed for a cig, seeking refuge in nicotine. And Zoro broke out into a cold sweat. Luffy's face could have been carved from ice. He stretched out his hand, grabbing Johnny and dragging him over. The man was utterly destroyed. His sunglasses had atomized. His body had several odd lumps that simply weren't right. And his pants were stained with the discharge of his bowls. By some miracle. He was still breathing. Luffy regarded the man with stony eyes, which hid a seething anger. I would never have used my power like that unless you hadn't said such lies. Nami would never kill Usopp. Nami's eyes smiled when she was with us. She wasn't faking anything. We're Nakama. Nakama don't kill each other. As he ranted at Johnny's broken form, Zoro was taking the deepest breaths of his life to calm his racing heart, while Jin continued to cough up bile and Sanji dragged like his life depended on it. The king's disposition? Sure. If you mean king of the freaking universe. 
How the fucks can Luffy? Innocent. Stupid Luffy. Have this power? In that moment, any doubts Zoro had to Luffy's dream of being Pirate King were decimated. Someone with so much power who settled on such a trivial thing deserved nothing less. Luffy paused in his tirade at Johnny's unconscious body. He turned around. Nami was there. Right up the road. Staring at him with pure fear. Tears flowed freely down her cheeks. Her pupils contracted to pinpricks. She noticed Luffy's stare. And shivered. I I D didn't K K K kill H him. Luffy. I was A A acting. Nami stuttered out. She was terrified. The sheer power Luffy had just exhibited had destroyed all her perceptions of him. She had never truly understood Luffy until that moment. To live with that incredible energy every day, she couldn't imagine it. Before then, Nami had seen hockey as a tool. Now, after seeing its true face in Luffy, she saw it as a curse. There was a reason so few could harness hockey, and even fewer the Hawashoku. If everyone could use it, the world would be torn apart. Luffy had to restrain himself every second of the day, hide behind a mask of naivety and stupidity, so that he didn't accidentally do to those around him what he'd just done to Johnny. He had taught them how to play with fire. But he'd let them see what happens when you weren't careful on their own. Nami felt something shift inside her. Luffy had been touched by this power since he was a child. And yet here he was. He hadn't gone off to conquer the world. As he could do. She had no doubt. Instead, he'd stuck to his childhood dream. And concerned himself with nothing more than making friends and having fun. He believed in his Nakama so strongly. He would unleash the monster within to refute any claims against them. The fact that Luffy had just done what he'd done to Johnny. Just because he'd listed all the evils she'd been forced to do. Stunned her. She was filled in equal parts fear, awe, and some feeling she could not name. It was like discovering the person she married was a god. She was amazed. But utterly terrified of what he could do to those that tried to hurt them. When Luffy had looked into her eyes, everything she had worked for the last ten years paled into significance. All that mattered was comforting him. Assuring him that everything he'd done for her wasn't in vain. That he wasn't an irredeemable villain for protecting her. At the same time, her survival instincts screamed at her she was being foolish, that this demon and human skin was dangerous and she should be running very far very fast in the other direction. The conflict left her weak at the knees. When Luffy nodded, as if what she just said was the obvious truth, a dam behind her broke. She found herself telling him about everything that had happened to her. Belmere. Saving Kokoyashi. Everything. She showed him her bandaged hand, where she'd stabbed Usopp. To confirm his survival. She couldn't say why she did it. It could have been to prove she hadn't betrayed him or it could have been to calm him down so he didn't destroy her. Her sudden, inexplicable sense of debt to him warred with her lizard brain as her life story tumbled past her lips. When she finished, Luffy continued to stare at her. Just as she started to feel like she was drowning in the warm, bottomless depths of his eyes, she was saved by the pervert. Nami Swan is so beautiful and awesome for doing such selfless things. Sanji screamed for the world to hear. His legs wiggling and a giant heart replacing his visible eye. Zoro remained neutral still not ready to trust her. While Jin seemed genuinely impressed by the burden she'd borne all these years, Yusaku, like his partner, was still out of commission. At that moment, Yusop appeared, shouting, Guys, she didn't kill me. She, he stopped when he saw Nami there. Luffy turned to face his marksman, and suddenly his smile was there. Like the sun, all their worries and fears seemed to evaporate in the light of Luffy's carefree smile. It was all the more striking to the crew, since they now knew of the darkness that lurked behind that grin. Usopp. Nami's still our Nakama. Isn't that great? The haze that seemed to surround the scene, after all the incredible circumstances that led up to it, was broken by the appearance of Nami's sister. She seemed surprised to see Nami with her crew. Her Nakama. But she continued to hail her regardless. This was urgent. Nami. The marines are here. But they're not going to Arlong Park. They're headed towards the orchard. Nami froze, as the puzzle solved itself in her head. With Arlong suddenly on the wayside in her thoughts. She realized what an idiot she'd been. Arlong would never let her go. And she already knew he bribed the marines. He had sent the marines to steal her money. It rang true so thoroughly that it was the only explanation. She turned to face her Nakama. Feeling at home with Luffy's grin. Zoro's bored expression. Usopp's obvious fear. Even Sanji's heart eyes and Jin's quiet expression. These were her friends. And they would help her with anything. Nami asked them, feel like kicking some marine butt? She needn't have asked. Even Usopp was agreeing in his own way. Nami turned and ran for her treasure. Her Nakama behind her. Zoro and Luffy unhindered by the fact they were carrying Johnny and Yosaku. Apart from a brief stop at the doctors where they dropped off the bounty hunting pair. The Straw Hat crew. Now reunited. Did not pause as they made for Belmere's orchard. When they arrived. They found Genzo watching incredulously as the marines tore apart the orchard looking for Nami's treasure. Overseen by the rat-like. Both figuratively and literally. Captain Nazumi. Said corrupt bastard was yelling at his men. 
Come on. Find it. It's a hundred million after all. That was the last thing he said to his crew. As Nami smashed her staff into the back of his head. She was still a bit shaken up by Luffy's display. So she restrained her hockey. All the same. The man collapsed. In the time it took Nami to fell one. The monster three aka Luffy. Zoro. And Sanji had taken down ten apiece. Jin joined the fun too. Tackling the fringes while Usopp. His cowardice temporarily forgotten in battle fever. Picked off those who were running away. In the space of a minute. The entirety of the 16th branch was out cold. Genzo watched in shock. Nami. Who are these people? He asked. Amazed by the show of strength. Nami grinned. Wider than she had in years. Before saying, my Nakama. With pride. The redhead then turned. Making her way for Kokoyashi. Her crew. As well as Genzo and Najiko. Followed behind her. She reached the town square before raising her voice to call her people to arms. Everyone, for these past ten years, I've never betrayed you. I made a deal with Arlong to buy this village and free us all. But he has just tried to sabotage it. He sent his marine puppets to steal the money I have saved for you this long, hard decade. We can't let him get away with this. The villagers were stunned. They hadn't seen such fire in Nami since Belmere died. Suddenly, a calm, peaceful grin enveloped Nami's face. People of Kokoyashi, will you come die with me? She asked. They knew what she was asking. An attack on Arlong. To finally exact revenge. It was suicidal. Of course. Was the unanimous cry. Nami grinned as her people gathered what weapons they could. She turned to face the road to Arlong Park. Her people behind her. Her Nakama standing beside her. On an impulse. She gripped Luffy's hand with her own. The captain raised an eyebrow. And Sanji started crying. But no one else reacted. Holding her staff in the air. She yelled, charge. They moved forward. An unstoppable tide. A timeless symbol of the oppressed rebelling. They slowed only when they reached the gates. The crowd from Kokoyashi agreed to hang back. As the Straw Hat crew prepared for their toughest fight yet. Luffy cracked his knuckles. Nami twirled her staff. Zoro gripped his two new blades. Borrowed off Johnny and Yosaku. Sanji stretched his legs. Jin twirled his tonfa. And Usopp. Albeit nervously. Put on his goggles. Finally. They were ready. Allow me. Luffy said. Before stepping forward, he faced the foot-thick steel gates. Before pulling back his right fist, his hockey a visible outline. The future pirate king threw the punch. The gates exploded, crumbling even as they were blown off their hinges. Luffy regarded the sea of recovered merman in front of him. Which ones are long? Which ones are long? Shock. That was the only thing going through anyone's head when Luffy made his entrance. The people of Kokoyashi could attest to the strength of merman. From bitter experience. A healthy male merman could crush rocks in his hands with minimal difficulties. Arlong was a monster among monsters. Being able to lift whole buildings and shoe concrete. Nonetheless, the United Villagers could only stop and stare as they watched the foot-thick steel walls of Arlong Park fly off their hinges, crumbling into balls as they went through the air, all from a single punch from a lanky teenager. Said teenager had an oddly calm look on his face. He had a goal, and he was going to get it. People tend to forget the benefits of being simple-minded. You never bother to complicate things. Arlong had hurt his crew. Arlong had made Nami suffer. Come hell or high water. Luffy was going to fix those problems. He strode forward. Cracking his knuckles without saying a word. He also made sure to keep a calm head. It had been said countless times. But it must be repeated. Hockey was dangerous. Luffy could still recall the days of his childhood. When the world was smaller and life much simpler. Hockey had been a toy. A cool thing only he could do. Luffy had. With childish abandon. Explored his new power marveling over every little detail. Then, the wonder gradually was worn away. To have caution and fears take its place. It had started when he and Ace, his brother in all but blood, had been roughhousing and Luffy just couldn't seem to win. In a fit of jealous rage, Luffy had used every single drag of hockey that he could muster at once. His young mind concerned only with wiping the victorious smirk off Ace's face. The pirate king's son was sent to the hospital in a coma with every bone in his body broken. As if some angry god had crushed him in its fist. Luffy could still feel the numb shock he'd experienced as he sat by Ace's bedside, watching him sleep the rest of the dead while all but mummified by bandages and casts. It had been too much. Too big slices of harsh reality for his mind to even fumble for, let alone grasp. Hockey was supposed to be all fun. His little trick. It wasn't supposed to hurt people. It wasn't supposed to hurt Ace. Luffy had spent months despondent. Barely speaking. His mind trapped in a never-ending downward spiral that centered on the terrible, inescapable truth that he had killed Ace. When Ace woke up, Luffy had hugged him so hard that he almost crushed his ribcage all over again. From that day forward, Luffy was changed. One fundamental part of his being gone forever. His innocence. Luffy trained harder. Spent more time learning his hockey. 
made jokes and acted like an idiot for his friends. But gone was the childish belief that everything would work out fine. Luffy had caught his first glimpse of the real world that day with Ace. And it had set in a domino effect that had led to Luffy today. Idiotic. But not dumb. Strong. But not arrogant. Vengeful. But not judgmental. Luffy knew he had power. And he took pains to control that power. He made sure that he would never, ever fall down that bottomless ledge he had towed when he'd lost his temper with Ace. In a snap. Luffy was back in the present. That was why he would use his fists to kill Arlong. A duel had honor. A duel was fair. Using hockey wouldn't make this a fight. It would make it an execution. So, even though some dark part of his soul was screaming at him to annihilate his enemies, Luffy did nothing more than crack his knuckles. Arlong himself was observing Luffy with disbelief. It just didn't match up in his head. There was no way this kid was just walking into a base full of mermen. While ruining their front door. No one was that idiotic. Suicidal. Possibly. But Arlong could tell by the simmering fire in this kid's eyes that he wasn't intending on abandoning his life anytime soon. So, assuming he wasn't suicidal or a retard, and drawing the conclusion left by the crumbled gates, this kid honestly believed he could take on Arlong and his crew. The idea was so inconceivable that Arlong simply refused to accept it. Arlong. That would be my name. And who would you be? The shark man asked. Answering the question. Luffy's eyes locked on his. And he adjusted his course to walk towards the throne Arlong was sitting in. I'm Luffy. A pirate. Luffy answered. Slowly gathering his energies even as he engaged in the almost obligatory banter. Once Luffy got within a certain distance of Arlong. Who was regarding him like he was an odd amusement. Two mermen blocked his path. Oi. Mister. You can't just walk in here. One of them said. Literally looking down on Luffy. Though you could tell he was a bit nervous. Luffy was already emitting his intimidation vibes from how much anger fueled hockey he was holding back. The merman's fellow was of a similar type. What business does some random pirate have with Arlong Sama? Huh? He asked. Luffy did not as much as look at them. He merely grabbed their heads in his hands, and brought them together hard enough for the sound of cracking bone to be heard. Arlong's eyes widened as he watched his two Nakama collapse in a heap. Nami would savor the next few moments for the rest of her life. When her world was imploding and life seemed out to get her, she would recall this moment in time, and have a little laugh, as Luffy cocked his fist. Nami spoke, her voice reverberating across the shocked and silent courtyard. Arlong, I'd like you to meet my captain. Luffy then punched Arlong so hard that he literally flew horizontally into the wall 20 meters away, reducing a portion of the wall to rubble. The looks of shock, surprise, and just a smattering of fear on the crew's faces were infinitely satisfying to Nami. As the dust cloud cleared, revealing a shaken but otherwise fine Arlong, Luffy spoke, his words laced with an otherworldly rage. You hurt my Nakama. You used her and made her miserable. Luffy raised his head, and unleashed a relatively mild wave of hockey, while he intoned, you, will, pay. Death himself would have been less intimidating than Luffy in that one moment. Oi. Luffy. Quit being so melodramatic. We're pirates. Not actors. Or dumb liars for that matter. Zoro grumbled. Appearing at his captain's side. Freaking out the audience even more with his speed. Usopp spoke up from his spot near the wall. Actually having a legitimate excuse for hanging back due to his focus on ranged attacks. That hurts. Zoro. That hurt me real deep. Zoro glared with annoyance at the marksman. You'll get over it. He retorted causing Usopp to cry animate tears of underappreciation. The merman, who so far had been watching the events like it was some terribly engaging soap opera, seemed to have a collective, light bulb, moment. How dare you hurt Arlong Sama? They yelled, rushing towards the nonchalant captain and first mate. Just when they were about to hit, they were all shot out of the air by an incredible barrage of kicks. You weaklings stay out of the way, Sanji said, straightening his tie. Jin strode forward then, twirling his tonfa in boredom. Not that I don't appreciate a good macho standoff. But what was with that solo walk in here? We wouldn't want you hogging all the prey. Now would we? Luffy just shrugged. I'm captain. I get to go first. Whereas before the veteran members of the crew would have simply humored Luffy. Now they merely acquiesced. Luffy had given them a taste of how strong he truly was. And the awe and fear that had inspired was still there. Not yet faded into the background of crew life. Najiko chose that time to snap. Seeing only the surface with no idea of the multiple layers underneath. What the hell is with these guys? They just attacked Arlong and his crew. And they're acting like this is just some kind of game. Nami. Are these guys serious? Nami regarded her adoptive sister. And gave an amused chuckle. Najiko. The first thing you need to understand about my crew. We are all fun-loving idiots. Who just happen to be insanely strong in our given fields. I'd be worried if they weren't acting like a bunch of kids. It's annoying. But it works. That being said just sits back and enjoys the show. Nami and Usopp were really the support types. Hardly needed but they're just in case. The remaining mermen, who had also been brain dead up to this point, 
spontaneously recovered their intelligence. Hachin pointed at Zoro. Ah! Oh, there he is the mystery swordsman. He rode me. I mean, I gave him a ride. Unaware of the embarrassing connotations his words had, Hachin proceeded to notice Yusa. Ah! Oh, what's with that long nose? He's still alive. But Nami killed him. Hachin then paused, finally seeming to notice the mob just outside the gates, seriously. It amazed me to no end that they didn't notice until Chu was chasing Yusa. Um. Why is Nami-san here with an angry mob behind her? The octopus asked dumbly, apparently unable to deal with all this new information and still speak intelligently. Karubi snarled, glaring at Nami with loathing and contempt. I knew it. So, you really are a traitor. Nami. What Nami did next almost gave the Kokoyashi villagers, and Yusop, heart attacks. She pulled her eyelid down, while sticking out her tongue. Yep, I decided to stab you guys in the back. Got a problem with that? Karubi seemed shocked into silence while Luffy's respiratory system started to collapse as he gave into extreme levels of laughter. Sanji, of course, went into heart mode, while Jin and Zoro both held smiles of varying amusement. Nami herself had never had this much fun. The scene was broken by the arrival of two monsters of the deep. Out of nowhere, Thrasher and the sea cow Luffy had run into Rose up from the sea. Standing on top of the cow's head was a brand new merman no one had seen yet, whereas Arlong seemed to be vaguely related to a swordfish. This guy was obviously a purebred while still being ridiculously tall compared to a human. This merman lacked the general bulk of the rest of the crew, being very streamlined. His nose was also a good foot long, and ended in a needle-sharp point. His skin was silvery, and he lacked any hair. The man, oblivious to his surroundings, shouted out in a very Usopp-esque manner, Arlong Sama, I'm back with that sea king you gave me. Man, he was a tough one, but I, Kajiki the sea beast tamer, have once again proven victorious. This thing will hop when you say hop. What should we not name? What in the name of Poseidon has happened here? Kajiki had just taken notice of the chaos of Arlong Park, unaware that he had unknowingly just signed his death warrant. Luffy was seeing red. Something was wrong with Thrasher. The giant serpent was looking at Luffy like he was a dumb animal. This guy had messed with his pet. There would be no innocence. Excuse me, Luffy said, freaking out everyone there, particularly the straw hats. They could practically smell the hockey Luffy was holding back at that moment. Thrasher and I have some issues to work out. With that, Luffy launched himself through the air towards Kajiki. Said idiot squealed like a little girl, sufficiently freaked out by this new enemy. Before hopping off the sea cow's head and landing on Thrasher's, get me out of here. Kajiki yelled at Thrasher, who complied in a mechanical manner. Luffy landed on the sea cow, who was appropriately scared shitless by the level of hockey that Luffy was now unconsciously unleashing. Follow them, he commanded, and the cow swam after the fleeing Kajiki like his big life depended on it. The giant mammal could feel the hockey on an instinctual level that beings up the cognitive ladder could not reach, and was in a way even more afraid than the humans and mermen witnessing the event. And it was that very fear that led Momoo, the loyal pet of Arlong, to forget all his training and carry Luffy after Kajiki. The straw hat crew, left on the shore against Arlong's crew, was broken from their brief shock by the sound of Karubi's voice. Well, it seems like it's time that we fight back. You hang back Arlong-sama. Arlong Park would surely crumble were you to fight now. The crew watched as Arlong's lieutenants started to prepare for battle, while about a third of the mermen crew that was still conscious gathered behind them, Arlong watching it all with a calm arrogance, seemingly unfazed by Luffy's punch. Sanji spoke, claiming his own kill for himself. I'll take that big one, he'll pay for insulting Nami-san. Zoro shrugged, before drawing his blades and trying to ignore his injury. Fine with me, I want that octopus. Jin shrugged, swinging his tonfa to build up momentum. I'm fine with the small fry that leaves the weirdo with the lips to nose San and the lady. So saying, each opponent stared each other down, though Usopp was quite obviously shaking in his boots. Then, by some unseen signal, the two crews attacked, and thus the Straw Hat crew got their first taste of the Grand Line's power. Nami and Usopp, in what was quickly becoming routine, were teaming up. Their opponent was Chu, Arlong's marksman. Thankfully, the villagers of Kokoyashi had realized that they really were just there as witnesses, and that they wouldn't actually be doing any fighting. And so, they had broken into two groups and moved to the side of the road, giving Nami and Usopp room to maneuver. Nami, who in all honesty was a tad high on endorphins and wasn't entirely there, was warming up with her staff, while Usopp was trying to reduce his shakes to at least the level needed to shoot straight. Chu regarded them with obvious contempt. You really disappoint me, Nami-san. You know better than any human here the invincibility of the mermen. Arlong-sama favors you. You could have had anything you'd ever wanted. Clothing. Jewelry libraries of rare maps. Instead, you betray us and align yourself with this no-name crew. Not only that, you provoked rebellion among the villagers of Kokoyashi, 
You're defying nature by standing up like this. Nami glared at Shu. Years of pent-up anger and hatred mingling with her hockey as it came out of her infrequent pulses. Like some ethereal heartbeat. The air around her became loaded with her inner feelings. Making those around her feel like they were breathing the fumes off an enraged beast. Shu appeared unimpressed. The people of Kokoyashi watched Nami in fear and awe. While Usopp barely even noticed. This being an almost daily occurrence on the ship. Nami glared Shu in the eye. I couldn't care less about nature or whatever. My Nakama have shown me how to be strong. Get this through your head. You. Are. Going. Down. Usopp glanced at Nami from the corner of his eye. Oi. Nami. Aren't you laying it on a little thick? This guy's a merman. And we're still the weakest on the crew. Even compared to the new guys. Nami's response was to shrug. Yeah. But our crew is so strong it's stupid. The two of us are enough to take on this guy. He's the weakest out of Arlong's lieutenants for a reason. This seemed to light a fire under Chu's anger. He started cracking his neck. Preparing himself for his water attacks. Nami settled into her stance. While Usopp. Giving into the inevitable. Pulled back his slingshot in preparation for the first shot. Jen watched with bated breath. Nami. You have found some powerful Nakama. And this new power of yours are frightening. But, Jen turned his gaze to Chu. Arlong's third mate. Whose powerful water blasts had leveled the forest that once occupied the space of Arlong Park. Is it enough for you to take on this enemy? Jen's thoughts were mirrored in Najiko's. Who was watching Nami with fear in her heart. The tattooed blue net had comforted Nami during the long decade she had spent honing her thievery skills. The sister she had held was a stubborn yet miserable girl in way over her head. Standing in front of Najiko was a proud, confident woman who wasn't going to take any bullshit whatsoever. Najiko just couldn't wrap her head around this, new, Nami. And so was even more afraid than she would normally have been. Her fear of Nami coming to harm joined by her fear of Nami. Period. Nami, quasi surprisingly, made the first move. She dashed forward, already swinging her staff to build momentum. As Chu's mouth started to swell, Nami smirked and murmured to herself, large blast. Twelve o'clock. Right on cue. A large ball of water came straight at Nami, who was already dodging. Block. High kick. Nami continued in a smug tone, speaking just before Chu brought up his arms to block her staff. Nami then threw herself to the left, dodging the kick Chu had aimed at her chest. Before Chu could react, Nami ducked, allowing Usopp's well-aimed shot to impact Chu's right eye. Chu clutched his eye in agony. Though he remarkably stayed silent, Chu was glaring at Nami, who appeared cool as a cucumber. What dirty trick are you using? Human? The archerfish merman asked hotly, assuming Nami was cheating in some way. Nami grinned like a pleased cat, unknowingly heralding her future nickname. What's the matter? Chu. Surely the superiority of merman would trump my little psychic thing? I mean... You should be so awesome and invincible that my knowing what you're doing before you do shouldn't matter. All of this was said in a sarcastic tone that even Luffy would notice. Chu growled as only those deeply connected with nature could. A predator's snarl that normal humans simply could not recreate. Enraged. Chu took the special canteen he always carried and filled his mouth to bursting. Nami watched. The playful glee leaving her expression as she got serious. This could hurt. Usopp. I'd suggest you move a few steps to your left. The marksman. Having seen time and again on the ship Nami's ability. Knew that he should follow the order. As Usopp got out of dodge, Nami calmed her breathing, tensing her body to avoid the attack to come. The canteen was a black market device based off one of marine science captain Vegapunk's vaguer ideas. In layman's terms, the bottle was about ten times bigger on the inside than the outside. Chu drained it dry, his body expanding like a balloon from so much water. Nami was surprised Chu was using this so soon, since it was his strongest attack and a major make-it-or-break-it tactic. Chu must have been confident it would take her out, the confidence was deserved. Nami wasn't sure she could make it. Well, too late to back out now. Gathering her courage. Nami yelled, bring it on. You bottom feeder. Chu's eyes flashed in anger. That was a serious merman insult. Hundred shot water gun. Chu proclaimed. Before expelling all his water in the form of rapid fire water bullets. Having ensured Usopp's safety by keeping the attention on herself. Nami could only hope to dodge. And so, Nami began her desperate dance. Knowing when and where the shots were coming was a major advantage. But Nami wasn't some dancer or speed freak. She avoided each shot by the skin of her teeth. If she'd been alone, she'd have been screwed. As it was, Nami only risked death for eight seconds. A bottle of liquor was thrown from Usopp's hand straight for Chu's death. With the ease of born talent, Usopp lined up his shot even as Chu was turning to face the projectile. Eat this, Kayaku Boshi. The gunpowder pellet flew through the air, piercing the bottle just as it came within range of Chu's face. The powder ignited. Its explosive force tripled by the accelerant that was the alcohol. Usopp's unconventional Molotov cocktail coated Chu in liquid fire. Nami watched with cold eyes as Chu started screaming in pain. His sensitive merman skin going up like a torch. 
sweating from her brief but intense exertion of dodging. Nami gathered herself before dashing forward. Her staff was soon stuffed with hockey as Nami brought the weapon around like a baseball bat. This is for Kokoyashi. Nami's vengeance. With that, Nami's staff squarely hit Chu's face, sending his body twirling through the air from the force behind the blow. He landed in the courtyard pool. When he resurfaced, it was his back that floated up. Nami stood frozen, before the toll of the battle caught up with her, trembling with the aftereffects of adrenaline. Nami fell to the ground, barely managing to remain dignified and do so like a lady. Usopp came forward and laid a supporting hand on the navigator's shoulder. Nami looked up at Usopp, before laughing in relief. She'd finally done it. She'd gotten back at Arlong's crew, even if it was only at a lieutenant. Nami faced the battles in the courtyard, the last vestiges of her old life falling away, like a butterfly breaking free from its cocoon. Jin was definitely having trouble. The policy of the Krieg pirates had generally been throwing a bunch of numbers at a crowd and hoping for the best. Only Krieg had possessed the necessary firepower to take on multiple opponents. Jin's focus had been the heartless slaughter of the stronger pirates one at a time. However, he was currently surrounded by a bunch of opponents stronger than any man he'd ever faced. Hindsight was an absolute bitch. Look on the bright side. The ex-commander thought to himself bitterly. I'm learning how to fight off crowds. I'd just like it more if it wasn't in a do-or-die situation. While Jin was certainly out of his element, he was still putting up a decent fight. And, hey, his job was to distract the grunts while all the heavy hitters were being taken out. Jin wasn't going to allow himself to fail at his first real job on his new crew. Out of the corner of his eye, Jin watched the battles that Sanji and Zoro were going through. Zoro looked like he'd gotten the short end of the stick. His opponent insisted on ridiculous tactics that did nothing more than waste Zoro's energy. Considering how much of that was being leached by his barely healed wound, that wasn't a good thing. However, Jin knew better than to help the ailing swordsman. If there was one thing Mahawk's duel had taught Jin about Zoro, it was the man's sense of pride. He'd take any assistance as the greatest insult one could give. Sanji, on the other hand, was toying with his opponent. The two were of equal strength, but Sanji was infinitely more flexible as well as quicker. The smoking chef was engaged in a virtual dance of dodges and counters, his extraordinary kicks hitting the merman in a deadly barrage of combos. Before Jin's eyes, the blonde ducked under yet another of the lieutenant's otherwise formidable punches. The manta ray merman had overextended, and Sanji capitalized on it. Coming up from the merman's blind side, Sanji screamed, Mouton shot, as he delivered an almighty kick to his enemy's side, sending him careening through the walls of Arlong Park before he landed on the other side. Jin sensed hockey in the kick, and for a brief moment felt pity for Kurubi. Agony, wouldn't come close to describing the pain he must be feeling. As if Sanji's victory was some sort of signal, Zoro's fight became much more intense. Zoro charged forward towards Hachin, suddenly coated in a hazy outline. The octopus, unaware of the fact that Zoro had taken the fight up a notch, merely grinned cheekily as he waved his six swords with moderate skill. When will you realize? Roranoa-chan? I am a merman. And you're a human. I can wield six swords to your three. There is no way you can win. So saying, Hachin chose to end the fight and swung all of his swords in broad arcs that would slice Zoro to ribbons. Zoro glared at Hachin. Before he vanished before the fellow swordsman's eyes, the merman's blades passing through thin air, Hachin blinked. Before he started looking around wildly for his opponent. There's something you don't understand. Zoro whispered into Hachin's ear, his voice as cold, harsh and unforgiving as the heart of winter. The octopus gasped, and futilely tried to turn around to face his enemy. Zoro continued his face devoid of all emotion except for a blank, single-minded focus. The Rokutoryu user was nothing more than an obstacle, an impediment to be removed. There is a world's difference between wielding three swords, and using Santoryu, Akuma Tatsumaki. With that, Zoro concentrated all his energies into his core, and unleashed them in a torrent as he spun on the spot, his sword's tools to bend nature to his whims as they stirred the air, gathering it into a whirlwind of slicing wind. An opaque wall of hurricane force winds swept Hatchin off his feet and swung him into the air remorselessly, wounds opening across the merman's body as if he were being tortured by invisible demons. And all the while, Zoro stood in the center of the gale, the shadow of the wind and the distortion of the hockey serving to twist his outline into that of a monstrous creature. The demon had shown his true colors and delivered wrath upon his enemies. The wind dissipated, and a full second later Hatchin landed on the ground. A spider web of cracks, originating from the point of impact, appeared in the concrete. The octopus was a mess, looking as if he'd been thrown into the shredder. Cuts of all sizes, depths, and raggedness covered his body, making him look more like a bloody carcass than a merman. In some divine symmetry, the merman's swords all fell near his hands, burying themselves into the ground. Any closer and the octopus would have been crucified. Zoro didn't exactly fall limp to the ground but he came close, his swords clattering to the ground. The moss head took a well-deserved rest, 
Jin was fine with that. His problem was solved. The fringes of Zoro's mini cyclone had taken out a good chunk of the grunts with debilitating slashes. The remainder left had been so demoralized that they barely put up a defense to Jin's crushing blows. In short order, the common pillagers of Arlong's crew had fallen to the cannonball Tonfa. Jin surveyed his handiwork, grinning to himself. Damn. I'm good. Sanji took a drag from his cigarette, acting as if taking down pirates was a daily occurrence for him. It wasn't an act though. It was the truth. Tempting lung cancer. The cook turned to face Zoro. Wow. You look beat. It's not like you had a tough guy to fight. Is the demon out of shape? Zoro delivered his best death glare. The one where his pupils disappeared and his smoky irises were brought into full focus. You're one to talk. Arrow cook. It took you how long to take down that muscle head? Were you too busy trying to ogle the navigator? Sanji took the jab good-naturedly. I. E. He bonked Zoro on the head with a boot. Zoro growled, but didn't feel the need to waste his energy seeking payback. This friendly, by their standards, exchange would have continued. Had not a bone-chilling growl swept through them. Looking up, the three pirates found themselves facing the enraged face of Sawtooth Arlong. His eyes were filled with a mix of fiery anger tempestuous remorse and cold hatred that all mixed together into the most frightening thing the Straw Hats had seen, surpassing even Luffy's transformation. Arlong had murder in his eyes, and the three battle-weary warriors were in his sights. There is an infinite string of connections and bonds, both physical and spiritual, which intertwine all that is, was, and will be. All of these bonds can be broken, rearranged, and in some cases change. The only thing needed is energy. The only form of energy in existence that could affect both types of bonds was hockey the energy of a person's soul given physical presence by the intensity of human will and emotion. In theory, a skilled enough user of hockey could become a god, rearranging everything around him with the force of his power. Not that Luffy had any idea about the fine mechanics behind all this. He just knew that he hockey could hit from a distance. The two pirates had been engaged in a constant chase of cat and mouse. Their mounts either too brainwashed or too afraid to complain about the harsh exertion. Luffy held the advantage in that a glancing blow from him would ensure the merman's defeat. Said merman. However, could breathe underwater. Which was the one place Luffy couldn't go. However, what the merman had certainly not counted on was the sonar-like pulses of hockey that Luffy constantly let loose from his nigh-limitless stores of energy. Hockey, like sound and kinetic force, moved differently in water. In this case, it was condensed. If Luffy expelled a one-second burst of moderate force, when it hit Kajiki it was a blow from a tank shell that lasted an instant. Kajiki would run away as far as he could while withstanding these attacks, before surfacing and running away once again and all the while, the hockey wore away at the mental walls that Kajiki had instilled in Thrasher, gradually bringing back our favorite background character to his senses. Give me a damn break. Kajiki roared in mild desperation, his odds becoming increasingly bleak as the straw hat captain refused to stop chasing him. What is your problem? It's just a dumb animal. Anger and frustration had robbed Kajiki of his common sense. Apparently, no sane creature would dare risk antagonizing Luffy when he was already out for blood. Kajiki realized his brief lapse, but by then it was too late. Luffy was almost foaming at the mouth. His self-control, severely tried by the sight of his converted pet, broke. Whatever mercy that calm Luffy might have held disappeared as angry Luffy decided that it was time to end this. Cocking back a palm. Luffy stared with dead eyes into Kajiki's, who had turned to survey the boy's reaction, only to see his approaching doom. You will never touch my friends again. Royal strike. With that, Luffy threw a palm strike straight at Kajiki. Instead of stretching his hand, he merely let his compacted, fully focused hockey fly. Kajiki didn't even get the chance to scream as the raw force of an atomic bomb collided with his chest, reducing his ribs to dust and collapsing his internal organs right before he was thrown at speeds that broke the sound barrier through the air. He landed twenty clicks away, the water around him becoming stained a cloudy pink. Luffy stared at his palm, unaware of the fact that Momu had finally succumbed and fallen unconscious. Some small part of Luffy took a dark joy in what he'd just done in metting out retribution to his enemies in the most violent way possible. The rest of Luffy was filled with self-loathing terror. As Luffy steadily sank closer to sea level, his thoughts whirled like an over-caffeinated hamster on his wheel, whirling frantically, getting nowhere. Gods! What am I? How can I hold this kind of power and not be some hideous monster? Maybe I am. I'm a freak of nature as it is. I'm not human anymore. I'm made from rubber. How is that in any way human? And the killing? How can it be so easy? Shouldn't it be a little harder to end a life? Maybe it's just because I'm good at it. Which means I am a monster. Luffy's feet touched the water. But our hero didn't even notice the sudden leeching of his strength. Too preoccupied with his self-destructive thoughts. How can I face my crew now? They've seen me now. Seen what I'm keeping under this mask. How could they still see me as a Nakama? No. They can't. No one loves a monster. The minute I return. 
They'll start hating me. Yusuf. He gave up everything for me. How can he not hate me? Zoro? He sees everything as a threat. I'm not sure I could take him looking at me like that. And Nami. Luffy felt a deep ache in his chest as he thought of the red-headed navigator. He had no idea what his confused feelings for her meant. All he knew was that picturing her disgusted expression when she saw him, her words as she denounced him for the vile creature he was, felt like a knife in his heart. It was incredible how much one death could affect our happy-go-lucky captain. But death is never a good thing. Even when it's done for noble or necessary reasons, it does nothing but hurt those left behind. Life, the purest thing there was, wasn't meant to be ended prematurely. The act of taking another's life, of murder, left a vacuum in the natural order of things. A vacuum that sucked up every good or happy feeling it could find. Should a tyrant be put down, those loyal to him will still grieve. Should a thief be hanged, his family will feel the loss. Even those twisted souls that had nothing and meant nothing to anyone left a void. A dissonance in the natural harmony that would eventually right itself through a negative reaction somewhere down the lane. No matter how soiled or abused, life is a gift that was never meant to be returned early. Just as Luffy was about to sink below the surface, something swum up beneath him to support him. The royal strike had been like an EMP on Kajiki's training. The hockey bypassing all the mental blocks to resonate with Thrasher and all his memories of Luffy. Restored to his senses. The oddly gentle beast comforted his friend as best he could. A sea king doesn't feel the bonds of companionship. Lower fish fled with fear. And fellow sea kings were either rivals to intimidate or mates to impress and dominate. Thrasher had never known what it was to stand on equal ground with someone. Until Luffy had come along. Determined to give him a second chance after he'd maimed Shanks. Luffy had slowly worked himself into Thrasher's life. The predator had learned peace as the kind boy had taught him how to relax for the first time in his Darwinist lifestyle. Luffy felt the warmth of the scale beneath him and the low rumble of Thrasher's growl as he slowly returned to himself. Luffy looked down at his pet, absent-mindedly petting the large head he rested on. Hey there. Boy. You forgot about me for a little there. Thrasher gave what Luffy recognized as an apologetic whine. It's okay. You weren't yourself. Luffy laid his head down, his self-doubt melting away with the presence of his pet. You don't think I'm a monster, do you? Luffy had to suppress a chuckle as Thrasher shook his head side to side incessantly, almost hurling the teenager back into the sea. Thanks, boy. I needed that. Getting his feet under him, Luffy turned back towards Arlong Park. Now a speck in the distance. Come on, Thrasher. Time to kick Arlong's ass. Jin fell back, his spine straight as he landed spread eagle on the ground. It would have seemed relaxed. If it weren't for the fact that his floating ribs were snapped like twigs, you could see the ugly, unnatural bulges in his skin through his jacket. The ex-battle commander stared at the sky, his eyes hazy with pain. Lying down seemed good. It hurt too damn much to do anything else. He didn't scream, not out of manliness, but simply because he didn't have enough air to waste on such a thing. Despite all this, Jin managed to maintain his wry sense of humor. Alas, poor dignity. I knew thee well. To think, I was beaten by water. These were not the ramblings of a pain-hazed mind. Arlong had spent the past few minutes taking great joy as displaying the power of his natural element. Of course. No one had a frickin' clue how he did it. Nami and Usopp watched with mild horror from the sidelines. Shocked at how easily their nakama had been felled. Usopp muttered, What in the world is going on? It looks like he's just throwing around some water. But the guys look like they're being socked in the gut. Nami could only watch in mounting despair. All that effort to prove Arlong didn't own her. Dragging all her friends and family here, only for her captor to tear her friends to metaphorical pieces. Using a puddle, Sanji clutched his chest delivering his best one-eyed glower at the smugly grinning Arlong. This is ridiculous. He's just splashing us. But it feels like a shotgun blast. Zoro grunted, lacking the focus to do anything else. The fever had risen, and the wound had reopened. Zoro was currently coasting in a fog of delirium, unable to form any coherent thought. Sanji could sense this, and growled to himself. Hell's bells. How was he supposed to protect a lady's honor when his enemy could cream him with a sprinkling of water? Arlong chuckled at Sanji. The sound itself one of the most malevolent things Sanji had ever heard. Do you finally see? This is the difference between us. My species is superior. Nature has made me better in every aspect. Laughing maniacally, Arlong threw another batch of water. Sanji valiantly tried to charge, but he couldn't manage to avoid the nearly invisible drops. Just like Jin, Sanji collapsed. Enough was enough, and Sanji just couldn't take another blow like that. Zoro growled. He could literally feel the oppressive fog of the fever, closing in on his thoughts. He had less than a minute until oblivion took him. Might as well make it count. The world shrank to the maniac in front of him. And Zoro charged. Swords lifted, rent the air, and were completely dodged by a grinning Arlong. Zoro pressed his increasingly feeble attack, but he just couldn't hit the surprisingly quick merman. Arlong grew tired of playing with the swordsman, 
and his hand lunged forward to catch his throat. Arlong chuckled as Zoro hung limp in his grip, lacking the strength to even struggle. The only sign that the swordsman was even conscious was the wholehearted, if weak, glare sent towards Arlong. The tyrant chuckled in amusement. I must say, you are one of the biggest annoyances I've ever had to deal with. But what's with this little bandage of yours? Arlong tore off the stained bandages, curious as to what the heck the former bounty hunter was hiding, and instantly regretted it. Gruesome didn't even begin to cover it. The cut was a perfect diagonal from Zoro's left shoulder to his right hip. The tan skin and impressive musculature that attested to the man's training and commitment had parted seamlessly to shine light on that which was never meant to see the sun, through the steady stream of blood that welled up from the wound. Arlong could just make out the off-white of bone and the grisly rainbow of various organ tissues. The merman was a sadistic harbinger of death and suffering. But even he had limits. No sequence of words existed that could properly describe how utterly wrong and nauseating this injury was. Arlong's hand loosened in shock. As Zoro wheezed in a frail attempt to regain his breath, Arlong had to fight down a mixture of bile and fear. This man, this puny human, had decimated one of his best men with that injury the entire time. It was impossible. And yet the evidence continued to stare Arlong in the face as Zoro's life essence was eagerly drunk up by the sun-cracked concrete of Arlong Park's courtyard. Nami felt ill. Revulsion demanded that she show everyone what she had for breakfast. Yet guilt decreed that she deserved the burn of the bile in her throat. Zoro had helped her so much, fought against such strong opponents. While all the while he should have been in a hospital. Nami's rational side assured her that it was more Zoro's pride than his friendship with her that led to this. But the navigator felt disgusted with herself all the same. Usopp and the good portion of the villagers lacked the self-restrained Nami had. The stench of vomit permeated the air as people gave in to sympathetic retching. Dr. Nako coped by going off on a tangent regarding the injury in relation to his professional sense of treatment. That young man is batshit insane. Or else retarded. With that severe an injury, he should be in a theater or at least on medication. Any normal person would need a year to recover from that injury. If they did at all. Najiko covered her eyes as her almost father Genzo held her as they both felt their hope start to wither under the onslaught of Arlong's continued victory. Arlong regained his composure, once again secure in his bloodthirsty persona. Ah, does the little cut hurt the poor human? He said, mocking him with every syllable. Arlong drew back his foot, and delivered a purely sadistic kick to Zoro's chest. The swordsman clenched his teeth, but even the Kokoyashi natives heard the animal-like sound of pain that escaped his lips. Usopp felt rage begin to coil in his chest as Arlong continued to torture Zoro in the cruelest way possible. It would have been kinder to kill Zoro. This was infinitely more demeaning. Usopp would be the first to admit that he was a coward. But when it came to his Nakama, he had nerves that would make titanium seem like tin foil. Zoro was one of the people Usopp would trust his life with without any hesitation. And he refused to just sit there while this freak treated his Nakama like some poor abused puppy. Usopp charged. Ignoring the cries of shock and fear from the people behind him. Usopp hammer. The proud liar screamed as he let loose his psychic battle cry. Hockey flew in a jangled tumble due to Usopp's chaotic emotions as he moved to beat Arlong's skull to mush. Of course, it didn't work out that way. Arlong looked up from every petty villain's wet dream to see the marksman fling himself at him. Arlong growled in frustration. When would these humans get the point? He was invincible. Just as Arlong drew back his fist to smash Usopp's face in, an unexpected third party intervened. Usopp. Duck. Gomu Gomu no whip. Usopp reacted instantly. Captain's orders. Arlong barely had time to gasp before a sandaled foot with enough momentum to crack a boulder impacted with his chest. For the second time that day, the shark merman flew horizontal into a wall. A ragged cheer went up among the villagers. Though some of them were still gagging, Usopp and Nami couldn't suppress their grins as Luffy jumped off Thrasher's head onto the ground of Arlong Park. Nami still had her doubts about Thrasher, but she was still delighted to see he was normal again. Disturbing or not, her captain's giant, Playful guard dog of a serpent was a delightful constant in her experience as a straw hat, and she was glad to see the pet back to normal. Usopp was just glad that he didn't have to commit suicide anymore. Luffy cracked his knuckles as he glared at the slowly emerging Arlong. Luffy looked at the defeated forms of his Nakama, and felt a cold fury grow in his gut. Usopp. Get these three out of here. I don't want them to get hurt in the fight. Usopp nodded. All too glad to back out now that Luffy was taking care of the problem. Usopp. With the help of Nami and Najiko managed to get the injured straw hats out of Dodge just as Arlong recovered. Arlong cracked his neck, while his scowl deepened. He might be arrogant, but he wasn't blind. The humans had been surprisingly strong, and they all deferred to this boy with respect. In Arlong's survival of the fittest world, that meant that Luffy was the strongest. The hits were good hints, as well. Arlong felt the rage built up in him at the continued efforts of the straw hats. They were like cockroaches. Still, Arlong tried to rein in the bestial fury. It wouldn't do to lose control. 
It would be a pain to rebuild the park. So, you got your little pet back. For all the good it'll do you. The merman taunted. Only to be met by a fist to the face. Luffy, it seemed, was not in the mood. Luffy drew his arm back, watching Arlong as he clutched his broken teeth. The straw hats, the conscious ones, at least, felt a small twinge of fear in their guts. This was not Luffy. It was not Luffy. Every line of the young pirate's body bespoke of restrained power. And all the tiny quirks that normally conveyed his happy-go-lucky attitude were absent. Luffy clutched his fist, his eyes nearly glowing under his bangs. His hat, at some point, had wound up in Nami's hands, where she clutched it tightly for comfort. Arlong swore under his breath. Then, of all things, he began to laugh. Laughter that was too close to insanity to be entirely comfortable rang through the air as the captain of the Arlong pirates held his shattered teeth. Luffy raised an eyebrow in mild confusion, and that eyebrow was joined by its brother as Arlong harshly jerked his own teeth right out of his mouth. Before their eyes, a new set of teeth grew back in within seconds. Arlong continued chuckling. Sorry. Did you forget I was a merman? I possess the power of the shark? My teeth will always grow back. Stronger and stronger each time? So saying, the tyrant tore out two more sets of teeth, holding them like castanets in his hands. Luffy took his stance, ready for anything. To all those paying attention, it was clear that there was a heat haze around him. Oddly enough, none of the straw hats, those most attuned to Luffy's hockey, could feel it. It was as if Luffy was refusing to let any of it go towards them. Before they could puzzle out what this could possibly mean, Arlong charged. Luffy dodged a swipe from Arlong's detached chompers, and kept on dodging as the madman kept right on coming. Luffy could tell that getting his with one of those strikes would be bad. Of course, he didn't actually think that. He was in fight mode, and his battle instincts had taken the controls in his brain. Luffy's caution proved well deserved. As he dragged his head to the side to avoid a particularly well-aimed jab, the teeth bit right through the concrete pillar behind him, crushing it into rubble. Nami bit her lip in anxiety. She had full confidence in Luffy, but so far he hadn't thrown a single hit. It seemed as if Arlong had him backed into a corner, though she knew that couldn't be true. What was her captain thinking? Arlong apparently came to the same conclusion. What? Are you too scared to hit me? Pathetic human? Fight back. I want to make you beg for mercy. Not kill you without a fight? Arlong got a cruel grin as he thought of just the right buttons to push. You must be really weak. I mean, your crew is all so incredibly talented. For humans at least. That blondie can kick. The swordsman is decent enough. Even that sick looking one can throw a punch. All you can do is dodge me. Nami must not have as much of a brain as I thought. If she left me for you. Look at you. You can't do anything except lean on those around you. Luffy's yelled suddenly. Before blowing right through Arlong's defense to deliver a punishing blow to the chest. The air left Arlong's lungs in a rush as he was thrown back by one of the hardest punches he'd ever got. As Arlong picked himself up. Oddly dizzy for some reason. Luffy's eyes bored into him as he spoke for the first time since the fight began. Of course I depend on others. I can't cook. I can't use swords. I can't navigate and I can't twirl Tonfa or navigate the sea. I can't even lie. Usopp didn't know whether to take that as an insult or a compliment. Luffy's voice was calm and steady as he continued with his little diatribe. I know that I can't do everything. That is why I surround myself with strong Nakama I can depend on to do the things I can't. Arlong sneered, still trying to recover from the punch, though he'd never admit it hurt that much. That's my point, weakling. What can you do? Luffy looked straight into Arlong's eyes, and for the first time in years, the merman felt fear. Those eyes, they made death seem vibrant. They were so cold and lifeless, with no mercy or compassion whatsoever. The haze around the Fuchsia native rippled, as if a slumbering beast was awakening. As Luffy continued to stare unflinchingly into the Arlong's eyes, I can kill you, the knotboy said in a very quiet voice. Before he disappeared, Arlong's eyes widened, and he started to whip his neck around to look for the boy. But he needn't look that far. Luffy reappeared right in front of Arlong. Oddly blurry. The rookie pirate pulled back his fists, before letting fly in a deadly barrage. Arlong felt his body lift off the ground from the force of the hits. But he didn't even have time to fly back as Luffy continued his assault. The pain was excruciating. Every blow felt like a cannonball. And at every impact, a shockwave of barely visible force flew out. If he had the presence of mind to capture the feeling with words, Arlong would have thought that the waves felt like tuning forks pressed directly to his skeleton, creating a piercing and unbearable ache with each pass. Luffy finished the combo with a roundhouse kick that sent Arlong into the water at about half the speed of sound. The entire process took about three seconds. Usopp and Nami were amazed. They knew that Luffy could keep pace with Kuro. But they hadn't realized just how fast their captain could be. They had also never seen him attack someone with so little restraint. Not pulling any punches. Nami had lived in terror of Arlong since she was a child. And even she felt a twinge of worry for the merman. The blows, 
Quite simply, were just too heavy to be considered human. The Kokoyashi villagers didn't know whether to run in terror or fall prostrate in awe. For so long, Arlong had appeared invincible. Now, Luffy was hitting harder, faster, and more ruthless than Arlong ever had. And it was obvious to them that he took no pleasure from it. A corpse would have been an open book compared to Luffy. His body betrayed no emotion, no sadistic joy, no empathy, nothing. He was like a vengeful god, a being beyond their understanding. I know I'm overdoing it, but I'm trying to capture their mindset. They lived under this dictator for a decade, and he gets toppled by a complete stranger. I feel that the fearful awe would simply transfer. Sanji, who had regained consciousness, started to reach for a cigarette. I have become the subordinate to a very complex man. First he's a kid, now he's an executioner. Maybe I should have thought this through. Jin, who didn't have the strength to sit up, merely watched in an odd kind of approval. You truly are above Krieg, Captain, the bodyguard whispered, ignoring the pain of talking. Luffy waited for Arlong to fight back. He could tell that the merman was still alive, and was just bidding his time. Luffy focused on the flow of the hockey though him, and briefly contemplated the change he went through when he fully immersed himself, when he became both a pool and a conduit for this deeply spiritual and incredibly powerful force. He felt a change come over him. It was as if the hockey had a life of its own, a sentience that demanded its holder be colder, more regal, more like a king dealing with criminals of the state. No wonder it was called Haoshoku Hockey. The presence felt and acted like a king, and acted through the wielder. Before Luffy's thoughts could wander on a tangent about his quasi-bipolar personality, Arlong attacked. Quick as lightning, the giant launched out of the water, straight as an arrow with his deadly now pointed right at Luffy's chest. Luffy reacted. A blast of hockey, diamond hard in its density and concentration, collided with Arlong in midair. All of the rival captain's momentum was arrested, leaving him flailing in the air. Luffy took his chance, jumping high in the sky. He brought his feet together, before lunging them in a deadly lance. Gomu Gomu no spear, the young man said levelly, his voice echoing with hockey as his feet drove Arlong a foot into the concrete and creating a large dust cloud. Gravity had just started to reclaim the boy as the cloud cleared, revealing a changed Arlong. Physically, he was the same, but his entire manner had changed. There was no restraint, no conscience, nothing but an incredible tension of anticipation. The gate of a predator. Arlong has surrendered himself to the beast within, and he enjoyed it. Enough with this. I'll kill you. Arlong lunged forward once more, much faster than before. Luffy couldn't dodge, and he was driven deep into the wall of Arlong Park from the aerial tackle. A sick grin on his face, Arlong punched right through the wall, and drew from the room within what appeared to be a giant saw. Nami gasped in horror. Kiribachi was only used when Arlong wanted to level everything in sight. Arlong grinned one more as he kicked Luffy straight up just as the pirate captain left his imprint in the wall. Luffy went flying up, Arlong following in a freakish roll, using his sword to literally climb up the tower. Once the two were level, Arlong delivered a crushing blow with Kiribachi, sending Luffy through the wall of Arlong Park into the interior. Nami noticed which room it was. Fourth floor, last door on the left. That's my room. Luffy picked himself up, ignoring his injuries. Being made of rubber dulled most blunt trauma. But he was still human. He would be covered in bruises tomorrow. For now, he was merely aching. Shaking his head to clear it, Luffy looked up from his sitting position into the insane eyes of Arlong. The merman held his sword to Luffy's neck, seemingly having the boy at his mercy. Luffy looked around, and took note of the room. The walls were covered with maps, and numerous atlases were stacked around a small work desk. Piles of hand-drawn maps were scattered across the room. Arlong chuckled, the hint of madness that existed before now fully apparent. Like the room. It's where Nami makes all my maps. That girl is pure genius. Mermen know the seas like the back of our hands, but we just can't write good maps. The redhead woman has a serious talent. That talent can only belong to me. I can use her so much better than you. Arlong chuckled to himself maniacally, unaware of the free-falling temperature within the room. Luffy felt disgust well up in him, as he realized the travesty that surrounded him. Luffy reached up and took hold of Kiribachi. Arlong frowned and tried to jerk it out of his grasp, only to widen his eyes in shock when his weapon didn't budge an inch. It was as if it were encased in steel. Luffy's eyes looked up into Arlong's, and this time the eyes were different. Just as Arlong's had changed when he lost his cool, Luffy had transformed from a cheerful kid into a cold, unforgiving killer since he first entered Arlong Park. However, the boy had been, cold, the entire time, calm and in total control. Luffy's eyes burned with a white-hot, unholy anger that seared Arlong to the depths of his black heart. The Avenger God, had become a devil. There was no other way to describe it. The look in Luffy's eyes promised untold suffering that Arlong would not wish on his worst enemy. Suffering that would make strong men weep, break proud shoulders, and reduce the victim into a crying. 
hysterical heap on the ground begging for death to make the pain stop. For a start, use? Luffy asked, his voice conveying the fury he felt inside. Fast as thought, the growing king stood up, ripped Kiribachi out of Arlong's hands, and used it to slice half the room's contents in half in one rough motion. Tossing the saw with enough force to implant it in the wall to the hilt, Luffy proceeded to smash the paper, the icons of Nami's suffering and slavery, into unrecognizable pulp. Arlong gasped his mind blank in a complete, irrational fear. You can't do this. My maps. He protested weakly, only to wish he hadn't as those burning coals turned once more on him. Luffy's voice roared with fury and power as he faced down Arlong in his inner sanctum and drove him to his knees. This room is Nami's suffering. I will destroy it and you with it. With that, Luffy sent his leg straight up, right through the roof to the sky above. As he did, his leg blurred and morphed as more hockey than Luffy had ever called encased it completely. In the aftermath, onlookers would swear to all they believed in that the leg they had seen exit the roof had turned into a wide blade, sharp and heavy enough to split the earth and allow Mother Nature to bleed for the first time in millennia. They would then speak of an almighty voice rending the air, the voice of ultimate, unforgiving authority and the omnipotent power that came with it, royal guillotine. With that great cry, the blade descended with all the finality of fate itself. The spectators of this legendary fight, the villagers of Kokoyashi and the Nakama of its victor, covered their eyes as Arlong Park was completely and utterly destroyed by this ultimate attack. Nami stood frozen as the crowd behind her broke and fled. Nami, we've got to get out of here. Najiko yelled, as Usopp. Genzo, and Dr. Nako grabbed the defeated straw hats and carried them away. Nami resisted her sister's pull, her eyes fixed on the imploding building in front of her. Luffy. She screamed in her head, all her thoughts concerned with worry and fear for the fate of the captain that had transcended humanity to help her. Nami had heard tales of those that ruled the Grand Line. Great men that could topple mountains with one punch. Never before had she believed that level of power was accessible. Until now. It took a full ten minutes for the ear-shattering rumble to die down and the dust to clear. The villagers and the straw hats hesitantly approached, searching desperately for some sign of their hero. Nami was just about to rush in and turn the rubble that once was Arlong Park over to find Luffy. When he appeared, rising from the ashes of his victory, the future pirate king stood tall among the wreckage around him. His eyes locked onto Nami's, and even across the distance she felt an electric thrill go up her spine. Luffy slowly smiled, as the conquering king let go of his power and became mortal once more. Not Luffy was gone. The heir of D was back once more. Throwing back his head, the boy yelled at the top of his lungs, proclaiming his feelings for the world to hear. Nami. You are my Nakama. Nami grinned, and brought up a hand to try and hide her tears. But these were not tears of sorrow. Nami was crying with joy. For the first time in her life. All the tension, fear, and burdens she had carried over the years fell off at once. Leaving the woman feeling free for the first time in seven long years. Luffy walked out of the ground zero he created. As the villagers of Kokoyashi slowly grasped the reality they were faced with, a cheer broke out, which soon grew and tumbled like thunder until it was an undulation that shook the sky. Arlong Park has fallen. The crowd rushed forward, leaving the straw hats to watch in amusement as their captain was mobbed by grateful villagers. Zoro, who had recovered slightly from his torture, cracked a grin. Jin and Usopp got up and did a merry jig. The former Krieg miraculously revived by the power of laughter. And Sanji took a slow, relaxing drag as he smiled. Luffy couldn't help but laugh with childlike joy as the crowd threw him up in the air over and over they fumbled the catch and he landed headfirst on the ground. He merely laughed it off. Luffy always loved the time immediately after a battle. Still on a rush the size of the Grand Line. But with no battle to dull the feeling. Everything seemed bright and vibrant. Luffy rubbed his head in a casual gesture. Only to feel a familiar object be pressed onto his head. He looked up into the smiling face of Nami. Luffy grinned back, and stood up. He was about to open his mouth to say something, when Nami rushed in and hugged him with all the strength in her body. Surprised, but certainly not complaining. Luffy hugged her back. It was a perfect moment of victory, friendship, and simple joy in holding someone close. So, of course, something had to come along and ruin it. Ain't no rest for the wicked. After all, my, my, it seems that you've done my work for me. How kind of you, Captain Nazumi sneered, backed by his contingent of marines. Everyone turned to stare at the man. And in most cases it was a glare. Luffy himself felt irrationally frustrated that this man had interrupted his moment with Nami. Unaware of his encroaching doom, the rat-faced man continued. This is my perfect day. All I have to do is remove you. Bring in Arlong. And I'll have all the money to myself. The extraordinarily arrogant man continued to laugh in that incredibly annoying way. Until someone tapped him on the shoulder. He turned around. Annoyed only to have his heart stop when he looked into the merciless eyes of Zoro. 
People are rejoicing. Don't interrupt them. Nizumi looked past the man. And paled drastically when he saw all of his men down. How on earth had this no-name taken down all his men? Nizumi suddenly got a sub-zero chill down his spine. And he hesitantly turned around into the pissed-off faces of the Straw Hat Pirates and the villagers of Kokoyashi. The man whimpered. The next ten minutes or so were spent delightfully pummeling Nizumi into a bloody pulp. Aware of the corruption of this particular marine, the people of Kokoyashi cheered them on. When the pirates finally let up, Nizumi looked like a modern art piece meant to reflect the abuse of the soul. Nami, who had stayed back so far as to better cackle, picked the man up by his left ear. You are going to pay back these villagers for all the money Arlong has stolen. You will never come here ever again. And one more things. The shadow of a demon appeared behind Nami. As she embraced her inner nature. Give me back my money. She yelled. Punting Nizumi as she did. The corrupt captain positively flew across the water. He regained consciousness when he hit the water. And he took his chance to threaten them with no backing. You. Straw hat. I'll make you pay for this. There won't be a bounty hunter or marine that won't know your name. You hear me? You will be hunted down if it's the last thing I do. His answer was the hurling of his men straight at him. Screaming like a little girl. The man fled. Leaving his assaulters to laugh their asses off. How do you think he knew I'd be Pirate King? Luffy asked. Only to make his crew laugh even harder. Nami laughed the loudest out of all of them. Reveling in the feeling. The villagers of Kokoyashi dispersed. Eager to spread the news of their salvation to every corner of the island. Arlong Park had fallen. They were free. When Kami Island threw a party. It threw it into the stratosphere. It was the third day of non-stop celebration. And every second had been spent with the joyous citizens getting drunk on freedom. Happiness. And good, ol booze. Every one of the straw hats was treated as guests of royalty. Luffy had been allowed to eat to his heart's content. And had thus eaten the island out of the next ten years. Not that anyone cared. Sanji had been flirting with every girl in sight. And since he had taken part in the liberation. Some of the women actually paid attention to him. Usopp became the official conductor of the nightly festivities, yelling, his, heroic tales and the soundtracks to them until he went hoarse. Jin and Zoro, after being treated, which was not fun, spent most of their time in quiet corners, drinking calmly with smiles on their faces. Nami, on the other hand, well, no one could find her. Dr. Nako said he'd seen her when she came in for tattoo removal, which made perfect sense to everyone who knew her. However, she seemed to have disappeared after the operation, leaving her friends curious and in some cases worried. Sanji was the sole member of the latter party. Everyone else knowing that Nami needed some time to adjust to everything. In between feasts. Luffy wondered where she was. But he'd get distracted by the latest course. Finally. Near midnight. The redhead finally turned up. Luffy. Who was full for the first time he could remember. Was relatively calm. Trying an exotic brew while listening to the music. The navigator walked up to him from the side. And tapped him on the shoulder. Luffy turned to her and couldn't suppress the smile that spread across his face. Nami. We've been looking for you. Where you been? Nami smiled. And Luffy was struck speechless by how beautiful she looked. Not that he understood any of his feelings for her. He was completely clueless about women. As he was on most subjects. In his defense. Women were inarguably the most subtle, complex creatures on the face of the planet. The redhead answered. Oh. I've just been taking care of some stuff. Saying goodbye. She trailed off and Luffy could see a fondness in her eyes that told him she was thinking of her family. Just then, the music slowed down considerably, and a lone violinist stepped forward, before he began to play a haunting, mellow tune. It was rich and vibrant, no less dull than it would be if it were played as a jig. It took Luffy a second, but he recognized the waltz. Oh, Shanks used to sing this all the time. He said that it went out of style before he was born, but it used to be a kind of anthem for pirates. Nami grinned as Luffy energetically recalled his childhood hero. She herself found the tune delightful. Nami looked around, and noticed all the couples dancing. A nervous little flutter took home in her belly. She couldn't help but remember the disembodied shove she was certain Belmere had given her. Nami was certain that her mother's spirit was encouraging her to do what her heart told her. And right now, her heart was screaming at her to dance with Luffy. Nami looked back at the boy, almost like she was measuring him. Luffy didn't notice. Nami would admit that she was attracted to the boyish pirate, both for his bumbling charm and his obvious strength. There wouldn't be any harm in exploring how far a potential relationship could go. However, she was hesitant. Despite her mild seduction skills, she was as inexperienced as Luffy. She'd never had the time, energy, or inclination to have any significant other. But, she couldn't deny that she wanted to get close to Luffy. How close and in what way? She wasn't sure. Nami took a deep breath, and took the plunge. Luffy, would you like to dance? Luffy blinked at Nami, his words dying in his throat. Something seemed to have snapped in his brain when Nami asked him that question. His libido, 
long ignored and unnoticed, leapt at the chance. Luffy found himself holding Nami to his chest and swaying slightly to the beat of the mild waltz. The boy briefly wondered why the hell he was doing this, but then he breathed in the scent of Nami's hair, and suddenly he didn't care. The slightly awkward couple didn't do much dancing, barely moving side to side with the tempo. Both couldn't have cared less, they both felt a wondrous delight in moving with the other, and none of them felt any urge to stop anytime soon. Jin who was watching from afar, grinned and nudged Zoro next to him. The first mate looked at the couple, and grumbled. Great, now we've got to deal with a hormonal Luffy. If one looked closely, however, one would notice the slight grin on the swordsman's face. Usopp saw them out of the corner of his eye, but decided that it wasn't any of his business. Sanji sank to the ground crying when he caught sight of them, but swiftly forgot when a pretty brunette held him and asked what was wrong. The music slowly died down, as the victors slowly fell asleep, the party of their victory and the newfound freedom of Nami's homeland coming to a close. Both the captain and his navigator slept with smiles on their faces, remembering the embrace of the other.